broad objective first as CRS. Uh, core objective is to propose research methods, meaning deliberate solid methods conference where we expect participants to bring and share with each other new approaches or traditional approaches to analyzing data and uh, tackling different uh, social economic problems. But then we thought that uh, research methods in itself are not very uh, useful or interesting for that matter if they don't serve solving important uh, issues or informing uh, important policies. So each conference has a theme uh, around which we expect people to talk about important findings, but also highlight their approaches and their methods, how they uh, made those conclusions. Uh, whatever they pay. Now, here we choose uh, uh, transformation without uh, focus to see how different countries, different countries in the region changed uh, during the decade. And luckily, we have an excellent source for tracking this change, COPSUS Barometer, our co product, and the largest uh, uh, public data collection effort. And we are very proud of that. Uh, and at the same time, wanted to use some complementary or encourage participants to use some complementary data to see how different aspects of social political life have changed. But this word transformative in the title is kind of predictive. We don't know, but more uh, transformation was coming to the region world to our everyday lives, and of course we can talk about that, but now this gives us an opportunity to only look back and think about changes and achievements what we have during uh, the last decade, but also look ahead and see uh, what can we anticipate uh, to uh, be different in our economies, in our countries, in our fragile but still democracy. And also in our lives as researchers, as data collectors, as common contributors to uh, public policy that depend. Uh, with that in mind, I want to welcome you all to the conference and to all uh, participants, all uh, discussants, and keynote speakers who have to the conference. Um, also, I wanted to mention uh, about the uh, support of and traditionally, even this year, this learning in preparation of New York, they support the barometer and they also support conference, which is related to the Cox's barometer. What is the technical preparation? And personally, uh, it's vice president and it's a supporter of the engineers, Diana Antenia. And I hope uh, uh, there will be more uh, supporters of the conference and of the barometer in the future. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time because uh, we have uh, um, presentations and also we have some um, uncertainty around the online conference. We don't know when technical issues um, break something up, so better to the floor to presentation and look forward to interesting presentations and discussions discussion around those. And again, thank you very much for your participation. Um, thank you, Koba. Now I would like to ask uh, you, ask the moderator of the first panel, uh, the Caucasus Barometer panel, Tina Tinzura Bishwili, to take the floor and introduce the speakers. Tina? Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, let's try to manage this a bit strange experience for us. I hope we'll hear everything and we'll see everybody. And as Goba mentioned, the panel is uh, uh, is 
quite important taking into consideration the Caucasus barometer experience and how CRRC managed to organize this event starting from 2003, I, I guess. So we'll now have uh, four presentations from two from Georgia and two from the presenters in Armenia. And uh, they will highlight some of the very important findings of the last wave in 2019, but also I guess we'll hear a lot about earlier findings, some comparisons, etc. The first, the first speaker will be Dustin Gilbert, who is uh, going to speak about the trust towards uh, religious institutions. And uh, I guess hypothesize how the church scandals affect the level of trust respondents report. So I would give the floor to Dustin and uh, looking forward to the 2019 level of trust in church. Hi, Tina. Thanks for the introduction and hi, everyone. Uh, Tina, great to see you after so long. and emailing back and forth with a few different things. Um, so let me just get my presentation up. Um, and yes, yeah, so as Tina mentioned, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, uh, trust in institutions using Caucasus barometer and specifically trust in the Georgian Orthodox Church. Um, and the basic thesis that I'm presenting today is that the church's scandals are hurting it a bit how much, it's a bit unclear. But um, to do this and make this argument, um, I'm gonna briefly describe the scandals that have um, been happening or surrounding the church in recent years, um, then describe my uh, identification strategy, the methodology which I use to test um, whether a recent scandal surrounding pedophilia um, in the church um, and accusations that the Ilya II was engaged in said activities um, was whether or not that actually hurt trust in the church. Um, and from there, I'll get into the findings and also I'll present some new data that we've recently collected um, on trust in institutions following the COVID-19 crisis, particularly as it relates to the church. So for anyone watching Georgia, um, a lot of the scandals will be really familiar, but just to briefly enumerate them, on May 17th, 2013, um, there was anti-gay um, rights riots, essentially, in the streets of Tbilisi, um, and priests were in the fore of this and engaged in violence um, against the gay rights protesters on the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. And this has been sort of a important moment, um, particularly in LGBT rights circles um, in Georgia and something that was also sort of hampered the church in many ways. So a survey immediately done right after this took place um, suggested that 59% of people didn't think that the church leaders should have been there and engaged in violence. Aside from this sort of very salient event from five years ago, there was land sales on a regular basis for one lorry. Um, and just recently what happened is that the church um, was given 20 hectares of forest land around the churches throughout the country. Aside from this, um, the most recent scandal that <clears throat> we've all probably seen is around COVID-19. And what happened here is that the church um, kept opening. Um, they weren't following government rules surrounding only allowing 10 people in a closed area at once, though they were engaged in social distancing and trying to do some harm prevention. Um, and most importantly, they stayed open for Easter um, despite the government ban on being outside the home um, past 10 p.m. or past 9 p.m., sorry. Um, but the, the one that I'm gonna look at today um, is most focused on accusations that the patriarch of the Georgian Orthodox Church, Shelia II, was engaged in pedophilia. 
Um, and these accusations came about in October, November of 2019. And specifically, Petre Saba, who was a high church leader at the time, accused Ilya of this. And this came as quite a shock for Georgian society um, because Ilya II is generally, I mean, just the most trusted individual in the country on survey after survey that have been done about this. And the church is generally one of the most trusted institutions. Um, and so in this context, at the same time, trying to see if I can get my next slide up. One second here. Okay. So we've seen a long-term decline in trust in the church. Um, so in 2008, 75% of Orthodox Christians in Georgia said that they trusted the church um, fully. And that compares with 33% in October of 2019 when Caucasus Barometer was conducted. And you can see this slow but steady decline and shift from full trust to just trust. So during that same period from 2008 to 2019, there's a rise in people saying that they trust the church from 15% to 38%. There's also a rise in ambivalence on this chart, right? So in 2008, 4% saying that they are neither trusting nor distrusting of the church compared to 21% in 2019. Now, it's a plausible hypothesis um, that these scandals are hurting the church, right? Um, but it's very difficult to prove that um, without any sort of experimental evidence. And getting an experiment in is very difficult because how do you randomly assign a scandal to different people? But there was during the 2019 Caucasus Barometer a natural experiment, actually. And the pedophilia scandal, which I described previously. Um, so it occurred during Caucasus Barometer's fieldwork. And it occurred towards the end of Caucasus Barometer's fieldwork. Um, but there was still enough Orthodox Christians interviewed before and after the scandal to compare them and see if there was a change in attitudes that was statistically significant. Um, and so the way that I do this um, in th this research um, is I use a multiple regression analysis um, with a dummy for being interviewed before or after this scandal. Um, and that's the first analysis which I conduct. And then the second analysis which I conducted was a matching analysis using the same premise. So combining the natural experiment before and after. Um, but then um, in addition to looking at people before and after, I used a process called multivariate matching with genetic weighting to ensure that it was comparing people who are similar to each other um, in terms of age, settlement type, years of education, um, whether or not they were working, their sex, and how well off the household was. And so the results of this analysis um, suggest that indeed there was a decline in trust in the church as a result of the pedophilia scandal. This is just a simple cross tab and it shows before and after the scandal um, trust in the church according to Orthodox Christians. And despite that small sample size after the scandal, the difference is statistically significant. And there's a 15 percentage point difference um, between people reporting that they fully trust or trust the church compared to um, before the scan after the scandal and before the scandal. When we put this into a regression analysis, we get that same 15 percentage point difference. Um, and then with a matching analysis that compares those similar people to one another before and after the scandal, the difference actually increases to 17 or 18 points. To further explore um, who was affected rather than just asking, was there an effect? I did the regressions in both analyses looking at the interaction terms between different social and demographic variables um, that were listed in the analysis and the methods page above, as well as with two different types of religious behavior. Um, and those two types of religious behavior are whether or not people fast often or always, and whether or not they attend church more or less often than once a week. And what we get um, is that 
Um, in terms of the demographics, there was slight changes. People outside of Tbilisi were a little bit more affected than people in Tbilisi by the scandal um, in terms of the trust in the church. And then there was also um, people with more years of education were also a bit more affected compared to others. Aside from this though, one of the more interesting findings here is that the multiple regression analysis um, and one of the two matched analysis suggests that people who fast um, often or always and people who attend church at least once a week were significantly more affected than people who did not. Um, and so that means that this particular scandal, um, it had a larger impact on those people who are more engaged in religion in Georgia and more engaged in the Georgian Orthodox Church compared to those who are less engaged but still identify as Orthodox Christians. Um, with this, with the fasting variable in particular, you can see that there's a large difference um, here and here. And so with this analysis, with the fasting, um, it's much less clear whether this is um, a reliable finding because the people who fast often or always, when we compare demographically similar ones, we don't get a statistically significant effect in the matching analysis, though we get a very large effect in the multiple regression analysis. But here, um, when it comes to attending church at least once a week, we get a consistent um, finding. Um, and that's that people who were um, attending church more often were more um, affected by the scandal and left, there was a larger effect on their trust in the church. So finally, um, oops. This is some data um, using from a project that we've recently conducted. And this was about COVID-19. And what we did is we asked the same question on trust as on caucuses barometer in 2019. Um, and we asked about people's trust in the healthcare system, local government, parliament, police, president, and the religious institution which they belong to. And what we can see from the data is that following COVID-19, it looks like there's a slight shift um, in trust in the church um, towards, again, um, rather trust instead of fully trust. Um, and then we don't see a change in ambivalence. We don't see changes in other areas. This data though, it, the other thing that we see in, from this chart is that every other institution had large, large gains um, in trust following the crisis. Before putting too much into this chart, um, I would just highlight that we have different modes here. Although the question was the same, we we're asking over telephone um, instead of asking face-to-face -face, like caucuses barometer with this survey. And therefore um, we should be pretty cautious. The other thing here and with the other scandal that's really worth thinking about is that this was happening. This survey was, the survey question was asked right after the Easter um, scandal. Similarly, with the data that I presented previously, what was happening is that we got the month before the scandal and then a few days after the scandal in terms of data. And so something that's a question that should be looked at in future research is whether um, these scandals actually have a lasting effect. It's something that we're not entirely sure of based on the data. And other data that we've collected since is a bit ambivalent on this point. Uh, so in terms of conclusions, based on this, what we can say is that the scandal around pedophilia had at least an immediate effect likely on trust in the church. Um, and it appears that the COVID crisis may have also had some impact on trust in the church as well, um, though we're less certain about it. The effects in terms of the pedophilia scandal were much larger and greater on the religiously engaged. Um, and so this is what we've seen so far from these scandals, but I think that this at least provides some support to the hypothesis that the scandals are at least partially to explain for the slow decline in trust that the church has been experiencing. Um, in recent years. So with that, um, thank you very much for listening to me and I'll yield the floor to colleagues. Uh, thanks, Justin. It's 
very impressive and very, very interesting. And please keep working because uh, based on even just based on your very first slide, something is definitely happening there. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess something similar can be found in other countries as well, because if, if I remember correctly, this trend in downward trust is not Georgia specific, right? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, thank uh, you. And now we are uh, moving to Tamuna Hoshtaria and Rati Shumadze, who will tell us some news about how support for democracy um, is linked with liberal values in both Georgia and Armenia. Actually, just a small correction, it's only, data is only for Georgia. Sorry, Oops. Sorry the uh, booklet I had says Armenia as well. Yes, yes. Okay. Next, okay, let's Georgia. <laughs> okay, let, let me just share the screen first. Uh, yes, yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Tamar Pashtaria and this is Rati and uh, we are both researchers at CRC. Today, today we would like to present a paper that we wrote for the Caucasus Analytical Digest and will be published hopefully this summer. It's about exploring the links between support for democracy and liberal values in Georgia. Um, so today we'll talk about the aim and context of the study, then we will, I will also talk about the methodology and Rati will follow with findings and the discussion part. Um, so, okay, so we wanted to look at uh, support for democracy in Georgia and also look at the factors that are related to it. And since we both work at CRC, we use CRC's Caucasus Barometer Annual Survey. Uh, we took the 2019 data and uh, we examined whether support for democracy is linked with core values of liberal democracy. In this case, we used support for gender equality and tolerance towards minorities as proxies to uh, measure liberal democracy. And before we show you the findings, just a small overview. Uh, of the situation in Georgia. So on the slide, you can see um, CB data starting from 2011 to 2019. And you can see that the positive assessment of the state of democracy is decreasing. If you look at the green color, it's the uh, percentage of people uh, in Georgia who say that Georgia is a full democracy or a democracy with minor problems. And you can see that with years, this percentage is decreasing. Uh, decreasing. And also, if you look at the orange color, uh, it's the number of people who say that it, Georgia is a, is, is a democracy with major problems. And uh, you can see that it has increased from 27% in 2011 uh, to uh, 48% in 2019. Um, also, we asked the respondents to choose one of the statements um, presented on the slide. So democracy is preferable to any other kind of government presented in green. You can see that the share of people who claimed or who chose this um, answer option uh, has also fallen from 65% in 2011 to 49% in 2019. Now let's also look at how Georgians perceive democracy, what they think democracy means. Uh, this slide is presented from a, a survey that CRC did for NDI in 2019. So people said that democracy means freedom of speech, media, hearing different views. 54% uh, claimed this and also about one third of Georgians think that democracy means equality before the law, protection of justice, protection, defense of human rights. So if we, if we look at this slide, we know that people do link democracy and the liberal values. But what we wanted to look at is whether the support for democracy is also linked with support for liberal values. And for this, we ran uh, multiple logistic regressions. We have five different models. 
in all five models, the dependent variable is always support for democracy. And in then in dependent variables are liberal values, as we already mentioned, it's uh, proxies for liberal values, tolerance towards minorities and support for gender equality. Uh, now I will just show you in detail what the independent and dependent variables are. So the dependent variable is a dummy variable uh, which uh, with score one uh, standing for people who said that democracy is preferable to any other kind of government and all the rest of the people who said in some circumstances in some circumstances, a non-democratic uh, government is preferred, or for someone like me, it doesn't matter, or who said, I don't know, or I refuse to answer. All these people would get a score zero, so no explicit support for democracy. Versus the code one, which is support for democracy, which is presented in green. Uh, now for the independent variables, we have several of them. So the, in the first model, level of tolerance towards ethnic minorities, which is measured by an additive index of approval of women of the respondent ethnicity marrying a number of ethnic and religious groups. So if you look at the question, it's uh, the question that was asked was, would you approve or disapprove of women of your ethnicity marrying a group or ethnic or religious group? And all the people, who disapproved of women of their ethnicity marrying a man of any of the 17 groups listed here, they would get a score zero and someone would get a score if they approved of women of their ethnicity marrying one of the representatives uh, of the groups uh, listed here. And of course, score 17 would be someone who approved all of these groups. Uh, for the second uh, independent or the independent variable in the second model, it's intolerance towards homosexuals, which is um, uh, which is turned from the uh, from the following variables. So we asked people which of these people would you not wish to have as your neighbors most. So core one would be a person who named homosexuals as the group that they would least like to have as neighbors, and the respondents who named any other group would fall into the score zero. So it's a dummy variable. Um, the third, sorry. Okay, so the third independent variable is level of liberal attitudes towards women, which is measured through an additive index of acceptance of certain behaviors uh, by women at certain age. So we asked from what age do you think it is acceptable for a woman to drink alcohol, strong alcohol, smoke tobacco, live separately from parents before marriage, have sexual relations before marriage, cohabit with a man without marriage. So if someone named a specific age when it is acceptable for a woman to do the listed activities, they would get a score zero, but they would get one score or two or up to five scores if they, uh, if they say it is unacceptable for a woman to engage in any of the five activities. Uh, the fourth and fifth model uh, have uh, attitude towards gender equality as independent variables. And uh, in the first case, it's measured by approval of a man and uh, women sharing equal breadwinning roles in the families. For example, we asked, in your opinion, ideally, who should normally be a breadwinner in Georgian families? And if someone said uh, that uh, men and women should equally be breadwinners, they would get a score one. But if they named a man or a woman uh, as a preferred breadwinner, they would get a score zero. And the fifth independent variable, <clears throat> also measures attitude towards gender equality, but with the following question. Uh, so we asked, imagine that there is a son and a daughter in the household, and the household only owns one apartment, who should inherit the apartment? So if someone said that the, uh, the apartment should be equally distributed, they would get a score uh, one, and uh, if they named it a son or a daughter, they would get a score zero. Um, so these are the uh, main five uh, independent uh, variables, and uh, we tested the relationship between support for democracy and these five proxy measures. But in addition to these um, 
the core independent variables, we also included in each model the demographic variables like age, gender, settlement type, number of years spent in formal education, also employment status and uh, ethnicity. And uh, now I think Rati will present the findings. Uh, th thanks, Tamuna. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, as Tamuna described, uh, we run uh, five different models uh, where, in each case, uh, dependent variable was uh, dummy support for democracy, including this um, covariance of uh, social demographic uh, variables, uh, plus uh, each independent variable uh, described by Tamuna in details. So the first model we want to uh, discuss is uh, association between uh, tolerance index and uh, preferability of uh, democracy over any other kind of government. And uh, here the uh, predictive probabilities are presented. And uh, as you can see, uh, it doesn't matter uh, what score does a person has on this constructed additive tolerance index, whether it's the lowest or the highest, uh, there are no statistically uh, different and uh, distinguishable differences between different uh, levels of support, support for democracy. Just to explain it, if a person gets uh, zero point on the tolerance index, the probability of support for democracy is around uh, eight, uh, 48%. And when it comes to the highest uh, possible uh, score, uh, the uh, predictive predi Predict predicted probability uh, is uh, 42 uh, no, 42 percent. So there are no statistical significant differences. Uh, the second model is uh, sexual minority intolerance uh, against uh, support for democracy or, prefer or preferring democracy. And here uh, it doesn't matter what uh, positions uh, people have uh, towards the uh, sexual minorities. Uh, the predicted 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 probabilities. Uh, are indistinguishable, uh, for, uh, 51 or 52 percent, and there are no uh, statistical, uh, statistically significant differences. Uh, the third model uh, uh, shows us uh, relationship between acceptance of women activities, and uh, like it was shown in the previous two models, uh, the different levels of uh, acceptance of uh, women's engagement in uh, different uh, uh, types of uh, behavior, like consuming of uh, strong alcohol or living and cohabiting uh, with men without marriage, and so far and so forth. So there are no, still there are no statistical significant differences. Uh, even though there is a, a seven point gap between the uh, lowest and the highest um, points on the index, on the index, the regression model, where which is controlled. Uh, with these social demographic variables also indicates that uh, statistically those, uh, uh, those indicators are not uh, different. And uh, the last two uh, variables, uh, last two proxies for uh, liberal values uh, discussed were uh, so-called uh, attitude towards uh, gender equality, uh, who should be a breadwinner in the uh, family or which uh, child, the male or female, should inherit a uh, property of a family. And again, as the numbers show, the uh, margins uh, between different uh, uh, attitudes uh, and support for uh, democracy are uh, very, very minimal and statistically indistinguishable. Uh, so uh, just to summarize uh, uh, all five models in one, one chart, we presented the average marginal effects uh, with a 95 percentage of confidence interval. And uh, as you see, uh, so I, I, will, I will try to use a pointer here. Uh, so as you see, none of those uh, five uh, proxy measures for liberal values uh, tend to be, uh, tend to show the statistically significant uh, difference when it comes for support for democracy. So there are uh, only a couple of uh, variables uh, that shows shows us differences uh, uh, regarding the support for democracy. The first one uh, is ethnicity. Uh, so uh, the people, uh, so respondents who uh, are Georgian in their ethnicity who report 
that they are, uh, their, their ethnicity is Georgia, uh, it have the higher probability uh, for support for democracy as the best way of governance. And uh, the second one is the uh, years in, educa in ed education. So how should we interpret this uh, chart? So uh, the longer person uh, uh, studies at the formal educational uh, settings, he has uh, higher probabilities or higher chances uh, for uh, reporting that he prefers democracy for any other kind of government. Also, uh, the third uh, important uh, associate and correlate with support for democracy is the settlement type. But uh, as we, as you can see, that out of five models, uh, it works only in uh, four one. Um, and uh, the differences are not uh, too, uh, too significant and important. So how should we interpret it? So here the base category is the capital and uh, capital dwellers uh, compared to the urban uh, population have a higher probability uh, to uh, report that they prefer democracy over any other kind of government. So uh, the key find, uh, so to go to the conclusions and discussions part of the presentation. So the key findings uh, suggest that none of the proxies for liberal values were significant associate, had a significant association with uh, democracy support. And the only significant predictors uh, for democracy support were uh, education, yes, and yes, spending uh, formal education setting and ethnic minority status. So how can we interpret or discuss those findings? Uh, so now we are stepping in the uh, realm of uh, interpretation uh, and uh, uh, the realm of further research, but I guess it's uh, interesting to uh, see what what could be the uh, further implication of the study. So uh, results may suggest that people simply claim to be supporters of democracy without really knowing or being ready to accept the core values. Even though we presented in the start the chart from the NDI slide, uh, the key uh, and the most uh, significant associations that people had towards the meaning of democracy were freedom of speech and freedom of expression, but uh, uh, none of the uh, values associated with the acceptance of uh, minority or, uh, or gender equality variables were mentioned. Uh, so uh, we can uh, speculate that it may suggest that people are just going along with the idea of democracy without agreeing uh, its standards or uh, values. Uh, the studies uh, in the post-socialist countries have shown us that support for democracy may be conditioned by instrumental factors. So what does this mean? Uh, what does it mean? So uh, people can support democracy uh, because they think that it's an instrument uh, to reach the goal of economic prosperity or improving improvement of quality of life. Uh, and uh, we think that examination of those factors may shed a further light on this issue, uh, what really determines and what really uh, facilitates uh, uh, the genuine support for democracy and uh, what can be the explanation of this very interesting idea. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for your patience, for your uh, uh, for, 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 for time and uh, we are looking forward for your questions and uh, please collect your questions and uh, we will uh, happily answer them and discuss them during the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tavna and Rati. And again, it's very interesting and it's still a lot to be considered. For example, the level of education, that kind of stuff can be added and explored further. There is quite infinite. Okay, something is wrong with my audio. Okay, so uh, now we have Eva Karagulian and we are moving to Armenia. We'll continue to talk about trust and I guess Eva will tell us about trust to a number of institutions before and after the Velvet Revolution. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, uh, my name is Ella. I'm a program manager at uh, Caucasus Research Resource Center in Armenia. 
today uh, we will be launching the Caucasus Barometer Armenia uh, 2019-20 wave, uh, which is not the only one, however, very awaited and uh, most comprehensive uh, data uh, to also uh, shed light on the uh, changes that occurred uh, due to the developments we had in April and May 2018 in Armenia, resulting what is now called uh, the Armenian Velvet Revolution. Uh, today we'll be looking at some selected variables of utmost, utmost interest uh, in relation to the change in trust towards government and public institutions, as well as the position of the government and the future of Armenia uh, as perceived by, by the Armenian society. Uh, so I will share my screen. Excuse me, I'm having trouble. Ella, is it not working? Um, you um, should share. Mm -hmm. You should be able to share it. Yes. However, I beg your pardon. I have. You can email me your presentation, and I can share the screen, and you can talk if that is if this persists. This problem. Oh, okay. I think I will be able to share it now. Okay, we can see it, great. Please make it full screen and we can start. We can see it all right. Okay, it's all set. Yes, it's great. Please proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will be looking at uh, data, descriptive data that comes from mostly two waves, but also uh, starting from 2008. Uh, Focuses barometer 2017 that took place in uh, October uh, 2017. Uh, a few months later, uh, following this, uh, there were the uh, events of the Velvet Revolution in May uh, 2018. And now one and a half year later, we have the second wave. Uh, so just uh, a quick, uh, Let's go back uh, and see uh, how it all started. Uh, in December 2015, a constitutional referendum was held in Armenia, uh, transforming uh, the semi-presidential semi system to a parliamentary republic, uh, which would, uh, a few late, uh, years later in the upcoming elections, would result in uh, the current then current president to be re-elected uh, as a uh, 
prime minister for the third term. Uh, the growing, in addition to this, the growing distru distrust towards the government in Armenia escalated in May, April, May 2018, which was also very visible from the Caucasus uh, barometer, all the waves. Uh, that starting from 2018, the uh, levels of trust towards uh, all public and government institutions, as well as the uh, government itself was uh, declining. Uh, so it was very alarming uh, and it resulted uh, in uh, March 31, 2018, when the member of Armenian parliament uh, and the head of civil contract party, Nikol Pashinyan, started a two week walking journey. Um, then uh, two weeks after uh, Serge Sarkisyan was elected as prime minister by the national assembly was assigned. Um, and the opposition uh, led by uh, Pashinyan uh, announces the, be the beginning of the Velvet Revolution and mass demonstrations, uh, rallies, street closures, occupy uh, Yerevan and the whole uh, country. Uh, in May 18, uh, after certain events, Nicole Pachignan was elected prime minister. Um, so there was a shift in the government. Uh, in the uh, wave in the latest wave of the barometer we ask uh, the population uh, whether they participated and how they participated in the events uh, so 31 percent of the population mentioned to be participating in protests um, and 21 in blocking roads which is uh, quite a significant uh, rate um, Uh, the expectations, of course, were quite positive, and uh, so far, uh, after one and a half year, um, the majority of the population still mentioned that uh, their expectations have been men met in regards to the event. Uh, what happened to trust? Uh, it uh, there was a very uh, sharp increase in trust towards the government. Uh, so trust towards parliament went from 20% uh, to um, 60%. Uh, trust towards executive government uh, increased sharply as well. And trust towards president went from um, less than 20% to 61%. 60, excuse me, 61, 5%. Uh, well, from this chart, we see that the trust in parliament has been um, declining uh, since 2008, and now there is a sharp increase. Uh, however, it's still low compared to, for instance, the trust in president, uh, or which went from 17 to 79 percent. Uh, or the trust towards executive government, which went from 20 to 71 percent uh, within these two years. Um, so, um, to summarize, trust towards the president and the executive government peaked after the Velvet Revolution. Uh, trust in parliament still lower in comparison. Uh, which also um, implies uh, that uh, all amidst the change in the parliamentary government system, uh, it's still there. There are still issues with regards to uh, perceiving uh, the role of the parliament. Um, the trust towards uh, government institutions, however, is not uh, did not change that uh, drastically. Uh, for instance, well, trust towards army has always been quite high. Uh, there was 
some increase in trust towards police and political parties. Uh, trust towards court system uh, did not uh, undergo changes. Uh, we still have uh, ongoing reforms in this field. Um, so trust in police um, went from 29% to 51% within the two years. This was the most change and the political parties, uh, the distrust decreased from 65 to 44%. Uh, trust in public institutions almost uh, not affected. Uh, trust towards media, religious institutions, healthcare system, educational system, as well as banks. Um, uh, there were some changes, uh, but uh, not as high as uh, trust towards the government institutions. To summarize, trust towards the army was high before and after the Velvet Revolution. Uh, police and political parties increases slightly. Uh, the court system is not much affected. Um, reforms are ongoing and today uh, we also had, uh, we are now in the middle of um, very active events uh, when it comes to the constitutional system court. Um, trust towards public institutions is not affected. Um, freedom of speech and the, the perceived level of freedom of speech increased uh, quite high as well. Uh, as we see from the graph, uh, the uh, whether people think that uh, people like themselves have, have the right to openly say what they think uh, dropped from uh, 23 to 9 percent. Um, participation in protest actions has always been quite high. Uh, also leading in, to the events. Um, as for the media, Compared to 2017, uh, those who think that media uh, does a bad job in informing the population about what is going on dropped from 39 to 24%. So to summarize, the vast majority of the population mentioned they have the right to openly say what they think. Uh, which was 89% in 2000, in early 2020. Since 2008, the need for participation in protest actions has been ri ri rising, peaking also towards the end of the period. Uh, and trust toward media increased since 2017. However, what did not change is the perception of issues faced by the country. Unemployment, poverty uh, still remain the uh, most issues of utmost uh, importance. However, uh, when it comes to corruption, it is no longer seen as a great a main issue. Uh, so corruption in 2008 was mentioned uh, to be the main issue faced by the country by 21% of the population, whereas in 2019, by just 3% of the population. Amidst the, uh, the ownership that the revolution uh, brought to the population, uh, people still think that government is uh, like a parent. So the role of the government has not much changed. It, ha it had changed to a some extent, going from uh, 20 to 32% of people thinking that government is like an employee and people should be bosses who control the government. 
However, uh, this change, uh, however, still the mo mo more than half of the population thinks that uh, people are like children and the government should take care of them like a parent. Um, well, this is this uh, this change uh, when it comes to people being treated fairly by the government. Uh, there was a very sharp change in attitude. So, uh, in two thousand seventeen, seventy four percent of the population. Uh, disagreed that people are treated fairly by the government in Armenia, whereas in 2019, it's 25%. Uh, and the opposite uh, went from 17 to 67% uh, with a uh, raising 50 percentage points. Um, and in 2019, 67% of the population and thinks that uh, the country is going in the right direction. The nation of politics is uh, moving uh, forward. Uh, whereas uh, before 2019, this number was uh, decreasing. So it went from 31% to 8% uh, from 2008 and 2017. Uh, to summarize on a positive note, so people uh, think that the situation in Armenia uh, will improve uh, and everything will be fine. 79% of the population mentioned so in 2019 as compared to 47% in 2017. Um, so to summarize, the level of perceived fair treatment of the government towards people has increased drastically. Uh, however, the government is still more uh, is more perceived as an employee rather as a parent. However, this increase is not very uh, sharp. Um, this, nevertheless, uh, sets some uh, seeds for considerations for the future, uh, such as do high expectations contain potential of possible disappointment in the future, uh, which in some countries is, a, is common in, post, uh, in, in case of change of power. Um, how will the current situation with regards to coronavirus pandemic in Armenia affect the perceived level of, levels of trust and satisfaction? Uh, we are currently having a quiet, um, an alarming situation with regards to the pandemic. Uh, as we see, it also affected uh, the conference greatly, um, but also, uh, we have to check uh, how this will, in a short, in a very short period of time, affect the levels of trust. And uh, we have conducted one uh, online survey uh, a month ago uh, when we also asked uh, about the levels of trust towards various institutions. And we will be uh, replicating this survey within two weeks and we will be able to then compare the data uh, and come back to, to this topic very soon. Uh, and finally, issues Armenia faces are still on the table and uh, if, uh, what is the upcoming agenda? Uh, this is very important. Uh, for consideration and future developments. Um, thank you. Ella, thank you very much. It will be. And uh, I hope I really, the first uh, changes you showed in trust towards parliament and president, the very first ones, the like political institutions, 
they seem highly unusual and I hope that you will uh, continue to work on this direction and try to explain those changes or probably design some experiment that Dustin loves so much, et cetera, et cetera, because it does need to be explained. It's something extremely rare and strange, et cetera. So uh, before we move to our last presentation, I would like to invite everybody to send the questions to the presenters. So far, we only had one very simple technical question, which I guess Dustin already answered because he already, he answers everything even before the question is posted. Thank you, Dustin. And now we are moving to the final presentation of this panel. Samuel Manukian will discuss the social distances between ethnic groups in Georgia based on very long data spanning over 12 years, I guess. Samuel? Hello, dear Hi. colleagues. Do you listen to me? Yes, Do you yes. Listen? No. yes, we hear you. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Ethnic groups. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, now I start. Uh, do you listen to me? Yes, we hear you. Uh, uh, I thank CRRC for invitation to participate in this conference. I'm going to tell you about the main result of the study, about the perceptions of social distances toward various ethnic groups in Georgia by Georgians, Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis during 2007 up to 2019. For research, uh, we use the databases of Caucasus Barometer Surveys. In this presentation, we will look at the general comparison of the patterns of social distances in 2007 and 2019, the trends of social distances perceptions, and the Latin structures in the worldviews of Georgians, Georgian Armenians, and Georgian Azerbaijanis, which condition the patterns of social distances. On this slide, you see in which years which ethnic groups were explored in Caucasus barometer surveys. Orange indicates the ethnic groups that are examined in all seven studies, and blue indicates the ethnic groups studied in six or five studies. Note that these are the ethnic groups that are of the greatest interest for interethnic relations in Georgia and in South Caucasus as a whole. On this slide, you see the absolute and relative sizes of ethnic groups in the samples of Caucasus barometer in Georgia. They give a rough idea about the significance of result for Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis. Uh, note that the subsamples of other ethnic groups in Georgia were not enough to study their perceptions. Now a little about methodology. We use the truncated variant of Bogardus scale for social distance. The questionary questions for scale construction are the following. The first, can you please tell me whether you approve or disapprove of people of your ethnicity doing business with an ethnic group? And the second, would you approve or disapprove of women of your ethnicity marrying an ethnic group? Social distance is a count of answers approved. The ranges of the created variables are from zero up to two, where two denote the lowest distance. But we use the normalized and reversed form of that variables received by use of the following formula. You see the formula. The range of the new variables are from zero up to one, where zero is the least distance and one is the biggest distance. Now let's compare the patterns of perceptions of social distances toward different ethnic groups among Georgians, Georgian Armenians, and Georgian Azerbaijanis. Uh, here you can see that at 2007, social distance perceptions of Georgians are clearly divided into two groups, Georgians and all the others. On the other hand, the others are divided into three groups. Among the others, the closest to Georgians were Russians, Greeks, Abkhazians, Ossetians, and Americans. Uh, and the furthest groups 
are a group are Iranians, Iranians and Turks. <coughs> Armenians, Azerbaijanis and Jews were between the two previous groups. The pattern of Georgian Armenians at 2007 is practically the same as of the Georgians. However, here the ethnic groups on the social distance scale are distributed more evenly. And the second peculiarity is that Armenians for Georgians are far ethnic group. You see here are Armenians. Uh, but Georgians for Georgian Armenians are Georgian Armenians. Georgians and Turks. The others are much for Georgians. Armenians are on the distance uh, 0 0.8. Uh, but Georgia, uh, for Georgian Armenians, Azerbaijanis are on the distance approximately uh, uh, 0 0.5. Here are there. In 2019, perceptions of social distances of Georgians and Georgian Azerbaijanis go up and become closer. Uh, let note uh, let note that in 2019, for Georgian Azerbaijanis, Georgian moved from close ethnic group from here to others far ethnic group. Uh, you can, for your own, compare these patterns in detail uh, when you uh, take the, this uh, presentation. They have a lot of interesting things, and however, in order not to lose time, let's move on the to the next slides. This table shows the patterns of perceived social distances aggregated by all years of researches and by all groups of ethnic groups. On the slide, you see an explanation which ethnic groups are denoted as, as Caucasians, Europeans, and Asians. Uh, this slide is confirming the main conclusion of the previous slide. The generalized patterns of Georgians and Georgian Armenians are similar, are similar to each other and differ from the Georgian Azerbaijanis pattern. Uh, now let's see the trends in changes of social distances. They are grouped in the three groups, ethnic groups in Georgia, uh, South Caucasian neighbors, Armenian Azerbaijanis, and region neighbors, Turks, Russians, Iranians, and Americans. Uh, this slide shows the changes of the social distances toward Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis. Uh, the slide 10 toward Georgians and Kurds and slide 11 toward Jews. The main messages are in the trends. Uh, don't pay attention, don't pay much attention on these figures. The trends are important. Please note that on all slides showing the trends, you will see that social distances perceptions of Georgian Armenians in 2019 towards all ethnic groups are sharply decreased compared with 2017. This may be a bias due to small sample size. One must be very careful during interpretation of this data. That is why for distances pre uh, perceived by Georgian Armenians towards Georgian Azerbaijanis, we show two trend lines. First trend line with 2019 data and the second trend line without 2019 data. With 2019 data, the trend is decreasing, but without that data is rap rapidly increasing. Here you see the social uh, uh, distances changes for Georgians and Kurds, and here you see for Jews. Now let's look on the trends towards Armenian Azerbaijanis, that is the South Caucasus neighbors. Uh, this slide shows trend on, in social distances in relation to Armenians and Azerbaijanis. We see that distance toward Armenians here uh, among Georgian Azerbaijanis was very high, but there is a little trend of decreasing. The distance toward Azerbaijanis among Georgian Armenians is much lower. Here it is. Here it is. You can compare these uh, the values and these values. But if we exclude the 2000, uh, uh, if we consider all data, then trend is decreasing. This is the trend uh, uh, towards uh, uh, Azerbaijanis uh, among uh, Armenians. But if we exclude the 2019 data, then the trend is increasing. 
Uh, now we will look on the trends of distances toward regular neighbors. In this slide, in order to show more adequate trends for, of social distances towards Russians among uh, Georgians, we show two charts, the first chart and the second chart. The first contained data for 2007 and the second without it, there is no 2007. Uh, the war in 2008 sharply increased the social distance toward the Russians among Georgians, here you see, which in 2007 is very low. If we look at the trend of Georgians' perceptions with 2007 data, then we see social distance toward Russians is ascending. Here it is. If we look at the trend of Georgian perceptions without 2007 data here, then the social distance toward Russians is, is accent, uh, descending. Now let's look at the trends towards Turks. Uh, distance towards Turks among Georgian Azerbaijanis is very low, is very low and rapidly decreasing. Among Georgian Georgians, distances toward Turks are on middle distances and is approaching to the high distances range, uh, 0 0.6. For Georgian Armenians, we create two trends, with and without 2009. If we look on uh, trend with 2009, we will, look, uh, we will see the uh, descending trend, but without that data, we see a rapidly ascending trend. Uh, here you see the trend on social distances towards Iranians. Uh, now let's look at the structure of the relationship between the perceptions of social distances among Georgians, Georgian Armenians, and Georgian Azerbaijanis. Here you see the results of component analysis of social distances of Georgians, Georgian Armenians, and Georgian Azerbaijanis by enforced three component solution. The main parameters uh, are uh, uh, with high loadings are in red. The bridging parameters with moderate loadings are in black. And the empty cells denote low loadings. When the component analysis is done uh, with the condition eigenvalues more than one, then for Georgians and Georgian Armenians, we got two component models. And for Georgian Azerbaijanis, a three component model. It should be noted that all these models have huge first components. Besides, you see that all the solutions have many bridging parameters. It means that there are several layers which can be revealed by increasing the number of extracted components. In order not to load the presentation with many models, a clustering of overall component analysis solutions is done. Those clusters are presented on the uh, slides 20, 21, and 22. Let's look, for example, the clustering dendrogram of overall component analysis of social distances perceived by Georgians. On the rescale distance 25, you can see two clusters, Georgians as one cluster and all others and the second cl cluster. It is consistent to the social distance pattern of Georgians in 2019, which we see on slide six. On the distance 10, distance 10, you can see three clusters, Georgians, Christians, and Islamic ethnic groups, which is consistent to the three component solution with we, which we see on the pre uh, previous slide. Here, three components. Uh, you can by yourself continue exploring of this dendrogram and dendrograms for Armenians and uh, for uh, Georgian Azerbaijanis. This is dendrogram for uh, Georgian Armenians, and this is the dendrogram of Georgian Azerbaijanis. Now let's speak about main findings. Uh, at first about civilizational rift. Uh, the religious affiliation or civilizational factor is the most fundamental factor determining the social distance perceptions among Georgians, Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis. Because of this, the patterns of social distances of Georgians and Georgian Armenians toward ethnic groups are very close to each other and are significantly different from patterns of Azerbaijanis. Thus, the civilizational rift passes not only through the Southern Caucasus, but also directly uh, through Georgia and Georgian society. 
about regional neighborhood, about Russians. In 2007, Georgians perceived Russians as the closest ethnic group and the social distance perception to towards Russians were conditioned by a separate Russian factor. In 2009, after the 2008 war, this distance sharply increased, but from 2011, it began decre decreasing. A new increase occurred in 2019, maybe after political events of that year. In 2019, Russian factor among Georgians was less pronounced and Russians are incorporated in a wider Christian factor. Social distances toward Russians is significantly low and decreasing among Georgian Armenians and significantly high and is increasing among Georgian Azerbaijanis. About Turks. For Georgian Azerbaijanis, Turks, Turks are very close ethnic group. The social distance toward Turks among Azerbaijanis is very low and is rapidly decreasing. Social distances to towards Turks among Georgians and Georgian Armenians are high and when excluding the 2019 data are increasing, especially among Georgian Armenians. About Americans, when excluding the 2019 data for Georgian Armenians, the social distance perceptions toward Americans among Georgian, Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis are increasing. Now about within Georgia relations, the social distances among Georgian Azerbaijanis toward all ethnic groups, except Turks, are very high and especially high towards Armenians. The general trend of these distances is an increase. Compared to Georgians and especially Georgian Azerbaijanis, the social distance perception towards all ethnic groups among Georgian Armenians are significantly low. And finally, about Caucasus, neighborhood. Among Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis, the same patterns of distances exist towards South Caucasian neighbors of Georgia, Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Uh, that, is, that is all that I want to show you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, now we have some time left for your questions and discussion, but so far I don't see any questions except, except the one that Dustin already answered, which was about um, whether the last wave of Armenia data set is available. So can I please ask the participants if there are any questions to the four, um, five presenters? While, while we are waiting for other questions, I would like to ask um, Tamuna Indrati, if I may, uh, one technical question. When you described your variables and presented your dependence variable, did you try to use other measures of support for democracy in your models? like use other dependent variables and if if so whether you got similar results or something was different because we have if i remember correctly a few questions like three questions which more or less measure support for democracy uh, so, thank you thank you uh, so uh, we did not explicitly uh, went uh, to testing uh, our hypothesis using other, other questions. Uh, but uh, when uh, playing with the data, so more or less the uh, same results will um, across uh, different types of uh, independent variables. Uh, we also uh, wanted to show, so initial plan was to compare uh, value-oriented support and the so-called instrumental-oriented uh, uh, support for democracy. Uh, unfortunately, the type of uh, data in the CBIG, so it uh, could not make us possible to fully uh, measure and uh, operationalize in, uh, instrumental support. And uh, we are thinking of uh, other ways of uh, measuring or using other type of data for that. Uh, but uh, thank you for your insight uh, regarding the uh, application of other types of democracy support. Uh, we will try to uh, play again with the data and to see whether, the, whether these uh, uh, results can be replicated to other, 
and uh, so replicate it when it comes to the other way of operationalization of uh, the democracy support. Thank you. Uh, but so what do we do? I can't believe these presentations did not lead to more questions. Uh, Tina, there is one, one more question on YouTube, and it's uh, okay. why 2019 data makes so much difference about the Armenian uh, data, I think. The question is addressed to last presenter. I will copy it now in the chat. Well, I guess it should not be on, so, I think Ella can also try to answer this question. So either Ella or Samuel, if you have any insight about uh, the reason for the depth difference of the last wave in Armenia. Um, big difference with regards to, I sorry, sorry, I didn't get the, yeah, I why, think it was so addressed to the last presenter to so Samuel. If you go to chat, Some, some it's a different one. Ah. Okay. May I answer? Yes, please. I think the problem is the sample size. You see sample size in absolute numbers for Azerbaijani Armenians in Georgia. We have a very little sample cells here and, oh, excuse me, here and here. And if we look on the probability that we can get a biased sample, there is probability. And I think that it is, uh, uh, maybe it is biased sample because the number of people here is uh, much lower than in other parts. I think this is. This can be because when I look the uh, decrease of uh, va va uh, variables on uh, approval of marriage, at 2000, from 2017 up to 2019, the decrease was 35%. It is impossible to have this sort of uh, uh, decrease uh, about uh, very deep uh, dispositions. Uh, approval of marriage is a very deep uh, disposition, and it can't it can't uh, have so big changes in two years. That's why I think that we have a sample problem. This is my uh, point of view. Maybe others have other uh, explanations. When I was uh, working on this uh, investigation, and I uh, uh, see that. Uh, uh, the uh, sharp decrease. I asked uh, CRRC Armenia to uh, ask to you, CRRC Georgia, in order to uh, understand this problem with joint forces. And I am, uh, uh, I, I, I want to understand this problem with Georgian CRRC. Um, However, this does not answer the question, I'm afraid, because the question was different. The question is, I read it in, is there a significant linear correlation between social distancing and religion? And then there is another question, why 2019 data makes so much difference? It is question to me? Yes, both, yeah. Uh, I can't uh, uh, ask on th this question because I say that I think that is a, that it is subsample problem, and that is why I always uh, make two trend lines with 2019 and without 2019, and all the, my colleagues can uh, uh, by themselves uh, use the first or the second trend lines. But what about the first question about religion? Hello?
Samuel? Yes, yes, I hear you. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to repeat the first question that was about religion, if you saw it. You can see it in the chat. Uh, if you uh, allow me to share screen, I will show it. Of course. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Look here, the three component, uh, uh, three component component analysis for Georgians. We have three factors: Georgians as a national uh, uh, component. We see that Georgians are uh, a very separate group from all others. Here we have Islamic factor for Iranians, Arabians, to, uh, Indians, two schools, Azerbaijan, and Georgian Azerbaijanis, which which are have high loadings on this factor. And factor for Christians, you see here the Christian, uh, the ethnos, uh, ethnic groups. Indians are and Jews are here because of uh, two points. At, uh, uh, this fact, I say that these factors are very, uh, give very, uh, 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 many bridging parameters. And these Indians and these Jews have bridging pa uh, par uh, are bridging parameters for all others. And you can see that the Christian is and Islamic factors are revealing also for Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis. For Islamic factor for Armenians, Turks, Iranians, uh, uh, Arabs, Indians, Kurds, Azerbaijanis, and, and, and so on. When we make four or five or six component analysis, the Azerbaijanis and uh, Abkhazians are separating from, from this. This we can see on, we can see here. This is the two component analysis, Armenians and all others. This is the second analysis, third and, and go and so on. And you can here look and see that who, who are closer, who are uh, further for Armenians, for uh, Georgian Armenians, and how they are clustering, how they are grouping in uh, uh, much or less groups. The same you can see for Georgians, the same you can see for Azerbaijanis. That is why uh, I make factor analysis of these social distances for practically all the uh, uh, Caucasus barometer uh, surveys, and the civilizational factors are always revealed in all the, uh, uh, the uh, surveys uh, up to 2013, where Azerbaijanis also are uh, participating in Caucasus barometer. I, I make uh, uh, that analysis also for Azerbaijanis and civilizational or religious factor is revealed also for Azerbaijanis in Azerbaijan. Thanks. If I just may make a comment here is that I just don't think that the sampling of Georgian Armenians and Georgian Azerbaijanis was uh, representative. So you might want to consider very, very carefully whether the findings for these two groups are have any any indication of representativeness because you might uh, you might end up with very unreliable findings here. So I don't know if we don't have any other questions, we might wrap up slightly earlier. If it's okay, we'll um, matter. Um, yes, let's just stay in the meeting for 30 seconds because the YouTube live is a little bit lagging behind. So if there are any other questions there, uh, I will let you know. 30 seconds. Okay, and thank you very much to all the, present, all the presenters because this was very interesting and I guess I, I personally missed Caucasus parameter quite a lot. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, panel presenters, speakers, participants. Thank you very much for being here, having questions. I hope there will be more questions uh, in the next uh, sessions. People will be warmed up a little bit. Now we will go for a break and we'll be back at uh, 1 p.m. So don't, don't go too far and we'll be back at 1 p.m. with the panel one, which is on memory, rights, identities and values in the South Caucasus. Thank you. Half an hour break.
and we are back. Um, hello again. Now we start with the panel one, memory, rights, identities, and values in the South Caucasus. The panel is moderated by Nutsa Batiashvili from the Free University of Tbilisi. Nutsa, I made you a co-host. Um, some of the uh, panel speakers uh, had issues, but I think they are all here now. And we should start, uh, I, I will give the floor to Nutsa first, and then we will start with the first presentation. Nutsa, we cannot hear you. Um, yeah, I, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure to attend any of the CRRC events and especially to be a part of it. Uh, I've listened to very interesting um, uh, presentations in the previous session, and I'm looking forward to this, um, to our session that looks uh, very interesting to me um, on memory, rights, identities, and values in the South, South Caucasus. Uh, so, and I'm uh, looking forward to, uh, we will talk here about the uh, role of uh, language policy and uh, transformation of rites and rituals. Um, uh, and uh, what is now a big theme, topic uh, around the world, the moving around the statues and the uh, and, uh, uh, policy, this, uh, the monument. Uh, policies, how monuments move around has always been an issue in the South Caucasus and it's be become now an issue uh, for the entire world and uh, generally memory, it's a big part of memory politics. Uh, and finally, I think Levan Tarnishvili's presentation will give us some sense of how these culturally shaped political processes that are very local and localized uh, gain some kind of point of tangency with more universalistic approaches to values and social development and so forth. So I will not um, take any more um, of the session's time. I'm uh, pleased to announce our first presenter, uh, Ask Armand Betaliev uh, from uh, uh, Armenia University. Uh, am, I, am I saying it right? Uh, uh, he will talk about language policy models and identity construction for the former Soviet countries. So uh, I give you the floor. I have two screens, so that's why I'm looking in two directions. I'm sorry, that confuses me. Hello. Hi. 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 Is it, um, I am new for the Zoom conference. And uh, uh, do you see my screen, please? We see your screen. You would just need to uh, start the presentation and this then one. just go about it the regular way. Is this is this now is okay? My PowerPoint presentation is okay. Uh, yeah, you just have to push on play from start uh, on the top of your screen, and it will. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this uh, participating in this conference for your invitation. I see this, uh, the organization is excellent. Uh, though online, I think this is a very good organization. And I see, I saw your previous presentations very, um, very nice, uh, very good. I, I liked all of them. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, my Title is language policy models and identity construction for Kyrgy it was for Kyrgyzstan, but I, I saw a lot of parallels with uh, Georgia and Armenian as well. And so I will <clears throat> trace some of those parallels during my presentation. My name is Askar Mamitaliev. I am from Kyrgyzstan and I have a I'm an editor of this website. So this is the our regions, <clears throat> as you see. On the left side, Central Asian re region, it's border China, Russia, and then uh, Caucasus region. And uh, uh, while Central Asian uh, uh, Central Asia can have a regional identity based on language, our languages are mutual understandable. And the Caucasus, the, your languages are very different from each other, but still 
there is a hope and there is an opportunity to uh, develop regional identity. Why regional identity? Because uh, need to uh, deal with the external Im imperialistic forces to keep our <clears throat> to talk on the, with them on the high levels, on equal levels. So both regions, I think, need regional identities to talk with China, Turkey, Russia, and <clears throat> Iran, other uh, powers. So uh, I'd like to I'd like to talk uh, around this question: What are the main correlations between language policies and identity construction in Kyrgyzstan? I have. Uh, I edited a little bit, it, it's relevant for Eurasia as well. So uh, the method was mainly diachronic study of language policies. I mean, from historical perspectives, from time perspectives, looking back. And I had also interviews and survey on this website. But in this presentation, I will be able to present only the first diachronic study of language policies. And um, First of all, I'd like to highlight that language policy is important for identity construction at the ethnic level and at the state level and regional levels. At the ethnic levels, I think uh, in the case of Armenia, for example, you have very few ethnic minorities, but for Georgia, it's still um, important because your minor minorities constitute about, I think about 70% and then uh, you need to build a state level identity so that all minorities would feel that belonging to the state would be patriotic about Georgia, Armenia and Kyrgyzstan as well. In, in, for Kyrgyzstan, we have also uh, significantly reduced, but all the Caucasian nations are in our states still living, Chechens, Armenians, Georgians, even Estonians, some Estonians are still there, and even Germans because of the politics and then we all need um, want all of them to be to feel that Kyrgyzstani, Georgian, Armenian, uh, our titular groups want them integrate and want them to speak the same language and so on. But then in my presentation I think the regional level also important because we feel in Kyrgyzstan the increasing interest from Chinese, China and from Arabic countries, from Russia still there and then the other small country we can't uh, resist, we can't uh, talk with them on the uh, equal position. I think the same is for Georgians, for uh, Armenians. So we need um, to find the language policy model that would be strategically useful for Eurasia. And uh, here I would like to just share the what language policies exist and existed and in, uh, in the in the world first the old european ideology one nation one language uh, is now not not existent anymore in europe i'm currently i am now speaking from hungary and uh, i see the, the huge differences between central europe and western europe and eastern europe is uh, totally another planet uh, from this point of view. Uh, the old European ideology before Hitler, it was it was a very interesting and, um, but uh, now European Union has 21 official languages. Uh, so current European ideology is multilingualism. Uh, they have, uh, they encourage other languages to join and make um, sure that they are, their languages are functioning. So how this multilingualism would work for our countries? Let's talk next slides. Now, I'd like a little bit <clears throat> highlight these models. There are uh, three models I, I wanted to, uh, to highlight, uh, which came from my studies of uh, documents in the European Union and uh, Central Asia and former Soviet Union, that monolingualism, if you choose the monolingualism language policy, to promote only the titular language of our country, Armenian, Georgian, Kyrgyz, or Uzbek, then uh, that may hinder construction of regional identity. We can't build on this, uh, we can't build a more stronger regional identity on monolingualism in our nation states. Uh, next version is B is bilingualism with a supranational language, uh, but that may lead to language shift. I mean, language shift is language death. 
since uh, <clears throat> if we choose uh, another supranational language, let's say Russian or English or any other language, the next generation may choose this supranational language and just um, leave their heritage ancestors language on the home home use on the community level and it may lead gradually to the decline of the, this language but if you choose one language for example uzbek or uh, for central asia kazakh or maybe armenian or georgian nobody will agree and nobody will agree to integrate on the basis of one titular language so third version is trilingualism with english this is the possible option provide because it provides the room for national languages. I'll explain why trilingualism with English and with another supranational language would be more uh, suitable for our countries to integrate more on a regional level and to talk in on equal, equal basis with Russia, with uh, China, with the other Turkey and other countries. So First, first, before going through that, I'd like to a little bit highlight the advantage of tri trilingualism for regions, uh, Caucasus and for Central Asia. First, uh, three languages removes communication barriers between smaller nation states in their former Soviet countries. If we, our next generation will speak in three languages, international languages, they will, they will be better, easier to integrate. I think it's understandable. Uh, and the uh, trilingualism may develop stronger regional identity. We have, of course, Central Asian identity and Caucasian identity. And Moscow, they say Litso Kafkaska nationality, but that carries a negative connotation. And for our two, a lot of things are negative. But but <clears throat> but we need to strength, strengthen that uh, regional identity on positive, more stronger basis. Uh, on the Caucasian identity too. But trilingualism helps in this uh, case, I think, um, as is based on my um, analysis. And it better resists linguistic imperialism. Linguistic imperialism is a term for English. Uh, another name is language killer, where English is coming, then there is a, uh, the title of language is dying. But in, in the case of former Soviet Union, coming of English uh, in parallel with other supranational languages uh, like Russian will not serve as ling language killer. It will balance and give a room for national languages to develop. So I'd like a little bit of highlight. And do I have how much time? So highlight a little bit <clears throat> later findings on multilingualism. If someone has some doubt, doubts or some or how to say, uh, negative attitudes towards multilingualism. First of all, the, uh, in Europe, the later research says that multilingualism is helpful, have some advantages in learning other languages. If a person knows his own heritage language, uh, that person can learn the second language very easily. And third language will be even more easier because of metalinguistic awareness the knowledge of linguistic structure uh, and um, parts of speech and so on, that will be more easier to learn um, next languages. It, it's easier. Second is the scholars found that multilingualism, there is a significant correlation between multilingualism and cognition with the smartness, with brain. Uh, and then they found that um, uh, this executive function, which is located in the brain in prefrontal cortex, which is called broker area. In multilinguals, that area works more intensively. And uh, because they need to switch off one language to speak in another language. And this works as a training. And as a result, they, uh, the, this broker area prefrontal cortex needs more blood supply and increases the white matter and gray matter and they, they learn, uh, they, their brain works better in this area. As you know, the brain has Wernicke area for language processing and then Broca area for language produce, production. So uh, in, their, uh, in multilinguals, there is a certain advantages in their prefrontal cortex. And the advantages of latest findings of European, American and other scholars are multilingualism positively correlates with mental health. 
the research was <clears throat> the finding was presented when uh, scholars um, uh, analyzed the uh, uh, hospital and then multilinguals came there uh, five, four or five years later. So uh, I mean, uh, the dementia and Alzheimer is postponed in multilinguals for four years or five years later come they because they use their brain intensively languages use their brain intensively when the brain works intensively it postpones mental health so it's good for your health and next another advantage is that multilingualism provides uh, helps to an intercultural understanding better intercultural understanding i don't think you need more explanation in this and next conclusion so we need uh, English at the academic, why English? We need English at academic level because English is the language of uh, science, education, and since most educational scientific resources are in English, and this way we empower our nation, our population, our uh, next generation. When they are empowered, they're educated. Am I on the, okay? And they, they can talk with others, uh, uh, it's, it's beneficial for our um, population. Next is Russian or any other um, neighbor languages on communication level, since it's still de facto lingua franca in the former Soviet Union, and then titular language at the professional level, Ger Ger uh, Georgian in Georgia, Armenian in Armenia, since it helps to communicate with the majority. At the same time, minority languages as medium of instruction should be taught because these minority languages need to feel themselves as belonging, belonging to the nation state, to Georgia, to Armenia, to feel they are patriotic. If you prohibit their languages, they will feel exclusion and they will uh, think that these are not my country and they will, you know, they will less patriotic. That's why teaching as a medium of instruction in regions will help Georgia, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan to strengthen their state, their state actually. So thank you very much, I think. And I can answer questions or go, go further. Um, thank you very much uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, as I understand, we will uh, go to the Q&A session in the end, uh, unless there is some a clarification question right now, and we will move to the next uh, presenter. Thank you yes. very much. Let, let's have Q&A session in the end. And meanwhile, we can collect questions um, via our chat in, in Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Um, so we will now move to our next uh, a presenter. Um, I, I, I lost the Zoom window. I hate it. Uh, yeah, uh, our next presenter is Sumbat Hakobian uh, from the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography and Armenian National Academy of Sciences, and he will be talking about um, uh, transformation of rituals and rites. Um, uh, his presentation is titled New Places, New Rituals, How Funeral Houses Transform the Ritual. Um, so floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And so uh, traditionally do, doing last um, even ages, funerals uh, happened, took place in homes and uh, mostly the home was the place where this ritual occurred and the home was the place which determined the elements, structure, and functions of the ritual. So funerals were tightly related with home environment, with the conditions, and with neighbor, its neighborhood. 
it was very much communal fun uh, ritual because uh, uh, in this ritual many neighbors friends and relatives participated and you you, you can see this happened like uh, until recently even even now it it it, it happens but uh, it starts to change uh, not dramatically but gradually and uh, it can be described funerals which took place in houses as public events so it was very much open for public observation a lot of people who were not participants of the ritual itself could witness how um, some people were buried so uh, started from 2015 um, many funeral houses were built and rituals started to move from houses to these funeral houses which are called in Armenia like grieving houses but uh, the English term for, for these places funeral houses so I will use this term and uh, uh, while I was ob observing the rituals, I noticed that many things have changed ever since. So my research question is what changed due to this shift? And uh, I collected data, ethnographic data from 2013 till now, and I will, I will make my conclusions and observation based on that. So um, I want to ref refer to a uh, ritual place theory developed by um, scholar Jonathan Z. Smith. So he claimed that rituals, the place, um, geographical place is very important uh, thing for ritual the place determines the elements of ritual, its structure, its function. For example, if it takes place in church, the church, the physical um, characters of the church, but not only physical, will, will dictate what kind of ritual we will have. If it takes place in such a shrine, that shrine will dictate the rules. If it takes place in some open air, area that place will uh, bring uh, rituals elements or structure so this is this is not geographical determinism because the place in in this sense is not just their physical location it is uh, also it has also cultural meaning symbolic meaning so when we are talking about place, it is not only its physical characters, we are talking also about cultural elements. So when I observed these rituals in funeral houses, um, I noticed some differences in comparison with uh, funerals in homes. So one of those is the change of structure and process. So the dynamics of the ritual has changed quite dramatically. So in houses, people were constantly involved in the process of ritual. They were engaged in constant grieving or interaction with the body, the people who grieve, mourners, with the elements of ritual, with material elements of ritual, be that the coffin, the wreaths, or the photograph of the disease. So there is constant involvement in the ritual in this case. But when it moves to funeral houses, you see that the intensity declines. People are not uh, always involved in the, process, in the process of ritual. There are some times when you are involved, 
you are you visit the funeral houses either in the day of uh, uh, one day after the, the death so and and two days after the death when the very burial takes place so mostly you are involved like maybe two three hours but in case of houses that time that time is much more larger so and also in houses ritual takes place in, in the place where every death life occurs so may some people uh, lay down and sleep in the very house when with the when, where the body is is set so but but um, so you can see that um, due to this change people were so people were signed of uh, shy away death so the death has become more distant than in houses another interesting change is disappearance of magical or symbolic rituals or ceremonies which you can witness you could witness in houses normally so i call this magical or symbolic rituals because they are linked to some so-called paranormal beliefs or actions that are directed toward that beliefs. So clock stopping is one of those. So when someone dies, usually people stop the clock at the very hour of death, hour and minute of death. So it's symbolic action. Hitting the door with the coffin, which uh, I would say it was disappearing already before even these changes. <clears throat> but in some places, especially in rural areas, you could witness that. So when they took the coffin out of house, they hit the door three times. Or people cover the mirror or every reflecting Mm, object in houses. Um, some 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 people interpret this action as uh, as they want to, by means of this action to to <clears throat> to not allow uh, the soul of disease to appear in the mirror. The spinning of the coffin is another ceremony which people were used to do once they took out the coffin out of, out of the house. So it was spinning three times and by, by many people, by interpretation of many people, the meaning of this action was that they wanted um, to prevent a return, uh, to prevent the disease to return, its soul to return to house. So it was kind of messy. Um, and in general, um, more institutional ritual counts. And we see that folk beliefs and folk rituals, folk uh, practices are declining. Another change happened concerning to grieving and emotional expression during the ritual. In the houses, you can witness, one can witness that a lot of people, especially women, are weeping and mourning and crying loudly, even in front of houses, in yards, when they put the coffin down on some table and express their last uh, wishes and uh, say their goodbyes. But in funeral houses, I noticed that um, expression, emotional expression is much lesser. So people were, are not grieving so intensively. They are not expressing that much in, in emotions. And this can be compared to what happened to, to, to this practice 
in Western countries, especially in the United States, for example, you can witness this change of grieving when, when in 1920s, funeral houses appeared and death, which was public before that, has become more private and the grieving itself has become more private and less emotional. So there are the, this kind of changes in the ritual. And I would say that my study and my data um, kind of approves Smith's theory that plays indeed uh, plays a very significant and pivotal role for rituals. And it determines the structure, the elements and functions of many ceremonies. And we, we can see that now we have more institutional and modern funerals. When I say modern, I mean, I mean modernistic rituals, not traditional ones. And uh, that's all. That's all my con conclusions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very interesting uh, presentation and a topic is itself very engaging. I myself have probably half a dozen of questions that I want to ask that at the end of um, our presentations. Uh, so we now move uh, to our next uh, presenter, Anahit Radibian. Uh, from Research Center for East European Studies, um, University of Bremen, and we'll hear a presentation about memory map of Soviet er era monuments, the parlous symbols and power of the past. Um, the floor is yours. We look forward to the presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, topic and presentation. Uh, I have a uh, very uh, extra, I have, I have so many topics to cover, that's why I skipped uh, so lots of them, but I hope to have uh, enough time to speak about all of the topics I plan. Uh, so, uh, it's just uh, a few minutes of for sharing my presentation. So, let me see, okay. Uh, uh, my presentation, uh, I'm sorry, can I have to... uh, my presentation is about memory map of Soviet era monuments and uh, my topic is divided into two parts. First of all, I would like to present a uh, digital map of uh, interactive map of Soviet era monuments, which I uh, conducted uh, nearly five years ago. Uh, but after that, I collected uh, lots of information and data uh, during my field work. And uh, you can see the methodology uh, with which I work. And uh, so uh, I can say that uh, I combined the digital map, uh, mapping methods uh, with the uh, traditional methods uh, that we use in social sciences. Uh, uh, what is the main idea of my research? Uh, the research was about the, is about uh, the symbolic acts and symbolism of Soviet era uh, monuments. And uh, uh, I can say that in Armenia we have a lot of uh, Soviet era monuments. Uh, and uh, during the historical transformation, the Soviet people becomes ideologically powerless, but they still have superior status on the whole country. Nearly in every region in our country, we can meet Soviet uh, monuments, and it means that uh, the existence of Soviet uh, ideology is uh, uh, very high. And currently, they lose their power neither in the physical dimension nor in the people's mindset that associates the symbols with the welfare and the power of the office of the class. Uh, so my research is mainly about the peculiarities of Soviet area monuments built in Armenia and the visual illustration of them with the aid of interactive maps. The main issue of the topic is that the Soviet symbols and the Soviet era monuments have still a great power in our society. That's why 
why I attempted to map and analyze the broadest metallic acts, the rules, and the fate of uh, monuments built in Armenia. All of the monuments were cited and combined in an interactive map, as you can see in the cover, with the aid of geographical software tools. When I plan to uh, make a printed version of this uh, map, as you can see uh, in the following slide. And uh, but uh, this uh, this version uh, I conducted with the aid of uh, Google Maps. In addition, during my research, I conducted also, as I said, face-to-face -face interviews by using oral history methodology. In my presentation, uh, it's a pity that I can't show and discuss the general uh, uh, findings uh, uh, about the memories that I collected. But uh, we can, I will show the general path and power of the Soviet Arab monument in Armenia. In two words, uh, I eager to share my personal experience when mapping monuments. Firstly, the simplicity of this method has helped me make the data more classified and visualized. But generally, digital maps don't allow to preserve the copyright of the pictures and the information collected from the storytellers. So all of the, uh, the whole map has some layers, as you can see, and uh, there are uh, there are uh, contents, uh, and uh, you can see in, uh, in each layer how much points there are. This means that um, uh, in each layer we have, for example, memorials dedicated to the victims of Soviet repressions. Nine points. It means that only nine monuments uh, are summarized in, in the map. So uh, the first, uh, but uh, besides the map, parallelly I started to investigate uh, the rules and uh, the first question of my research uh, was to find out the roots of the most of the type uh, of the monuments. And uh, the research question concerns about this part, uh, the uh, start how, how they. Uh, start to build Soviet uh, era monuments, but and uh, uh, within uh, my uh, oral, uh, within my interviews, I found out that uh, some of the Soviet era monuments uh, have roots in uh, pre-Sovietization of the country. Uh, like uh, the, uh, the this was very interesting because uh, uh, there are so many friendship uh, monuments in Africa. In our country, that becomes uh, 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 the place uh, where uh, people gather uh, for celebrating the anniversaries, for example, of the Revolution and other sort of uh, celebrations. Uh, and uh, it was very common uh, for our country uh, to have such kind of friendship uh, monuments. And even uh, during the Sovietization of the country, uh, we can see that. Uh, even during the Soviet time, we can see that uh, they built uh, uh, lots of monuments dedicated to the, uh, not, not only for the uh, uh, friendship, but also uh, to uh, dedicated to the anniversaries of joining Armenia or uh, part of Armenia to Russia. Uh, these political circumstances also uh, are currently used on the console for uh, uh, this political circumstances uh, is uh, can be seen uh, in our days. Uh, in this respect, it is worth uh, recalling the opening of the United Cross statue in the Urban Field State Park on 20 uh, December 2013. The opening ceremony of the monument, which symbolizes Armenian Russian friendship, took place two months after the Eastern Partnership Summit in Vilnius. Where Armenia was used to sign the initial association agreement with the EU, and Armenian President Sarsakian announced that the country had decided to join Russia like Custom Union. But we see not only the power of the monument coming from the past, but also their symbolic position. And even, uh, I mean, that uh, they reincarnate uh, across time. Let's go on and see what kinds of monuments were built during the Soviet occupation. Uh, so uh, it was very common uh, for our country 
uh, before the Second World War, uh, during Stalin's call the party validated monuments to revolutionary figures, party leaders, the anniversary of Argentina's solicitation of total revol uh, revolution, and as well as the young Bolshevik members of the resistance movement. Uh, all of uh, these kinds of monuments were erected uh, throughout the country. But after the Second World War, uh, and also I, uh, I, I have said that uh, there was very common uh, the uh, status uh, uh, anniversary celebration of the October Revolution. Uh, but after the collapse of the, uh, um, I'm sorry, but after the uh, Second World War, uh, the main uh, great deal of the Soviet monuments in Armenia became victory monuments. In my research and uh, doing my research and uh, uh, interactive, uh, due to interactive map, uh, approximately uh, 625 memorial monuments that you can see in printed word version of the map have been constructed for the victim, uh, victims of the Second World War. All of the monuments that uh, I mentioned, uh, approximately uh, 600. 40 monuments were built in Armenia, and in my map you can find information about uh, around 620. It means that all of the monuments are kept uh, in nowadays. And uh, nowadays these monuments and symbols have tremendous cultural, social, and even political impact on the social and environmental level. On the other hand, after the uh, Second World War, the three monuments uh, tended to fill with the daily needs of the people. As you can see, there are lots of memorial fountains uh, of the victims of the war. After the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, the government of Armenia continues to reproduce the power of Soviet people, thus constructing up to 10 new monuments to the victims of the Second World War. And the last one was erected in 2015. And now we have approximately uh, five, uh, uh, five monuments to the victims of Second World War. And, uh, the, and uh, some of them are uh, related to Soviet uh, authorities and uh, friendships, uh, as I mentioned before. This construction not only has an impact on physical space, but also are connected on the ideological, political, and social, cultural themes. Uh, but uh, let's uh, return to the first decade of Soviet era. During the Stalin effort, the development of country was filled with incredible huge projects and programs. It concerns also the architecture and building construction as well. For instance, well known as Stalin's projects of buildings and houses in every country. I think uh, there are so many houses uh, with Stalin's projects. In that time, all of the monuments had to have powerful existence in the landscape and surroundings. In this regard, uh, I would like to mention the statue of Lenin erected on Republic Square of Yerevan by the prominent Soviet sculptor Nerfurov in 1940. Uh, he later became the author of the, of more, uh, of the biggest statue of Stalin among all uh, Soviet Union countries. The monument to Stalin built in Yerevan, as you can see in the picture, uh, has very uh, tremendous and uh, influential, uh, uh, influential uh, uh, in place, and uh, it was situated on the top of the Grassy Hill. And now, uh, and not only now, but it was notable from every corner of the city center. And uh, this position asserted the power, and this power can be felt even nowadays. Uh, even though Stalin's statue was replaced, and the statue of Mother Armenia, as you can see in this picture, is standing on its place, you can see some similar attributes and their appearances. Let's observe it. In Fox Bay, the statues you see no movement, no motions and excitement. Uh, for instance, uh, comparing to the, the statue of Father Georgia and uh, or uh, for, for me very movable statue of Mother of Russia, 
this can easily notice the difference. Our position and attitude of top status are listened moderately now. Are closed and have triumphant form, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, even uh, I noticed that uh, the, uh, you can see the similarities of dress codes here uh, for Chinese uh, statue and other Armenian statue. And uh, if we examine the, the landscape of the statue, we can even see uh, Stalin wandering there. Oh, it, uh, I think it's, uh, well, it, it's not correct, but uh, even nowadays we used to call this place monument, uh, which is coming from the past memories that there was a monument to the uh, so say, God, the God of the nation. Uh, so, uh, the fact that before uh, uh, erecting the Mother, Arme Mother Armenian statue, the pedestal was left empty for five years. Then a new story with a new symbolism appeared on the site of Stalin statue in the form of 22 meter Mother Armenia. But now, inside of the memorial uh, building, uh, inside of this uh, pedestal, uh, uh, was opened a museum uh, uh, dedicated to Armenia's participation in the Great Patriotic War. And uh, even nowadays, uh, I think that the environment and uh, all of the surroundings of the Mother Armenia tattoos, you can feel the Soviet past that exists. With the museum exhibitions mainly devoted to the World War II and political war years with Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, how it ends, uh, I can say that, uh, that uh, we can notice the end of the Soviet people, even uh, if we uh, observe uh, the uh, monument discussion, the process of the process of the monument. For example, uh, one of the most iconic monuments to the colors of the 70 year old Soviet Union became the dismounting of many statues, as you can see in the picture, uh, which brought joy to so many and sadness to others at the same time. And since 1990, uh, 1991, the body of Lenin's statue has been regarded or National Gallery. You can see uh, the remnants of the Lenin statue. And uh, now uh, there are so many statues in Armenia that wandering uh, in, uh, in our country. But the existence of this uh, uh, and, uh, and the power of these statues are uh, still remaining very high. And, the, uh, and uh, uh, I would like to uh, ask that there, there is very, uh, you know, I have some hypothesis about uh, about the monument of Soviet era. Is there a life after that? Uh, I think that all of these monuments are living still here in Armenia. Uh, why I think so? Because uh, even even nowadays, uh, you can meet. Lenin, Stalin, or other Soviet era authorities uh, living in some regions. Also, people kept them in their uh, rooms or in their houses or uh, somewhere else. And uh, this existence has great impact on the social life of people in Armenia. And so, uh, you can see uh, other cases when uh, so, uh, Lenin's houses were kept. In, uh, in the yard or somewhere else. And uh, what was uh, very interesting that uh, there is uh, one of the surprising cases that uh, that uh, was very uh, odd for Armenia was this nothing of uh, Ara Arachinas sculpture, Glory to War. This is a statue of uh, what carried in Armenia. Uh, it was uh, dismounted after uh, the first of the human. But the statue depicts a collected image of a worker, and the area around the statue was called Worker Square. The absence of the statue has not led to the loss of its symbolic meaning for power. To the day, it continues to live on as an image of an Armenian worker in social memory.
In the context of the above mentioned review of Soviet monuments in Armenia, the dismounting and replacement of uh, Soviet monuments is a less problem in practice uh, than in other post Soviet countries. Even when the monuments had to be replaced, they found another place to revive. In the picture, you can see National, uh, National Sculpture Park Museum in Gumbi. All of the Soviet uh, era monuments are collected in the park and uh, they have another life and they uh, still survive. Uh, in addition, after the cause of Soviet uh, Union, uh, other interesting uh, circumstances related to the monuments of art. Several monuments from different historical periods, all sculpted by the same architect, uh, Jim Torosan, are situated in close proximity, approximately uh, next to the Yerevan Victory Park. Uh, you can see the monument. Uh, for the victims of Soviet repression, a monument for the uh, 15th anniversary of October Revolution and the Solidification of Armenia, and the monumental stones representing political repressions. Indeed, all of the mentioned monuments are peculiar not only for their appearance and proximity, but also for the meaning they contain. The existence of this memorial situated next to each other shows the beginning, the end, and the continuance of the era, in hand illustrating the powerless symbols of the past, with the facts of age and disappointment from an entire era of Soviet power. And the last and uh, the last thing I have two minutes for uh, for this topic, how Soviet Congress came to reconciliation in Soviet uh, South Korea. Uh, in the picture, you I just have to warn you, we're uh, more a little bit over time, more than five minutes. Um, so um, I hope you can wrap it up in two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, you can see, uh, you can see the village of Overney in uh, Georgia. Um, this is uh, this is a place where we have a victory monument. And, uh, in the monument, we can see that uh, on the pedestal, uh, we, uh, we have uh, the names of Azeri people and Armenians uh, next to each other. And they, uh, people uh, living in this village, Azeri and Armenia, celebrate the victory every, every year with each other. And uh, uh, this, uh, I think that uh, they have very good uh, practices for reconciliation the conflict. At the community level, this monument contributes to the perception of identity of both an individual and collective nature. Because uh, people living there uh, are kept history and they live uh, with uh, very uh, good uh, uh, memories about Soviet past. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. It's always uh, captivating to see this special spa speciality or spatial uh, politics of itinerant objects and how the monuments move around. It just reminded it was in the spirit of Catherine Verdery's The Political Lives of Dead Bodies and reminded me of that. Uh, thanks a lot. We now move to uh, our final presenter, Levant Hafnishvili. Uh, I think he has joined us uh, just a bit earlier, uh, and he will talk about theoretical aspects of world value survey, main principles, challenges, and critiques. Levan, the floor is yours. Is it seen? Yes. Yes. I have to Thank you. Uh, to play the uh, presentation. On mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you. First of all, I'm very glad to participate in the conference. Thank you for CRC to organize this. And as uh, moderator said, my presentation is about theoretical aspects of world value survey, main principles, challenges, and criticism. Uh, and uh, the 
uh, subjects uh, that I uh, will address is the following, the modernization theory, modernization and democracy development, uh, classification of values and their changes, results of uh, uh, just a minute, I will just put the full, just a moment, please. I guess it's better, yeah, now? Uh, sure, yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, uh, results of World Value Survey and methodological difficulties and problems that are uh, this survey uh, face. And uh, uh, in conclusion, uh, we will offer the one of the alternative. Uh, uh, the, um, the theoretical base of uh, the articles that, uh, and studies that we had is two. One is well-known concept of American social, uh, social science, Roland Inger Herman, and he, uh, his follow-up. And second one is uh, phenomenological sociology, uh, especially the Lukman Berger's sociology of knowledge, the base of which we uh, try to develop additional or alternative version of uh, the study of value uh, in Georgia. Uh, as well known, the uh, most often uh, the definition of value is used by Clyde Clutch uh, Cummings uh, definition, a concept of explaining or implicit distinctive of an individual or ch uh, characteristic of a group of desirable which is influence the selection from uh, available moods, means and ends of action. Uh, it's a, a definition of value that we used. Uh, and we know that uh, modernism is one of the theoretical aspects that Ingerman used is a, a theory of modernization, uh, according to which the common economic development is associated with shift away from absolute norm and values towards the values that are uh, rational, coherent, trusting, and uh, participatory. Yeah, and uh, the another one is that shifting from the group values from individual to individual one. And uh, as it's also well known, uh, there are um, two uh, shifting uh, in the history. It's uh, from traditional society to industrial society, early industrialization, the rise of working class, and from industrial society to post-industrial society uh, where the leading industrial countries uh, already passed and the rise of services, knowledge sector, uh, instead of uh, industri industrial um, economy. And also uh, uh, two, let's say, uh, comparative or comprehensive uh, group, um, group of value, traditional versus secular and rational, and uh, survival versus uh, self-expression. Uh, yeah. uh, this is the, uh, um, what I already said, this is well known, and we all know this, and on the uh, base of these, the Inderman uh, World Value Study is based, and uh, the um, theory which is already developed and the study um, in, uh, and this research is done during the uh, years and decades and we, uh, we all know the, uh, it's already six wave if I uh, 
uh, not wrong, which is right now is passing through the world. Uh, what we used uh, in our uh, research is desk research, secondary data analysis, which is based uh, on world value study and also CRRC Caucasus barometer, thanks to CRRC, and also the quantitative survey of Georgian society value system, which was done uh, back in 2006. Uh, uh, brief information about World Value uh, Survey. Uh, we all know that it's uh, done uh, in uh, more than approximately 200 nations in the same period with, using the same methodology and uh, uh, it, uh, it's the sixth wave is already available and seventh is going right now. Um, there are also uh, additional information that Inger Harant is and his follower uh, is using in uh, analysis is uh, social economic wallabers uh, drawn from Wehen uh, and uh, for political relevance, they use the Freedom House and Transparency International. Um, uh, what the modernization uh, is covering and the main aspects are social economic development, effective democracy, and self-determined values. And according to Inger Hahn, uh, these all three aspects, I mean, social economic development, effective democracy, and self-determining value uh, is interacted, which is other. Uh, all three of them uh, develop simultaneously, and one or two of these component, uh, components cannot develop without developing the remaining ones. Uh, and uh, uh, what is also important that the three components uh, are affected each other. So, and here comes the um, uh, first uh, inconsistence uh, uh, with theory and practice. Uh, the authors believe that development of, of originates from two linkage, mean motivation linkage and motivation rule linkage. And also, they are saying that all three uh, are inter, uh, interacted in, in practice. Nobody um, analyzes the mean and rule mean linkage, so it's out of uh, uh, out of um, practical analysis. So it's the first inconsistency, which is going between theories that Ingerhand and his uh, following is. Uh, um, providing and uh, watch in reality. Uh, second uh, problem uh, uh, is that um, um, there is several practical and theoretical uh, um, alternatives of uh, theories that uh, Ingerhand and others uh, world value study uh, theories is providing. First of all, this elitism and democratic elitism, where the, uh, which is, was founded by Pareto and then it's uh, developed during the uh, years and in which the uh, small group uh, according to uh, the elitism and democratic elitism, a small group of elite is always plays greater role in the development of countries than a, an organized mass. So this is another, uh, let's say, alternative of um, of uh, the World Value Series, uh, uh, Survey, where which is showing that uh, the modernization is based on the development of uh, society as a whole. The uh, history also uh, offers examples where transition and economic growth was 
done by elite decision and elite consensus. We can take the example of Turkey and Chile. And also we have unfortunate examples where an authoritarian society has uh, been viewed as a guarantee of stability for a short or long uh, term. And we can uh, refer to uh, example of Russia and China. Also, uh, the problem uh, which is also recognized by Ingerham and uh, others is that the that, uh, World Value Study uh, and its empirical data, uh, there is Uh, and its empirical data is more uh, relevant on national level than on the individual level. Uh, the, uh, on the national level, the um, uh, correlation is 0 0.91 between income and education, for example. And on the individual level, it's just 0 0.29. Um, then uh, also the author of World Value Studying is uh, proposing that um, uh, uh, to, to compare the uh, average uh, uh, means by different countries and sometimes this average did not uh, correspond to the real situation because if it's um, if, the, for instance, the uh, wealth is uh, uh, if the uh, wealth is uh, if the uh, wealth is uh, uh, distributing through the society light in uh, light in the uh, like in the uh, modern western countries uh, the average or um, for instance income is uh, 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 is showing the uh, wealth of the whole society like for instance in germany but if we will have the divided society, like for instance in India, in this uh, case is the average or uh, statistical average is not showing the, in reality, the picture of whole society. Uh, and as we, uh, as we say that uh, when uh, you compare the um, uh, the data from World Value Study. Uh, it's good when you are comparing the, on the national level, but it's uh, uh, have problem when you are uh, comparing on the individual level. Uh, then um, uh, there is the problem with. Uh, there is a problem with uh, also additional sources, for instance, one uh, hand power resources index. This index has uh, its weaknesses. For instance, life exp exp uh, expectancy have uh, nothing to do with individual resources. Uh, and also Freedom House uh, data reflected individual freedom, which is important, of course, but uh, uh, unfortunately, Freedom House data uh, ignores the real activities of, uh, for instance, uh, public uh, institution performance, uh, uh, and it's quite uh, subjective and largely depend on the expert's opinion, uh, which is also uh, is important uh, in the closed society because we all know that in the closed society, experts do not have. Uh, that freedom to uh, of expression and uh, giving the uh, alternative vision. Uh, and also, uh, when uh, Ingerhan is uh, uh, 
uh, analyzing for instance happiness on uh, individual society uh, it's uh, have problem with explaining the by objective in the indicators such as level of education economic development and democracy and for this uh, author intru uh, introduced an additional factor like um, uh, genesis yeah so uh, to summarize all uh, this um, uh, this causes numerous problem, problems, especially when you are trying to analyze an individual country and not doing the comparison uh, or comparative study uh, between countries. And also, it um, uh, gives the problem when you are trying to analyze on an individual level. For instance, uh, uh, when you're trying to uh, explain where Georgian society is uh, and either it's traditional uh, um, society or modern or postmodern society. Uh, and uh, because uh, I will try to show you on the uh, on the example of Georgia using the uh, sixth wave of world value study. For instance, according to Huntington civilization uh, fault line, um, uh, the modern society or democratic society uh, rejected the authoritarian form of government and sought strong leaders uh, who do not bother with uh, parliament and election. Let's see what uh, we have in, in Georgia. Uh, here is the uh, data from uh, sixth wave of uh, World Value Study, and we have uh, we see that we have very long, uh, very strong support of democratic political system, but also we have high strong uh, support of uh, having strong leader. Also, uh, uh, as we all know, uh, the uh, trust toward the people is also determined uh, where society is. And uh, according to Ingerhand, um, uh, the, as the society is as developed as there is uh, trust toward unknown people. And here is the uh, result of from uh, Georgian data. And you see the people, the society for uh, for Georgians uh, is divided uh, uh, between people that they know and who can be trust, and uh, then other. Uh, here is the uh, results. It's over ninety percent that people you personally know can be trust, but. Here is the less than 20% uh, of people can trust uh, uh, the people you have a first time meet, and uh, even less um, uh, respondents saying that uh, in general people can be trusted. Uh, also, uh, uh, trust towards the charge. And the role of charge uh, is also determined uh, where the society is, and either it's traditional or uh, modern or postmodern. In Georgian, all uh, uh, surveys are showing that the trust uh, toward uh, Orthodox charge is quite high, and we here are. Uh, uh, referring the uh, and here we are referring the uh, NDI mm -hmm. sponsored um, survey, which also done by by uh, CRC, and it's showing that on the one hand the religion and God is very important for 
Georgian, but on the other hand, uh, the religion is not playing the uh, real role in everyday life, uh, in, in public administration or uh, marriage or children are houses. And also, um, uh, if you compare uh, the data of, uh, of people who are attending the religious ceremony at least one a week, which is uh, what is necessary for Orthodox charge, it's only 21%. And, uh, and uh, the people that mean uh, meaning religion to follow the normal plan uh, ceremony even less. I can be, uh, I will try to be very brief uh, in them. Also, uh, it's well known that uh, attitude toward marginal group is good indicator of society's readiness for equality. Uh, and according to and Norris, it's a um, uh, attitude towards uh, sexual minorities. Um, highest it's in Egypt and Bangladesh, you see the result, and lowest and in Germany, uh, Great Britain and Canada. Georgia is more intolerant uh, in these uh, issues too. But on the other hand, uh, also it's well known that uh, attitude toward men and women equality and gender issues also showing the um, showing the um, development of society and uh, this uh, um, uh, graphic is showing that in Georgia we also have the uh, uh, unbalance to the situation uh, here is that question, uh, either it's uh, university education is more and more important to men, and you say that many people have the degree, uh, but on the other hand, um, approximately half of people think that men are better political leader and better business uh, executives. But on the other hand, uh, the many, uh, many people disagree that uh, there is problem if women have more income than husband. Uh, that uh, also more people agree that uh, the job is best way for women to be independent. So all of those uh, showing the Georgian position cannot be explained by the application of traditional tools and theory. And we cannot say uh, where Georgian society is uh, using the world value study because uh, part of values are traditional, part of values are uh, modern and even you can say the postmodern values here. Uh, and because of this, uh, we decided to uh, try to develop the uh, alternative version of additional version. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we, we developed the questionnaire based on uh, phenomenological sociology, uh, sociology of Luckerman Berger, uh, sociology of knowledge. Uh, we uh, developed the list uh, of values, which is important for Georgian society based on focus group. And uh, on this focus group were uh, participants in the social science, students, practitioners, experts, and so on and so far. And uh, we ask uh, either, the uh, uh, question was, uh, which of, uh, of the listed points are important for existence of uh, certain value, for example, uh, family in Georgia and rate it by seven point scale. And according to this, um, uh, we uh, divided the value of Georgian society in several ways. It's uh, inst in, in, uh, institutionalized values or means uh, orientation for daily social life and they are new technology, ecology, education, uh, leisure, legislation, rule of law, and so uh, etc. You can see. Uh, uh, then total values uh, 
that are in the institutionalized, but their structure are uh, so um, unpleasant that people um, perceive uh, their presence as a con uh, consistent. And you can see the, the list of this. Uh, and subjective meaning uh, uh, that values are exist only in uh, textual or verbal form and do not play uh, the significant uh, role mm, on day to day, uh, day to day, right? So to uh, finalize, uh, this alternative uh, version of uh, studying of value in Georgian society. Um, uh, it can be used in in uh, studying of uh, any societies, and you can identify this interrelation of uh, these three types of values in each society, and uh, define types of society. Uh, um, uh, you can do it uh, through time series surveys uh, and um, identify the. Uh, changes of this, and um, what is also important, you can use as an additional part of uh, using the uh, traditional world value uh, study. This is all what I wanted to say. If there are questions, I will be glad to answer. Uh, thank you, Levan. I think we are uh, really, really over time, and. Um... I uh, should now get to the Q&A session. I just wanted, um, uh, as a, a bit of a way of summary, uh, this is a very interesting session for me, uh, to uh, provide a, a kind of, just a by, by way of summary to point out that um, throughout this session, we have um, on the one hand seen how historically nuanced and culturally specific transformations takes place and the ways in which the former Soviet uh, republics are rearranging social order uh, with regards to language and memory and uh, communal practices. And this last presentation, uh, on the other hand, it hints towards the ways in which the versions of modernity, uh, particularly the singular version of modernity that views transition not as an unpredictable multi-directional process, but rather in a view of a certain uh, evolutionist perspective from a point A to point B has been part of this, uh, the, been part of the way in which we've reflected on the transition and transformation, which these terms already uh, can, uh, emanate themselves. Um, and how this prism of modernity has become a primary framework in these places uh, through which to view uh, and assess both, uh, both how, where we are and who we are. It's a kind of a measurement stick through which the culture and politics and the motion towards something um, is understood. So I think my, my question in a way uh, to my question is addressed and I will abuse my power here as a chair uh, to use the right of the first question. Um, my question that is uh, addressed to Sumbat Hakobian then uh, reflects this kind of point of tangency between global and the local and this universalistic view versus uh, culturally specific view of, uh, of the uh, 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 pro transformation. Um, and can, so uh, my question, I have several questions, Asumba. Are you here, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so can you uh, give us a little bit of a context for the uh, for this shift toward what I would call de-domestication of the ritual? And if and how it is connected to a market economy and global economic um, forces and the that is relevant to Levant's presentation, value shifts that are related uh, to those uh, forces. Um, do you think that in that vein, do you think that this transformative practice um, is in a way an attempt to evacuate death from intimate 
uh, experience an intimate space and and in a way to objectify is uh, it as a market commodity and then keep some kind of distance because what you said about grieving there was there was also an important clue to me um this sub i i i I um, had a question about that when you were talking about this subsumed restrained form of grieving, whether it is valued as a sign of modernity or civilized kind of emancipatory practice or culture uh, that forces us, that kind of shifts us toward privatization of emotions. Um, so I'm, I can break these down if, if it's too, uh, uh, if it's a lot, but I would really like to hear about the context of market economy and global economic forces that kind of uh, led to this shift toward funeral homes, funeral houses. Uh, thank you for, for this question. Um, so there are many, many points, but I will try to answer them all. Um, yes, indeed, there is this economic shift and economic impact on the funeral ritual. Modernistic ritual, this is ritual um, related with capitalistic society. Traditional society usually organizes rituals by communal forces. People help each other in order to organize some event, some ritual. You can see this uh, in many cases in Armenian villages nowadays even um, people gather money in order to make, to organize funerals. So this is the way to handle this event. But once you come to cities, you see that in the cities a lot of economic changes happen. People still organize big funerals where a lot of people participate, but the, the, like, the core of the ritual is capitalistic and more modernistic. So you need to pay for services, funeral services, you need to pay for the space, you need to pay for the restaurant, which were, were absent in case of uh, rural areas, villages. So you have this capitalistic shift. And also you have that, I would say, yes, uh, this is also about values. And you have now more modernistic ritual when, when there is no place for this communal, uh, like uh, mm. helping each other. And uh, it, it, it um, but when you, when, when you were talking about this modernistic view of grieving, I would say that uh, about the emotions, I would say that um, indeed in, in Western countries, this change happened in the beginning of 20th century when those funeral houses come, the ritual um, also had that capitalistic uh, economic character, and also some element, and also it, it was more private and individual experience uh, ever since. But like from 1970s and 70s and 80s, we can talk about postmodernistic way of grieving and death. It, it's gradually start, death has gradually started to come to public area, especially when we take into consideration how digital technologies change it the way people grieve. So we, ne we ne now can witness a lot of people grieving on social networks. So this considered to be as again, public uh, way of expressing this grievousness and mourning. And in many cases, death has started to be discussed a lot more in nowadays than in the past, like in the first half of 20th century. And uh, there are many theories explaining why this happened. But I think that uh, in, in, in our case, when we talk about Armenian society, and I think also about Georgian society, we have this kind of 
overlap of traditional modernistic and postmodernistic values or I don't know elements or whatever you want to call them. Mm. Thank you very much. I think your topic has a great potential and it touches on many, many um, uh, big trends. So it's kind of a node uh, between different kind of cultural and political and global processes. And uh, I will look forward to see uh, your future work. Uh, uh, there is a question to Levan, I think. Um, thanks for interesting presentation. Could you please elaborate on the role of Georgian uh, nationalism in regards to values? Uh, thanks for uh, interesting question and I will try to be brief in order to save uh, the time. Uh, mm, uh, it really depends on what we identify as a Georgian nationalism because it's somehow all, uh, also reflecting uh, the, let's say, church and religion is playing the big role uh, in, uh, in traditional Georgian nationalism and uh, different, uh, different um, surveys show that uh, majority of Georgian society and Georgian people uh, think that the to be Georgian uh, uh, you should be uh, Georgian Orthodox belong to the Georgian Orthodox Church. So uh, in this regard, what I say, uh, what I said um, regarding the uh, religion is also reflecting. Uh, to the uh, nationalism is one thing. And also uh, what I also said uh, about the dividing of society toward, uh, by ours and uh, others, um, it, uh, the line can be drawn on any issues, political issue, pol uh, people who belong to political, uh, to, to sharing pol our political view, is uh, closer to us and they, uh, the others are, are others and they can maybe identify uh, as the enemy. The line can be drawn um, by uh, sexual orientation, religion, and also by uh, nationality. And in this regard, it's also um, quite well known that uh, the big portion of Georgian uh, society is not that tolerance towards the uh, religion minorities and uh, towards the national minorities. Uh, 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 this is my, my, my answer. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Because I don't see anything in chat. Maybe from our uh, viewers. Yeah, there are no questions in the YouTube chat as well. Uh, we are a little bit, um, we exceeded the time, we're in the break time already. So let's, let's wait for 20 more seconds maybe if someone has some last minute questions and then let's go to the break. And also thank you very much for speakers, two speakers of the first uh, panel um for very interesting presentations and the diversity of topics we will now have a longer break uh but we will actually be back at uh, 3 p.m georgia time which is in about half an hour with the next panel panel two on political economy of transition so i think we can we can break now. I think people are ready for their lunch. So <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you, Lisa, for, for great moderating. No, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And uh, thank you all for great presentations. And, uh, see you around. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Let's, let's be back at 3 p.m. in half an hour.
so so it's one minute left still of our break time um i will i will wait a few seconds and then announce the next panel can i just check if i'm audible yeah you, you are perfect great so um we now have panel two political economy of transition which is moderated by Herine Manassian from the CRC Armenia office. And uh, Herine, uh, I, I think you know that in this uh, panel, we have three presentations now. We should have had four, but one of the presenters, Natyech Eroaria, is not uh, able to join the conference, unfortunately. So the first uh, presenter, Thomas Barrett, is here. Uh, I'm expecting two people from Turkey to join. Uh, they were in the meeting some time ago, but left. I hope they are coming back. But just in case, we have Thomas Barrett and Anna Diakonidze right there. So we can start with them if, the, if uh, Ulvia and Ahmed are not joining on time. Thank you very much. And I give floor to Herina now and the presenters. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Herine Manasyan, the Director of Research at CRRC Armenia, and I'm very much honored to moderate this session with four bright scholars. The first presenter will be Thomas Barrett, who represents the Free University of Berlin, and also Ivana Javakishvili, Tbilisi State University. Thomas has uh, Eastern uh, Masters uh, from the U Eastern European Studies at the Free University of Berlin. And also he graduated the University of Oxford. The area of his research is politics and governance in post-Soviet uh, states, especially in Ukraine, Georgia, and in Armenia. Thank you for that focus, Thomas. He also is interested in anti-corruption, in decentralization, market liberalization, and legislative approximation. As you could see from the agenda, the topic of Thomas's presentation is reforming governance from the top to bottom, fighting state capture in Georgia and Ukraine. I apologize that, CRR, uh, that Armenia is not in uh, focus of study. However, I think that we can make uh, comparisons and parallels <laughs> upon uh, the presentation. Uh, Thomas, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. I'll just share the screen now. One moment, please. All right. Is this visible? to everybody? Yes, I'm, it is. Perfect. OK, great. Uh, I, I'm, thank you very much for mentioning that um, Armenia. Uh, actually, just as a, as a plug for my future research, next year I'm going to be in Armenia. I'll be at the Yerevan Brusov State University. And I'm looking forward to adding uh, to my Armenia knowledge and incorporating it into this research. But anyway, let's get started. Um, Essentially, the main crux of what I want to present today is about the relationship between uh, corruption and decentralized versus centralized political regimes. Um, and why is Georgia and Ukraine interesting in that sense? Uh, I think that uh, the main reason that it is interesting is because um, there's kind of a contradiction in the literature when it comes to uh, Georgia and Ukraine. The literature generally stresses the importance of the dispersal and decentralization of power in reducing corruption and improving governance. Um, why is that? It's often because uh, this research is led by the Western European democratic model, which favors parliamentarism, but also because it's generally assumed that moving away from a super presidentialist system towards a more dispersed and decentralized system should include more stakeholders in the political process, uh, and remove power away from a very closed and very unaccountable ruling cabal. But Georgia and Ukraine, they seem to contradict this in a way, because Georgia is generally seen as the much more successful reform model, especially in terms of reducing petty corruption after the Rose Revolution. But actually, Georgia's revolution was very, very centrally driven, 
and generally lacked this kind of dispersal and a focus upon the uh, checks and balances uh, and the balance of powers in the system. Whereas Ukraine is generally not so much considered as a success story. It's generally considered that it was unable to transform governance in 2005 and in 2014. Um, despite the fact that it actually favored this more dispersed approach, trying to move away from super presidentialism. So the question is there, well, what does this mean for the literature on decentralization versus centralization? Uh, and that's what I want to try and deal with today. Um, but first of all, let's get on to a bit of theory. Um, first of all, I want to explain about sort of how I define corruption, because I think it's very important, because corruption is very difficult to measure as political scientists. I'm very critical of the perception-based indexes of corruption, especially uh, the CPI and the Global Corruption Barometer from Transparency International and the World Governance Indicators. I think they're very difficult for researchers to use because it's hard to make accurate cross-country comparisons and it's very hard to measure change over time because people's perception of corruption is not really a very concrete measure that can be measured against different countries. I also think that it overstresses petty corruption versus state capture. Uh, because um, often just because of the kind of questions that are asked in this survey, but I think there's a bigger structural reason. Um, but before I explain that structural reason, it's important to elaborate on what I mean by state capture. Uh, it is a four-step cycle. Um, the first step is, step is that oligarchs uh, create political parties. They then invest huge amounts of resources in winning elections or seats in parliament. And they then use the control of state institutions that they gain to either just embezzle directly from the budget, or they make the economic rules of the game such that they can profit massively and build huge financial empires. And this money is then reinvested in, in, um, in the next election cycle to maintain this power. And I believe that this is often missed by regular, um, by perception-based corruption measures, partly because it's kind of legal in a way. Um, when oligarchs control the political system and they use it to favor their allies, to make the rules of the game favorable to themselves, to grant themselves subsidies, this is strictly speaking legal. It's um, and therefore, it's actually missed by many of the Western-centric corruption measures, which assume that corruption is something external, that it's something, um, it's an aberration from the norm, whereas in many transition societies, corruption is a fundamental part of how the political process operates. So how do we solve this? Well, the one very good solution is proposed by Mungi Vipidi and Dadasov, uh, the index of public integrity. And this is moving towards an institutional understanding of corruption, where we measure corruption not trying to measure it in itself because it's very hard to measure hidden phenomena, but to measure other factors which have been proved in the literature to control corruption. Uh, so the factors, the six factors that they uh, decide upon in their index, which offers um, a much bigger data set than what I'm looking at now, um, they choose judicial independence, administrative discretion, trade openness, budget transparency, electronic means to supervise government, government and free media. I'm not going to describe in detail why each of those is relevant to corruption uh, because of time constraints. Um, the other theoretical uh, area I want to touch on is kind of a, the new generation of, uh, of anti-corruption studies, which is an emerging criticism of the way that uh, the anti-corruption agenda internationally is very neoliberal. Um, this criticism kind of started in Marxist circles with this idea that uh, transnational capital um, centered in developed countries is focused on forcing developing countries to open up their markets to transnational capital, and it's more interested in building stable and compliant capitalist regimes than it is in building democracies. I don't take this criticism quite so far, but I think that there's definitely an element to which the kind of um, the kind of uh, anti-corruption policies that are promoted are often focused a lot on market liberalization and deregulation, but not so much on democracy building or building stable institutions. And in my opinion, uh, actually, an environment where there's total market liberalization with very few checks and balances is actually just as vulnerable to predation by oligarch groups as very bureaucratic and very corrupt, very stifling regimes. Moving on from the theory now uh, to my case studies, Georgia and Ukraine. So let's start off with Georgia. Um, my assessment of Georgia, and we have many uh, Caucasus experts in the room, and I'd be interested to see if you agree with this thesis, that it had a very, very centralized reform process after 2003. And what I mean by that is that normally we think of uh, these other institutions, um, like especially the judiciary and law enforcement, as playing a role in checking the power of the executive. Whereas in Georgia, Saakashvili and his team generally used law enforcement as a tool of their own political power um, to push through very, very um, aggressive anti-corruption policies. So massive arrests, uh, asset confiscation, 
um, stripping people of office, uh, and also this sort of massive uh, liberalization program of deregulation, privatization, uh, of and re reprivatization as well of, of already privatized assets. Um, and I think that this kind of approach to reform, um, which, which is kind of an aberration from the literature, it's very interesting and it's worth attention. And it, in George's case, it had many positive results, this very centralized and aggressive reform option. Um, it was successful in breaking organized crime in many like the, the pervasive influence of organized crime under Shevardnadze and, and breaking many of the oligarchic groups. There was a large reduction in petty corruption and there was improved scores in rankings like the Ease of Doing Business Index um, and also a lot of technical assistance from international organizations because there was belief in Georgia. Um, but it also, in my opinion, had very questionable results if we think about corruption being more of a broad phenomenon that affects the whole political system. Um, it created a centralized state dominated by the executive and arguably a much more powerful centralized state than you had under Shevardnadze, where the central government was very weak. It didn't control, it, it almost lost control of many regions of Georgia. Um, so what you have actually is, is very dominant power politics. Um, there is a lack of judicial independence, which maybe is understandable in the initial conditions of the revolution when there was a lot of corruption in the judiciary, but sort of, you know, 10 or 15 years after the revolution, this is still an endemic problem, a lack of judicial independence and preferential economic conditions for supporters of the ruling group. So for example, Georgia is very, very liberalized, but also it has a very poor record in terms of anti-monopoly policy, for example. And this is often uh, beneficial to um, people very close to the ruling elite, either the Georgian Dream Party or the United National Movement as it was. Uh, previously. Uh, and also this sort of massive liberalization has led to a, a strong lack of social protection. So although the Georgian economy has grown, uh, the statistics on poverty have been pretty damning. But this is perhaps a, a side issue to the main point. Ukraine has a very different model when it comes to reform and centralization. Um, Ukraine is consistent and the Ukrainian opposition has consistently favored a decentralized and dispersed reform model. After the Re Orange Revolution, this was attempted, but it, it largely failed because Yanukovych returned to power in 2010. But in 2014, it was essentially tried again, but even more with even greater ambition. There was a return to a semi-presidential system, a change to the electoral code, ambitious decentralization, both politically and fiscally. In my opinion, one of the most ambitious decentralization programs in Europe in perhaps in century. Um, and this led to a very, very different kind of reform, not this centralized reform. There was no Saakashvili, there was no Ukrainian Saakashvili. You could not describe Poroshenko in these terms. What you have is you have reform coalitions because uh, in the conditions of the revolution, especially including the war in Donbass and the massive financial crisis that Ukraine faced, uh, the state was very weak. And um, in, after, in the conditions after the revolution, um, essentially oligarchic groups were forced to compromise with civil society actors and to accommodate them into the government and not show purely as a smokescreen, but also give them genuine positions of authority and power. So many civil society reformers gained seats in parliament and they were regularly criticizing and voting against their own political blocks. And also key reformers uh, were put in high positions and were, in my opinion, responsible for many of the most positive, uh, in fact, almost all of the positive reforms that emerged after Maidan. For example, public procurement reform, healthcare reform, political party financing reform were all very strongly driven and drafted by civil society actors who were included in this uh, reform coalition. And um, also this ambitious political and fiscal decentralization also plays a very important role. I don't want to paint a too rosy picture of Ukraine. It's still very much the case, and I think um, you know, it's, very, it's very widely recognized that Ukraine still has a very big problem with petty corruption. Um, to an extent which Georgia does not. Oligarchs retain control of key sectors, they still fund their own political parties, um, and they are often trying to stall these reforms, uh, even though they, they, they join these reform coalitions with civil society, they are often stalling them. And also the justice system remains corrupt, but in quite a different way to Georgia. Generally, the Ukrainian justice system is not so much dependent or, or, um, or sort of subservient to the ruling party. It is often people don't know who it's subservient to. It's kind of almost biddable by many different oligarchic actors who can try to influence justice. Whereas in Georgia, it seems much more concentrated in the hands of the ruling party at any given time. Um, I'm, going, I'm not gonna go through this list on, on all of the six categories from the index of public integrity for each country for, for timing reasons. I think it's much more important to get on to the, uh, sort of the conclusion and to look forward a little bit. Um, 
So what can we learn from these choices? Because we'll, I think it seems kind of ambivalent because you have two models which are kind of satisfactory and unsatisfactory in different ways. Both centralization and dispersal have strong trade-offs. So for example, Georgia, uh, the main sort of impetus that, that opposition groups are, and, and activists are trying to do now is that they want to increase political pluralism in the system without threatening these existing reforms. Um, whereas in Ukraine, on the other hand, you have a different dynamic. The question is, you need to build and strengthen the reform coalition. But what you don't want to do is go too far the other way, where you end up creating uh, a strong ruling elite. Um, and I think uh, this is a very interesting question for, for local political scientists. Um, there is also an international element, which I don't want to go into too much, perhaps in the Q&A, uh, which is the question of um, how far should international organizations support uh, support regimes in, in transition countries. Um, and by investing too much money and legitimacy in these regimes in terms of their reform agenda, are they actually strengthening these regimes to the extent that they actually no longer feel the need to include civil society, that they feel powerful enough to exclude reform agendas? So there's definitely a, a debate to be had there. Um, finally, I think, uh, it's also important to look forward. I think that um, it's very interesting from the point of view of my research, because I think we're, we're in a momentous time. Um, when I started thinking about this, it was, it was when Zelensky very first came to power. Uh, I had very different opinions of Ukraine now than I, then than I do now. And actually, we're perhaps on course for my entire research to be sort of undermined, because it seems like almost the countries are in a stage where they might be swapping roles, Georgia and Ukraine. So Ukraine now has its first ever parliamentary supermajority. It no longer had to form a, a coalition government as it always did in the past. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting what this means for the concentration of power in Ukraine. Will we see Ukraine becoming far more centralized? We've certainly seen already in the last year that Zelensky has removed many civil society activists from key positions and seems much more keen on appointing his own loyalists. Uh, and the question is whether the decentralized and less presidential system in Ukraine will actually form a protective layer uh, against any attempts to concentrate power in the hands of one reformer or one anti-reformer. Um, because uh, I believe that one definite risk in the situation when you have a very centralized regime is that if a new government comes to power, which is not interested in reform and is only interested in enriching its own allies and entrenching its own position, these very, very centralized regimes are quite vulnerable because they don't have other intermediate actors because the ruling party generally controls all public institutions. They are quite unaccountable. Whereas Georgia, for example, is perhaps on a different trajectory. We now, as, as I'm sure you will know, that Georgia is voting right now on changing its electoral code. We may be in a situation in only a few months that Georgia has its first ever, uh, it lacks a parliamentary majority for one party for the first time uh, in a very long time. And this will be very interesting to see whether this greater pluralism will reduce the dominance of the executive, whether it will create more compromise in the political system. Um, or perhaps whether it will lead to uh, what one uh, academic called feckless pluralism, where you have a coalition where both parties of the coalition are essentially just dividing up the country's resources and plundering, and there is no cooperative compromise. So Georgia is, and Ukraine are both definitely in a momentous moment with how they cope with this crucial question of, do they choose a centralized reform model? Do they place trust in a centralized executive to enact real change? Or do they focus perhaps on this dispersed model, which relies on more accountability, more um, participation in the political process, more civil society um, participation? Um, and in my opinion, this is going to be very interesting to watch as we go forward. Um, that's all from my presentation. Thank you very much to CRC for having me. It's actually my first conference presentation. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to any questions that you might have, uh, especially um, you feel free to ask more about my methodology of my research and also about some of these subtopics that I brought up, like the impact of market liberalization and so on. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for such a brilliant and thorough research and presentation. I do believe that you will be uh, asked a few questions and you are welcome to add Armenia to your studies. I just share the link from to the, our recent, recent research on corruption. This was a household survey. You are welcome to study before coming to Armenia. Thank you, Thank you. again. And um, let me to move forward. Uh, the next paper that will be presented uh, has very interesting topic. 
It is COVID-19 in energy, energy markets, potential results for the South Caucasian economies. And the presenter- yeah, Helena, <laughs> let, let me interrupt you. Uh, the speakers are not uh, at the meeting yet. I'm trying to contact them, but before I, I succeed, please uh, move to the next, uh, next presentation by Anna Diakonidze. And hopefully okay. the colleagues will join us meanwhile. Uh, uh, by the way, I was trying to contact uh, Aydin a few times, uh, but uh, couldn't manage. I thought maybe she will be joining immediately. Okay. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> so uh, while switching the presenters, uh, I would like to welcome Anna Diakonidze, who uh, represents the Georgian Institute of Public Affairs, famous GPA. Anna is an associate professor of sociology at GPA and the guest lecturer at the Tbilisi State University. Uh, where she completed her PhD a couple of years ago. Anna has master's in social policy analysis from the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium, and used to be a research fellow at King's College, London, UK. Her research interests are related to labor markets and the skills analysis, social policy and welfare in transition economies. And Anna has her special page. I'll be posting that if you are interested uh, to move forward and learn more on her uh, studies, you are welcome. So Anna will be talking uh, on gig workers in a transition economy, the case of Georgia. Anna, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, you, everyone can hear me, right? and can see my screen, which yeah, I have just yeah, yeah. shared. Uh, just a minute. Uh, I hope this works like this. Uh, so thank you again for a very thorough and long introduction. I'll, um, I'll, I'll start right away as, uh, as the time is limited. So I'll be uh, talking today about um, gig workers in Georgia and more precisely, I will be talking about uh, driver partners of the right hailing company named uh, Bolt in Georgia. So uh, why gig work and why right hailing companies? Um, because um, uh, these are becoming an um, uh, integral part of everyday life of all of us. And I'm sure um, all the um, attendants and participants, uh, the, we're, we're all used to um, uh, getting a taxi via applications. And these companies uh, that provide the, such uh, uh, ride hailing services are increasing in number. Uh, so more probably everywhere. It started with Uber and Lyft in the States. And ever since um, the number of companies has grown. Um, in different parts of the world. Um, there is Ola and Gojek in Southeast Asia, um, and there are a number of other companies um, in the different parts of the world. As for the Bolt, which I have chosen for, for my research, uh, well, because it is uh, one of the main uh, companies providing rights uh, handling services in Georgia, in Tbilisi primarily, um, and uh, they are present in all, uh, basically all post-Soviet countries, and they've, they've also entered uh, some African countries just, just recently. Uh, so, but why this topic in particular? Because as, as already, men, uh, as, um, as it was mentioned in the introduction, so, so my focus of, uh, my, my research focus is on, on labor market and employment um, and more, pre more precisely on um, uh, digital, uh, digital labor, digitalization of labor. And when we speak about gig work, this is, uh, and probably when we speak about digitalization of labor, gig work, gig work is first to come to our minds because this is, um, uh, this because technology is changing the uh, has been changing the world of work for uh, since ever since it was basically um, um, uh, ever since it, it existed, but the pace of change uh, has really uh, um, accelerated over the past decade. And with uh, with the emergence of U Uber and other ride hailing companies, basically it has provided masses of people with um, opportunities to, to start uh, earning and, and working. However, just a little bit of um, a background, research background here um, is um, 
uh, I just want to, to uh, make it clear that the research on um, how technologies are changing the, the world of work is um, uh, mo mostly concentrated on developed economies. And um, the way the gig work is conceptualized there is slightly different from what uh, researchers are now trying to, uh, to discuss in the context of developing and transition economies. Um, just a few highlights is that um, in the Western, uh, for, for instance, in, in the US or on the, on the European markets, um, this, uh, the gig work is considered as, as, a, as a side job or more, more or less as a, most of the studies argue that people are engaged in this type of activities uh, in parallel to their uh, full-time or part-time employment. So this is like additional source of income for them. Uh, and they are, and, and flexibility, which is accompanied to this type of employment is uh, very much celebrated because uh, you are your own boss. You can switch on the application, switch on and off the application whenever you want and, um, uh, and so on. However, the research has also um, uh, this, uh, emphasized the negative side of gig work. And uh, well, there, are, there are a few, but I would just like to uh, talk about the insecurities, uh, different types of insecurities associated with this type of work, which is uh, um, primarily financial as well as social insecurities, because people who are uh, who are not in, let's say, traditional full-time employment, but rather they who are providing different gigs, so like providing ride services, uh, they are um, in most cases they are not part of the social security systems of the country. They are not paying taxes. It is a gray zone. It is uh, in a way informal economy. So. Uh, they, they are not really involved in the social social protection schemes, especially in the countries where um, it is, um, which have social insurance schemes. However, in developing countries, uh, some of the, some of the, the well, the insecurities uh, this, uh, do apply again. However, one of the interesting, uh, the qualitative differences, and just to name a few, is that uh, and there are just a, actually I should say that there are just a handful of studies about uh, about uh, ride hailing companies in in uh, developing context, and uh, but the studies indicate that uh, workers in these countries uh, primarily see this as a as an escape from unemployment. So they they pursue this kind of activities like driving a taxi as a as a, almost like a full time employment. It is not a side job for them. And they also have higher entry barriers to, the, to this job because uh, uh, many, the, many of them don't own a car, which is a prerequisite, obviously, for, for ride, driving a taxi. So, uh, for, so fleet owners have emerged as new employers in this context, um, as, as um, let's say, as a middleman between the uh, ride hailing companies and between the, the workers who want to, to, to ride. So given this background, uh, I wanted uh, to know what, um, what exactly is a, is a status of gig work in Georgia, uh, because there are really no studies done on this topic um, uh, uh, here. Uh, however, we know that uh, Georgian labor market is not immune to, uh, to, let's say, to digitalization. And we certainly observe certain digitalization on, on the labor market. And the taxi companies like Bolt and Maxim and Yandex are definitely very much uh, uh, visible in our everyday lives. So I wanted to investigate this more with, with a more, let's say, sociological lens than just as, as, a, as, a, as a regular citizen. So main, the main question was, how do Georgian um, uh, driver partners compare with, uh, with their peers in developing and uh, uh, developed economies? Uh, this was a primarily qualitative research, which, uh, which, um, had, uh, which is based on 40 semi-structured interviews. Um, and the interviews were taken uh, during, uh, in order to capture different types of drivers, the interviews were taken at different times of the day, uh, in the morning and midday and late in the evening, because uh, we assumed that people who, are, who have jobs, they might prefer to drive only on certain time of the day. And uh, part of the half, uh, half of the uh, rides were initiated in the center of the city, while the other half of the, of the interviews were carried out in the, in the peripheral dist uh, districts of the town. So I should mention that it was a rather an experimental design because we had to uh, start and launch the interviews while riding the taxi, because otherwise it was impossible to get hold of the, uh, of the drivers. And, uh, and then the interview uh, continued as long as, as it took, sometimes even after the rides were finished. So what, we, uh, re, what, 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 what were, were the main findings? Um, uh, just to come back to Bolt, which is um, 
one of the uh, very well-renowned companies in, in Georgia. It, the registration procedures for drivers are very easy. Uh, the, the company is charging 17% commission fee on each ride. So this is the, the business model. Yes, I see the <laughs> your face. <laughs> this is pretty high. Uh, the commission fee is pretty high compared to the competitors um, on the market. Uh, and just like other ride-hailing companies, uh, Bolt is emphasizing uh, that, um, uh, that in the service agreement that it makes with drivers that they are not entering an employment relationship, that it is a service agreement and that drivers should not have any, uh, uh, that they are not becoming employees of Bolt. And why I'm emphasizing this is that uh, uh, we, uh, so uh, I, the research, uh, I, I was questioning the drivers whether how they perceived Bolt and absolute majority of them say that uh, the perceived that Bolt is their employer. However, when asked that, you know, the Bolt is not really providing them with um, typical uh, benefits that, uh, that are associated with employment relationship like uh, annual leave or health insurance and this kind of issues, the, the, the answer was that uh, these type of benefits are not provided even in formal sector jobs in Georgia. So this is a, an interesting point which I will be coming back to uh, later in my presentation. I would like to say a few words about the background of the drivers socioeconomic background as the research investigated their uh, education, their prior working experience. The bottom line is that the drivers are, uh, the background is really diverse. So your Bolt driver can be anyone from uh, starting with a person with uh, MBA diploma who had a, used to do uh, uh, consultancy business, ending with a guy with secondary education whose peak level job has been a janitor. So, but what really uh, unites them all, like uh, what is really common for all the driver partners is that they have uh, come to this type of um, uh, activity, to this, this type of employment, because they, um, uh, they wanted to have regular source of income. Basically, they were looking ways out from unemployment. Only five out of those uh, 40 uh, drivers actually had uh, full or part-time uh, part job in parallel to driving the, 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 car, the car. So the conclusion here is that um, uh, just like in case of, uh, as, as we discussed earlier in the literature, um, uh, drive a gig work basically represents uh, not just a side job, but as a, the main occupation for, 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 the, for the workers in this country. The most, the, the bulk of the, uh, actually the main, main uh, focus of the study was obviously on the working arrangements. And uh, uh, what is uh, probably what is striking here is that um, the drivers report insanely high numbers uh, or long num hours of driving. So on average, they have averaged 10 to 12 hours per day, uh, in some cases, even 14 hours or more. Um, and this is, um, and this was, as, as they um, explained, this is um, uh, like minimum in order to earn a meaningful income uh, on a monthly basis from this activity. Um, uh, obviously, the drivers uh, were making breaks during the day. However, the notion of uh, longer breaks like annual leave or long term long term holidays is basically absent even uh, well, while uh, they try to take at least um, at least a week off during during the year, even in these cases, uh, majority of the drivers noted that they would uh, still uh, from time to time put the application on and uh, try to work a little bit in order to keep the cash flow coming. And here we have to explain and, and now when we, when, when we have, uh, if we want to explain the reasons why they are putting so much wor working hours uh, on a daily basis is that um, uh, they, these people depend on their daily, uh, daily labor for cash flow. So if they stop working for even for a day, this would mean, um, um, this would mean that their, um, uh, their cash flow is stops. So, and which basically they cannot afford. So, uh, respectively, uh, flexibility, which is usually characterized as, as one of the main characteristics of, of the gig work is basically illusory because, um, uh, in re yes, I mean, formally the drivers can, um, uh, can stop working whatever they want, but, uh, if they do so, uh, then they will have to, then they will have um, uh, a very small amount of, um, uh, they would have, er would earn very small amount of income, which is, um, 
which is really not uh, not good for them. So talking of income, uh, I think this uh, this is also a very interesting finding, at least compared to other case studies in transition uh, and developing countries, uh, that actually um, workers uh, do, so doing these gigs, so, so driving with Bolt, are making on average, uh, so monthly making about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 um, lari, Georgian laris, which is, uh, which is for Georgian uh, mar labor market actually a rather good uh, monthly wage because officially just for, for our non-Georgian colleagues, I should say, um, the um, uh, average wage according to National Statistics Office is 900 lari, but, um, uh, but, but in real, I mean, this is, uh, this is not a medium wage, but it is, it is, a, it is a national um, statistical mathematical average, so to say. So the, to, to cut it short, basically the income that they have reported is, um, is good compared to, to other, um, if we look at the bulk of the uh, service sector jobs uh, available on the market. However, in order to earn such, such a good income, they basically have to work nonstop. Um, and the interesting thing was that none of the drivers actually reported having savings, um, uh, which is uh, understandable if we, if we consider that uh, about half of them have been driving a rented car. This is another interesting uh, finding that um, unlike other, uh, other studies in the literature, which are discussing the formal ways of like middlemen and fleet owners uh, being, being uh, in the game. In, in Georgian case, we saw that uh, uh, the, uh, part, the half of the drivers were driving with the rented car or they were just taking a car, using a car of their friend. So it gets really, so there is definitely within the market of the uh, Bolt taxi driving, there is internal market, which is very informal and where the um, arrangements about sharing the income and arranging the working schedules is very, uh, very informal and just um, uh, and just based on mutual, uh, let's say, verbal agreements uh, a bit between between them. So I won't go into the very details um, of this of these details uh, um, of these arrangements at the moment. I just want to also. Uh, talk about the um, social security side of, of the actually and the security side of this, this type of employment um, uh, because uh, uh, there have been three main areas which uh, which I investigated this referred to health pensions and, and income security. Um, so health insurance was uh, the, the driver partners themselves were not that much concerned about um, uh, pensions or health issues and this could be understandable because uh, they they were primarily using uh, making use of the national healthcare system um, uh, uh, and uh, um, and uh, the pension as for the pensions they were not really um, thinking about the the um, the social social risks uh, during the old age but what is important to mention is that none of them have been involved in the contributory pension scheme which Georgia has uh, introduced just recently. This is a second pillar of the pension scheme in Georgia. And why is it important to mention is that first of all, majority of the drivers were not even aware of the fact that they could, uh, that they actually had the possibility to join. However, they, all, they have all stated that even in, even in this case, um, even if they knew about this opportunity, they would not uh, join and start paying contributions in, into the into the scheme, what was the main concern for the drivers, however, is uh, income maintenance. So, in terms of social security, income maintenance is, is a real challenge for them because, as I already mentioned, the this type of working is um, so these drivers get paid by the company once in a week on a weekly basis, and uh, so what uh, uh, whatever comes from the customers as a cash payment, they they the, the cash payments, of course, they keep. Uh, but in reality, the situation is that if, uh, if the drivers uh, do not put on the application at least for one day, and if they stop working for one day, um, this, this does make a significant, um, it does represent a significant um, decrease in their income, which they, can, they say they cannot afford. In other ways, and, and this, is, uh, this is what really keeps them actually uh, keeps them working with uh, sometimes even with very fixed schedules because they uh, they see that 
if they don't introduce a very fixed and rigid schedule, they will be uh, taken away from, from the, this rhythm of working. So in a way, uh, this type of uh, their uh, working mo mo model resembles actually full-time employment. And actually, uh, uh, and to be more precise, it is more than full-time because of the number of hours that they are putting in. So um, just to uh, come to conclu conclusionary uh, notes, I would say that um, uh, so as as a, as, a, um, as, a, as the listeners would would uh, understand, this was an actually an exploratory research, um, uh, and the, uh, as I, and I see it myself as a first step towards researching this uh, this type of employment in Georgia, uh, and uh, from this research I have uh, seen that uh, there while there are a number of similarities, there are also differences at least in the Georgian context, uh, and primarily this the, so the similarity are that the, yes the driver partners are overworked and they have uh, and they feel insecure um, primarily from financial point of view however um, uh, this type of employment uh, in this country compared is still better off than employment in law service sector jobs which are provide uh, which are paying on average 500 gals so three times less than what the driver partners could earn so so in a nutshell the gig work uh, in georgia uh, represents an important uh, important source of uh, uh, escaping from the from unemployment which is very high in georgia however uh, and and if if if, uh, if we um, if we assume that this type of employment will increase and expand in, in, in the country, then the social security systems, social protection systems need to be reformed because uh, contributory schemes are not very, um, are not uh, really um, uh, favorable for, for this type of employment because um, gig workers' incomes are not regular, they are fluctuating and they cannot afford paying uh, regular contributions to, to, to different uh, social insurance schemes. So social protection has to move towards more uh, towards uh, uh, more universal universal coverage. And finally, just to uh, just to add, uh, uh, obviously the research had a number of limitations. And as I as I mentioned already, this was uh, the primary issue is that um, uh, I was only able to to work uh, to cover with this one company. And while there are other uh, ride hailing companies uh, operating in Georgia, which is actually a uh, future uh, which I um, I plan to um, take up in my in my my further research but meanwhile i'll be very happy to take any comments or questions from you on uh, here either here or uh, on my email which you can see on the slide thank you very much thank you anna that was another good presentation very inspiring and uh, i would like to welcome uh, the uh, pre next presentation uh, the presenter is Ulvi Aydin, please, Aydin, correct me if uh, something is wrongly pronounced. And uh, her co-author, okay, you both are there, fine. Welcome. Ahmed Hi. Nasi Yuste. Hi. Aydin currently works at the Political Science and International Relations of the Manisa Selal Bayar University, which is in Turkey. She speaks Turkish, Russian, English, and German, does research in energy, transportation, and the environment. She authored about 10 publications. And Mr. Uh, Ahmed Nazim Usti is a Uste, Uste, right? Uste. Uste. Uste is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Economic and Administrative Sciences at Dokus Eylül University in Izmir, right? Yeah, yes, hello, hello from Izmir. <laughs> hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you are welcome both. And uh, your uh, presentation was once already announced, but <laughs> you missed your chance to be the second. <laughs> now you will be concluding this session. Please go ahead with the presentation entitled COVID-19 in Energy Markets, Potential Results for the South Caucasian Economies. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hi, once more. Uh, greetings from Izmir to lovely Tbilisi. 
By the way, uh, I am from Azerbaijan. Tbilisi is our favorite city. Uh, so I am very sorry that we could not uh, come and visit this beautiful city. So um, we will make a presentation about the uh, COVID-19 uh, and um, its effects on the South Caucasian economics. So as you know, uh, this year, beginning from the last year, the world and the world countries, all societies, all people, students, each level of the society experienced a new type of uh, pandemic that we called it COVID-19. And uh, you can see uh, on the map uh, the situation, but uh, sorry, I could not open my uh, PowerPoint presentation yeah, here. I wanted to interrupt. You can share the screen. You are a co-host. So you see this green green icon share screen in the uh, bottom. Right? Oh, OK, we found Is it. Is it OK now? Yes, it, it's starting. Yes, great. Okay. Okay. Please have the full screen for the presentation, and it's great. Okay. Yes. So. Um, you can see on the map the situation. Unfortunately, we experienced this uh, type of disease uh, beginning from the last year. And you can see here the some uh, late world economic growth projections made by the IMF. And you can see here some of the big economies of the world, like the Euro area, uh, from the Euro area, Germany, France, Italy, uh, Spain, Japan, United Kingdom, as well as Canada, uh, and also emerging markets and developed economies. And uh, the table and the provisions and the projections about their future economic situation is not so uh, good. And uh, most of them, uh, most of these economies waiting for the uh, very uh, unexpected uh, economic crisis. And there is no any provisions about the economic growth in these uh, countries, which we call the uh, locomotives of the world economy or emerging markets, developed economies. And in this way, uh, Due to the effects of the COVID-19, uh, as you know, the oil prices uh, dropped, uh, so dropped, and uh, you can see on the table uh, the uh, wage or the uh, sorry, the wave of the uh, oil prices between the 2000s and 2020, and. Uh, in this year, because of the uh, decrease in demand to the energy, uh, the oil prices also decreased in the world energy markets. And uh, what, are, what are the projections for the South Caucasian countries uh, made by the IMF? You can see here the Azerbaijan, then Georgia and Armenia and uh, projections also of the uh, IMF uh, about the real uh, G gross domestic product then consumer prices, unemployment. Uh, of course, uh, these uh, numbers is not also uh, desirable, uh, good for these three uh, South Caucasian countries. So uh, also you can see here the uh, gross domestic product of the South Caucasian countries between the 2014 and 2018, we can say that uh, these uh, three countries catch the good way in terms of develop their economies and uh, to make some progress in economic development. However, uh, as I pointed, uh, we argued that in our article, uh, the uh, oil, uh, the uh, decrease in oil prices in energy markets will uh, affect uh, all three South Caucasian economies uh, negatively. Why? Because, as you know, Azerbaijan is an uh, energy producer uh, country and uh, Georgia is a transit uh, country uh, with its uh, location, uh, transit location. And the third is Armenia. Uh, this country uh, 
not uh, is not the energy producers also uh, i mean not a transit country in terms of energy uh, logistics but uh, armenia has uh, good relations with iran and also with russia and both these countries i mean russia and iran are the energy producer countries and uh, a great part of their budget uh, incomes uh, come from the energy uh, sales so uh, we are sure that uh, and, uh, the decrease in oil prices will negatively affect uh, Iran, uh, Russia, as well as Armenia, whose economy is deeply dependent on the highly dependent on the Russian and Iranian uh, economies. So we base our argument on English school on two main approach. Uh, and we argue that uh, maybe COVID-19 uh, is a bad experience for the, for the uh, societies, for the countries. However, the people or societies, uh, nations can learn, uh, can make U turn from um, most of the things uh, that they uh, perceived until today. So we base our argument, uh, arguments on the English school. Uh, there are two main approach uh, of uh, English school. The first is pluralist approach, with, uh, which argue the cooperation with all parties who are concerned about the problem, any problem, regardless of their identity, uh, regardless of their ethnicity, religion, the, their beliefs. However, the second approach uh, of the English school based on solidarist approach, uh, which is uh, which argue cooperation between the nations, but uh, taking care about their uh, similar identity-based characteristics. But, but we we believe that we believe that these times um, is hard times and uh, extreme hard times. So uh, the societies, sorry, uh, the societies uh, need multinational cooperation in order to manage the such a hard time such a hard crisis uh, so uh, we argue this type of multilateral cooperation for the three south caucasian uh, states also considering that uh, crisis can create an opportunity uh, the cooperation options must be discussed from the pluralist perspective between the three um, South Caucasian countries. COVID-19 must be uh, perceived as a, a coercive factor for a new page in the relations of three uh, South Caucasian countries. In this regard, uh, civil society organizations of all three countries, uh, we think that they have a historical task and responsibility. So combating the coronavirus pandemic uh, has initiated a new period in the uh, history of all countries uh, where it's possible to go out of the ordinary uh, as well as to reinterpret the traditional patterns. Uh, for example, for example, uh, in order to prevent the spread of the pandemic, uh, the Directorate of Religious Affairs of Turkey has allowed to perform noon prayers at home instead of uh, Friday prayers. This was the something unordinary uh, practice for the Turkish nation who has strong beliefs, as you know. And most of the people goes to the uh, mosques for the Friday prayer. However, because of the coronavirus, uh, it was uh, not forbidden, but it was allowed to make it at home. Similarly, the Minister of Internal Affairs has banned traditional mass iftars, which iftar is the uh, group dinners during the Ramadan as a part of the anti-pandemic actions. So this was also not uh, ordinary or traditional. Uh, we go out to our traditional practices in order to stop or to decrease the effects of uh, pandemic. Uh, similarly, the president of the Turkey also delivered his opinion about Ramadan uh, alms that it can be given in advance. Uh, so the collected money, the collected uh, budget uh, can be used to fight against the coronavirus. 
So this was the new practices uh, in traditions, in um, uh, daily practices or, or of the nation, of the society. Therefore, maybe it will be necessary to meet again in such kind of crisis, leaving the uh, problems of the past and the uh, organization made on the basis of difference, uh, differences. Because uh, it's 30 years that all three South Caucasian countries uh, gained their independence and they meet several uh, problems, challenges uh, based on ethnic conflicts, ethnic issues. And uh, in result, uh, there is no any winner or there is no any prosperity. There is no any stability in the region. So there is no any um, big amounts of the uh, investments, foreign investments, employment also, uh, and of course, the peace. So, um, in conclusion, we can say that uh, this type of virus is, uh, is a new pandemic with high level of ineffect ineffectiveness, especially the spreading growth of this virus is the places of human mobilities. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, a significant part of the stopping uh, because of the coronavirus is possible uh, by minimizing the movement of people and goods, also uh, by uh, minimizing of the trade. In these hard times, countries and societies need each other more than uh, even before. So uh, we think that it's the good time or the correct time for the uh, South Caucasian societies uh, in order to cooperate and to leave and to open a new page uh, in their history, leave behind the past questions about their identities, ethnicities, and to come to the common uh, platform in order to solve their uh, ethnic conflicts. Because all of us need to live, need to travel, need to uh, eat, uh, and uh, need just to live. So there is no any place to the ethnic conflict in, in such a hard uh, situation. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and if you have questions, we are ready to answer them. Thank you very much. Ms. Aydin and uh, your counterpart, uh, Ahmed, Mr. Uste, <laughs> again. So uh, you concluded this uh, session uh, with presentations and now uh, all the attendees are invited to address questions to this three regarding these three papers. Thomas, you already have a question. Perhaps you have seen in chat box. Did you? So Galina is writing that she would like to know more about data and methods of Thomas Barrett's presentation. Please. Thomas? Yes, thank you. I can give a little bit of input on that. Um, so as I said before, I'm building upon the uh, methodology and the indicators provided by this index of public integrity. Um, but And I, I recommend that you look at their website. It's very interesting. But they are more interested in conducting, sort of creating big data sets for, uh, across different countries. And for each of these six indicators that I mentioned, they have one um, they have one resource that they are using. For example, for budget transparency, they use the open budget survey. And so what they get is they just collate all of this data and they come up with a composite score for each country and with scores in the, the, the six different areas. Um, what I want to do is go into more detail. I want to focus only on Georgia and Ukraine and, and depending on how my future research goes, also include Armenia. Um, and I want to analyze more qualitatively these uh, based on these six categories. Um, partly through the use of interviews, 
with uh, both, mainly with civil society actors on the ground in these two countries. Um, and also by using uh, resources that are published by both local and international organizations. There are many organizations that do uh, corruption or governance reviews, most notably um, the OSCE, uh, the Council of Europe, um, the European Union also has sections in their appraisal of the association agreements with these two countries that concern this, uh, this topic. Um, in terms of legal matters, the Venice Commission is a uh, a very appropriate choice the, um, in terms of legal reform. Um, so this is the the, the um, doing the content analysis of these uh, written sources from these large governance bodies, uh, and also interviews with actors on the ground, and also reports from local NGOs. Um, I, on the basis of this investigation, I assess each country based on these six criterion as listed in the uh, as listed in the index of public trans uh, public index of public integrity. Um, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily trying to have a conclusion at the end where I say Georgia is more corrupt than Ukraine or Ukraine is more corrupt than Georgia or there's more state capture in one or the other. Um, I think as the presentation shows, it's more about how we typologize these regimes uh, and what um, strengths and weaknesses they may have or what um, models of development they offer. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Any other question? Yeah, Coming I just wanted to say Facebook. thanks. <laughs> Mariam, I don't see in chat box any question. Something from Facebook or YouTube channels? Um, no, currently we don't have any other questions in YouTube or chat. Let's wait a bit still. If I may, uh, if I may, I have a question regarding the last presentation. Uh, it is uh, entitled COVID-19 in energy markets. And in concluding remarks, I, Ms. Aydin, you said that potential results, we already have some factual results. Would you, would you please elaborate more? Uh, which country gained or suffered, uh, all suffered, I think, <laughs> however, at, uh, to different extent. Could you please elaborate more on what is uh, happening in Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia because of this COVID-19 uh, that impacted the energy markets globally and locally? Of course. Uh, at first uh, place, Azerbaijan is the most uh, suffered country because it's directly a oil producing country. But mm -hmm. uh, we talk here not about the direct effects, but also indirect effects of the oil prices in, on the economies of three countries. As I pointed, uh, uh, as you know, uh, Georgia is one of the um, main trading partners, but not only trading partners. Secondly, a uh, transit country of the energy resources uh, of Azerbaijan, transit country. Uh, so uh, this means that if Azerbaijan cannot sell uh, to the world energy markets, cannot send uh, or uh, gain less income from the oil prices, this means that directly Georgia also affects from this suffered such a problem. Yeah. But a uh, situation for the Armenia a little bit different. Why? Because uh, uh, because of the uh, some problems. Being importing between... energy importing country. Yes, energy importing country. But Armenia is a country uh, which economy is highly depend on Russian and Iranian corporation. Uh, so in these mm. terms, as you know. Russia and Iran are the main oil producers in the world energy markets. So if they are in uh, such a uh, deep crisis due to the lower oil prices, how can Armenian economy be uh, well or in prosperity? It's impossible. Uh, so no, it, is, it is not. <laughs> it is it's not, not, unfortunately. It is. But we have still to calculate the downturn. How deep is it? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank in you. any case, uh, sorry. In any case, without COVID, we can say that uh, three countries' economy. Uh, we cannot say that 
Armenian economy or Georgian economy are one of the developing or emerging markets in the world, they already had uh, some serious problems in terms of uh, gross domestic product, uh, unemployment, uh, instability, also exchange rates, about the lack of foreign uh, investment, foreign direct investments. But we argue that due to the COVID-19, uh, all these economies will be in more difficult situation. They will uh, lower more than before. So in such a situation, all these societies just need each other because you cannot, if uh, you can uh, want to cooperate with France, Italy, it's impossible now. Right now it's impossible. All flights stopped, uh, trucks stopped, there are problems in uh, border uh, transitions. So uh, you just, uh, I mean, not of course you, but uh, each of these countries can uh, solve their problems and at local, uh, at local dimension. And local dimension in these terms means with each other in the region. So uh, we argue that maybe it can be called more optimistic for uh, now, because there is a war between two countries, borders are closed, and in uh, Georgia there are some problems about the Abkhazia, so uh, also South Ossetia. However, uh, but we think that this is the best time uh, to open a new page in the relations between three countries. And, and diminish the underutilization of economic integration. And yes, of course. Yes, of thank course. you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Aydin. Mm -hmm. Very, very insightful. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question. Uh, Thomas, if you see it, if you don't see, I will read for you. Uh, highly interesting. Who says? Rail Safiev says. Highly interesting topic. I just wonder if there are preliminary results of Ukraine's anti-corruption efforts, meaning do they confirm oligarchs' diminution, perhaps diminution, uh, diminution of power? Is there as a result? We don't have much time. Please be as short as possible. Okay. Uh, yes, I I think. It's a good question because the revolution was quite recently. It's only been uh, less than six years. Um, I think there are not concrete results on a, on a sort of broad across the whole country level in the same way as in Georgia. We haven't seen big improvements in a lot of these indicators, for example, across the board. The uh, corruption is still pervasive, but there have been very concrete successes of certain reforms in certain sectors. The most obvious one is the reform of public procurement, where it's been shown that this... Um, a uh, program called ProZoro, which was created by civil society activists and was then the government then eventually agreed that all public tenders in Ukraine have to be done through this procurement platform, which is very transparent and well designed. This has been proven to have saved the Ukrainian budget billions of grivnas. Wow. Um, so this is one very concrete example. And for example, at the moment, the um, reform of the oil and gas sector, which is traditionally one of the most corrupt sectors in Ukraine, it still has a lot of corruption but there have been many areas in which oligarchs have been cut off from, uh, for example, these really lucrative subsidy schemes. Um, we Hopefully this will pro process will continue. But yes, these are very sector specific areas where these reform coalitions were successful. Um, in other areas, they were less successful, but in some ways, this is a, a partial vindication of uh, the Ukrainian model, but we should be cautious. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Mariam, do we have any other question from Facebook, from YouTube channel? Uh, no, we don't have any other question. Uh, if, then, if, uh, if we have time, could I perhaps ask Anna a very, Anna Diakonitsa a quick question? Of sure. course. If Anna is, we don't uh, have time, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just wondering if there has been any, has there been any landmark cases in Georgia um, concerning um, the court saying to companies, no, the, the, mm, this, this person that you are claiming as a freelancer is actually behaving exactly like an employee and uh, therefore they should be treated like one. Has, has the Georgian court system ever produced such a ruling? No, no, the short answer is no, because uh, the uh, driver partners have never actually approached court with such a, 
with such claims. They say the Georgian rival partners are not making any claims like this. So I would say the awareness about their working rights is, is very, very low. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. If no more questions, then uh, let me to thank you all, the presenters and the attendee once again, and uh, sum up this session. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to attend the next section, session that will be discussing the issues of research in South Caucasus. I do believe that Many of you are very much interested uh, in such a roundtable discussion. Thank you. Thank, you, thank very you very much. much. Thank you, Maria, thank you. for all your assistance and help. And we hope yeah, well, next time we can meet in lovely Tbilisi. I hope so. Thank you very much. We will now go on a break until 4.30 Georgia time. And uh, yeah, just, just keep in mind that the next session is roundtable discussion about challenges to social sciences in the South Caucasus. And afterwards, we will have our keynote speaker for the day, Professor John O'Loughlin from the Colorado Boulder University. So stay tuned and see you uh, in about 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bye.
Dear conference participants, we are back. Now we'll have the round table on challenges to social sciences in the South Caucasus. All the round table uh, participants, speakers, discussants are here. The round table will be moderated by CRC's research director, uh, David Sijinava. Uh, and please, David, the floor is yours. Um, hello, hello, I guess. Uh, welcome to our conference. Thanks, Matsu, so much for taking care of this uh, kind of, of these events. Uh, let me introduce our roundtable. So we had quite exciting first part of our conference today, where very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentations actually were um, broadcasted over the over Zoom, so I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. I personally did. Um, so, and uh, so right now we'll have a little bit different um, panel. It's basically a roundtable discussion, although this roundtable discussion actually will uh, refer to the challenges to the social sciences in the South Caucasus. Basically, this will be kind of more, you know, methodologically. Uh, uh, oriented uh, session. Uh, let me quickly uh, give a little bit of an introduction of our panel. Um, so uh, the reason why we actually organized this uh, uh, this roundtable was that uh, actually when we look at the scientific literature on how to do research, right? And uh, uh, we've been uh, we've been seeing quite a, um, it's always very interesting, so to say, to who is doing research to a, in a particular area, right? And uh, in the South Caucasus, and uh, I think in many similar contexts, so uh, it's been usually the so-called outsider's gaze, right? These are the researchers who are, of course, doing very interesting work and very important work, although they are usually based in outside institutions, outside of the region, or come from uh, other places. Usually it's, of course, it's the global north or global west, uh, or how, uh, whatever we would uh, uh, call um, uh, these areas. And uh, usually, sometimes, uh, essentially, we lack local perspective, right? Um, uh, in other local perspective, I uh, um, I uh, perceive these researchers who are based in the region in regional institutions, right? In Georgia, in Armenia, in Azerbaijan. So, uh, therefore, we wanted actually to address this gap in the literature, and we wanted to invite accomplished scholars who are doing. Uh, uh, academic work and applied scientific research as well to share their experiences about the challenges um, uh, challenges uh, to the social sciences. Uh, another important thing which I also want to touch upon is that um, challenges uh, there are like multiplicities of different um, uh, problems that researchers uh, investigating uh, uh, this region face, right? So. There is a tons of literature that refers to um, studies, to doing research in challenging environments, such as usually it's a, a context that are, let's say, uh, hybrid regimes or authoritarian states. So basically, um, political challenges to research, right? Although these experiences, these studies are usually uh, experiences of people from the, uh, you know, like from uh, from the West. And the voices of locally based um, researchers are rarely heard. So, uh, but uh, indeed, uh, local researchers, locally based researchers, of course, challenge enormous challenges in many, con in many cases. So be it uh, 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 physical safety or just working in uh, polarized and uh, partisan political environments. Well, that's not definitely limited to uh, uh, to this to 
to our region. It could be also in a, to other contexts as well, but it's a really important uh, challenge that our uh, research uh, so, social scientists from the from Caucasus uh, region face. So therefore, as I mentioned, we uh, invited um, uh, accomplished scholars um, to our roundtable discussion. And actually, I really want to um, and to give food for thought also to uh, to our attendees. Uh, this will be uh, uh, son of Al-Sanyan from CRC Armenia and uh, uh, CRC Armenia. Uh, Timothy Blount uh, from American Consens plus Ilya State University, Anar Valier, ADA University, and uh, Tinatin Zurabish University of Bologna. And uh, briefly about the format of our discussion, we'll have about you know, 15 minutes for each participant to present their point of view, share their experience in this regard. Uh, and after, uh, after our, uh, you know, like interventions, let's call it interventions, we'll be ready for, uh, for, for discussion. So, and I would really in, want to encourage our kind of attendees to engage lively in this uh, discussion. So your feedback, feedback will be very, very helpful and very interesting. So I think we can start from uh, uh, from Sonra Sonra Balansanian. She's uh, she's a CEO of, of CRC Armenia and uh, she holds a doctoral degree in uh, in sociology from Yerevan State University. Also studied at Oxford and um, uh, basically apart from her applied work at CRC. She's also, she also teaches at Yerevan State University and basically does a lot of uh, work. So Sona, the floor is yours. Uh, we are ready for your intervention. <laughs> Thanks. Dear Dato, thank you very much for this introduction. First, I have to say I am delighted to be present at this conference and have my, and have my contribution. My warm greetings to all the participants and to dearest colleagues. Uh, I'm happy that CRRC's made this uh, during this complex times, and I'm particularly grateful to all of the attendees uh, of this conference that found time um, to watch and participate. Uh, my observations that will be shared with you and will be discussed afterwards are based on my experience of work with CRRCs and a research I have been engaged with over the last year. Uh, I talked to academicians, policymakers, individual researchers representing different think tanks in Armenia. And I will try to briefly sum up some key points that I see um, indicate the major challenges that we all are facing in terms of social sciences in the Caucasus. So I think we have to group the challenges in six domains, if I may say. Um, first domain is constant reformation. We have been in constant reformation in terms of social science research after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and this reformation is still ongoing. Second is the persistent um, issues in the research governance. So the second domain is the research governance with all of the challenges. Third point and domain is the research funding. Fourth are practicalities of, of teaching social sciences and doing research. A fifth one I would is collaboration and networking in social sciences. And the seventh one is a sub point, I would say, of the fifth domain that is publishing. But I think we have to focus on that separately because it's very important. So starting with the first domain that is constant reformation, I would love to just draw your attention on the overall geopolitical conditions, governance and management systems of the social science 
uh, research in our countries and just make note on how much this constant reformation has created um, has created a mess in the overall uh, research institutionalization processes because when we are in constant reformations schools are not evolving we don't have uh, emergence uh, of, of schools or formation of schools in be that in universities or think tanks or somewhere because this constant reformation is something that we cannot deal with and that comes also from the other domain that is research governance and change management issues. Uh, basically, just look throughout the coxes and see who is doing social science. Um, these are uh, academies of sciences, universities, private and state or public. And these are think tanks and these are individual researchers. If I may say, these are the key uh, actors that are uh, playing role in institutionalization of social science research in, in the countries. But look at how, diff how different they are and, and how this uh, difficult to correct um, situation or the environment has been um, challenging these organizations for years. If, if you try to see whether there, there are uh, some similarities in the ways of working and some networks evolve, you'll see that we are far from, from being there. And so moving to um, from this institutional issues from governing research to um, institutional autonomy and doing research, coming to already the third domain that was that was the research funding and the fourth one that is the practicalities of teaching and, and doing research. Um, I have to make note on this um, on this autonomy issues. Um, by this I mean you see the academics of sciences they they have the heritage of, of Soviet past and they were established institutions and they kind of continue working as they did. But in line with this academics of sciences, we have uh, supreme certifying committees, let's say, in most of the Caucasian countries. And this is a post-Soviet phenomenon. That is, the PhD level researchers, they have to undergo double double um, certification process, one from their universities and another one from the Supreme Certifying Committee, which is a signal for some of the researchers that the, the universities are not autonomous then. Um, well, this is a question to discuss and think through, uh, but just, just consider this for the discussion as a discussion point. How much, of the, uh, how much are the universities given autonomy to organize the PhD level research and why did this uh, Supreme Certifying Committee still exist? Um, and what is the what is the possible networking opportunity between universities, uh, academics of sciences, uh, and and think tanks and individual researchers? Um, when coming to this um, practicalities of teaching and doing research, um, actually we have all thought for years that. Uh, academia, post-Soviet academia is very theory driven and is fundamental. But when I, when I read through the transcripts, I see that actually the academia is not that theory driven and it is not even already an academia. It is very, um, very concentrated on teaching and, tra trans and transmits um, skill sets even at the master's level. And this absence of social science research schools is one proof of this. So if we were very fundamentally academic, then we would have theoretical uh, schools uh, on the grassroots. So 
This is one thing. Another thing, let's talk about the research funding. All is interwoven, all, all, all the domains are interlinked. And in research funding, there is an opinion that, um, that social sciences have been underfunded. And I share this opinion because if you just look at how the state funds research and what were the recent Horizon, Horizon 2020 uh, winning proposals, you will see that science, technology, engineering, and, and mathematics are winning in this respect. And social science kind of moved to civic society, civil society, trying to find uh, its place here, which has been, um, I, I can't say it's a good tendency or bad tendency, just um, thought and point for discussion. Uh, and here, raising all these issues, I have to um, conclude with research collaboration to me being the basic, basic issue of social sciences in the Caucasus, because um, networks are not emerged around institutions or review boards or journals or something else. They are evolved. Um, Based on they are evolved around personalities, which is um, which is a problem, and that actually explicates the basic challenge that we do have individuals who have been successful in social sciences, but we don't have institutional capacity of developing these sciences in, in the Caucasian countries. Um, I have also looked at some publication data um, and looked at English language publication records, basically, because native language publications are not that much recorded and one cannot do a search in databases and see citation index, et cetera. But, but when you see our in, even English language publications, um, the researchers kind of strive to uh, adhere to Western standards and the reflection towards the context and, and challenges in social sciences that we meet in the Caucasus are, over, are underestimated. So here is another point that I would like us to discuss today. With this in mind, concluding what I said in terms of domains, um, so this constant reformation of, of research institutions has brought to, uh, to a place where research governance is not being successful because of the absence of change management and the lessons that we learned from Soviet past have not paved their way uh, through the realities that we are living in as social scientists in the Caucasus. And given the scarce research funding and some of the donor dependency of the, of the think tanks and some private institutions, and all of these misbalances between the practicalities of, of, of teaching and doing research, um, all this has not been yet a um, um, matter of uh, system-wide assessment in the countries of, of social sciences. And, and we have no actually data on how social sciences produce. I still, even after this one year research, I still have the question of who, what is a research institution? If you look at the... Um, definitions of research institutions in the law of the countries, it differs and it is very abstract and you cannot see the, the important, um, important lining of the key players and institutions across the region. So here are the points I would like to raise for discussion. Uh, and and basically to think about possibilities of, of being more reflexive about social science in our countries 
as doing research in our countries and not just adhering to international standards, but also raising our local voices from this context that is actually very interesting important for all around the, the for, for, for social science all around the world. You see, I, I sometimes think of the Caucasus as enlarging in social space while the globe becomes a narrower place. And we have so much to tell the globe because this hour becoming a larger space is actually uh, an outcome of the globe becoming narrower. So what I'm trying to communicate here is that the, the topic of this discussion is very important for development of social sciences in the Caucasus. And I hope that we will have a productive conversation and some important takeaways on uh, how to write about this, how to be more reflective about our issues, experience specifically in our realities and how can this questions raised uh, per domain be solved in a sense and addressed. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Balsanian, thanks so much. I mean, this, yeah, I actually was making notes for myself and actually this is, I mean, yeah, that's, I think that's why we are having this conversation here just to, you know, encourage, I mean, uh, just to share our ideas and maybe kind of come up with um, uh, some important ideas with this regard. Uh, and of course, I mean, institutional factors are important, especially when we see that because of COVID, actually, funding for research would go definitely down. I mean, Georgian Ministry of Education really, really um, slashed one tenth of the of its budget, and that actually referred to the actually research fund. Thanks so much, uh, Solon. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, let me uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, professor Timothy Blount. Uh, uh, professor Blount is a professor of Soviet and post-Soviet studies at uh, Ilya State University, Tbilisi, Georgia, and uh, he's been doing uh, um, he's been uh, doing uh, a very interesting research on kind of on, uh, on archival materials and uh, had been kind of publishing uh, prolifically. Uh, so, uh, Professor Blauelt, I think uh, uh, yeah, Professor Blauelt is also um, a regional director for uh, uh, for the South Caucasus uh, for, for American Council for International Education South Caucasus Office. And uh, uh, Professor Blauelt, floor is yours. And thanks so much for attending our our round table. So, thank you, David, and hello to everybody. Um, it seems I get invited to participate in panel discussions of this sort, maybe once every five years. Um, and I'm trying to think, what can I say now that would be any different from what I would have said five years ago or 10 years ago? Uh, and I'm not sure really that that much uh, has changed in, in my sort of outlook on this question of the challenges to, uh, to social science research writ large. Um, and I think one thing that, if you've heard me speak about this before, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but I think it's, it's a central issue um, I would preface this by saying uh, I've been mainly sitting here in Georgia for 20 years and uh, very rarely go to the neighboring countries, unfortunately, to Armenia and Azerbaijan, even though um, I've recently taken responsibility as uh, in my role for American councils as regional director, including those two countries. But most of my experience and direct uh, involvement in, in scholarship has been in Georgia. So that's really sort of the focus. But I think some of these things might also extend to the other countries in the South Caucasus as well. And the first point that I would start with, and again, this is something that I, I say quite often, and that is one of the major issues, I think, is the issue of the position of scholarship in society and the, uh, the concept of scholarship as a profession. Um, and this has a, a legacy, I think, of the Soviet period and especially of the, of the really difficult period of the 1990s and into the 2000s where um, professors ended up um, working either in the universities for, for $25 a month or more likely uh, doing something else. Uh, initially, probably it meant going and trading stuff at the bazaar, whatever was possible to do. Um, but as things sort of solidified and consolidated, um, 
and as especially Georgia, but the Caucasus more general became an area of, of NGO activity. Um, really, it became a matter of, of, of having a second job, of forming an NGO, of having uh, some sort of profession outside of that. Um, of getting involved in politics, getting involved in university administration, something else, um, and doing those two things simultaneously. Um, and even though uh, more recently, at least in Georgia, and I hope it's also the case uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan, that by the, the mid 2000s into this, the more recent decade, uh, the university salaries have increased. Um, you know, they're not maybe Western standard, but they are uh, competitive compared to other fields of human activity in these countries. Nevertheless, this sort of mentality remains that uh, you'd be crazy just to be a university professor or just to be a researcher. It's sort of like a, there's this Soviet anecdote, like, so you lived on just one salary. And I think that that kind of mentality continues. And I, I know very few academics, scholars who only do that, uh, almost everybody. And I'm a perfect example of that. I also have multiple jobs, at least two. Uh, so everybody, almost everybody I know is either, you know, working in university administration, they're also, they have an NGO, they're involved in, in a political party, or they're doing things uh, in addition to their scholarly work. And there's a kind of immediacy to these kind of other jobs that uh, is always kind of more urgent than the, uh, the slower schedule of academia. And, and so generally speaking, it often happens that the, the, uh, the more long-term uh, work of research and publishing gets put on second, uh, the second string. And I think what's particularly uh, damaging about that is it, it reflects down further on the line. Um, it reflects on the students who see the priorities of their professors. Uh, it reflects on the position of graduate students. As it's uh, those, many of you have been to, uh, have done graduate degrees in, in, in Europe or in the United States. And there to be a graduate student is really a full-time occupation. And some people might have some job on the side to make ends meet, but their full-time focus or your full-time focus most likely uh, at the time was doing your research, writing your dissertation, being a graduate student. And, and that's rarely the case in Georgia. It's it, often, too often perhaps uh, graduate programs, particularly PhD programs are sort of, um, <clears throat> vanity projects of people doing other jobs, but even if even for those scholars who are really serious and really devoted to their research topic, it is often also gets put on the second string. And I, I, I can think of too many uh, really talented um, young uh, scholars or potential scholars who simply never finish. They get too tied up in their other occupations in making a living and surviving and uh, they, they simply never defend or rarely get to it. Um, it reflects down on the students too, when they see that this sort of situation. And for them, uh, the idea of becoming a scholar simply isn't a prestige uh, kind of uh, profession. It, I rarely hear, I, I interview uh, for my work with American Councils and with the high school exchange programs, I interview literally hundreds of high school kids every year and ask them, the first question I always ask is, you know, what, what do you wanna be when you grow up? What profession do you want to have? And Maybe in 17 years of doing those interviews, maybe once or twice, somebody has said, I want to be a scholar, I want to be an academic, I want to be a professor, but extremely rare. So my, my point is that it's, it, as a profession, it, it's something that uh, to be a, a serious scholar means that you have to do that. It means that you have to have the opportunity to do that, the motivation to do that, the time uh, and, and so forth. Add into this, uh, in this question of scholarship as a profession, um, another aspect of that is that scholarship, I think, in Georgia, certainly, and perhaps in the Caucasus more generally, as a legacy of its evolution, uh, scholarship has been primarily about uh, national creation, about nation building. And this goes back to the 19th century, certainly in the, the uh, in the Soviet period, in the dissident community, and in the intelligentsia, this idea of um, national narratives uh, of national greatness, of competition, of being in competition with a hierarchy uh, of other nations that are unequal with each other and trying to prove uh, ethnogenesis, of trying to prove uh, ownership of national territory and so forth. And that, that really sort of continues in the post-Soviet period. There's never this switch over from that nation building project. And that often means that the priority of research agendas, either consciously or unconsciously, tends to be about uh, reinforcing continuing national ideas, even continuing national myths. Whereas it seems to me that scholarship can be most useful and most interesting, not where it's repeating those kind of myths or trying to continuously 
find proof for them, but on the, the opposite of, of challenging uh, our conceptions of scholarship should be annoying. Scholars should be annoying. That's what makes it interesting. That's when they can play a useful role in society. And, and I think there has been a difficulty in adapting uh, to that on, on sort of all levels. Um, I am a, uh, a political scientist by, by my degree, but really I am, if anything, a political historian and a historian first and foremost. And I think this kind of um, agenda, the way in which nation building as a research agenda consciously or subconsciously gets reflected is in the view of, of, of national history. Uh, and that I think comes through or, or comes to be projected through a kind of narrow prism of on the one hand, uh, the past as persecution and suffering, and, and it's, it's polar opposite of, of heroic resistance. Um, and certainly there are those aspects, you know, without question, there are those aspects in the history of Georgia, in the history of the Caucasus, in the history of the, of the former Soviet space. But focusing only on those things, I think, leaves out uh, a lot of what is really most interesting and what is particularly interesting on the, uh, on the international level in, in the disciplines and particularly in history, but I think in, in social sciences as well, the kind of challenging questions, um, looking at the, the liminal zones, the intersections, the gray zones of that. And so what that amounts to, and Sona mentioned the, the difficulty of academic publishing, of getting things published. Uh, on the one hand, of course, there's the challenge of having to write in, in English, but I think also it's not just about language, it's not just about English, but it's a, it's a problem of finding ways to frame one's research and ways to frame one's research questions that make them appealing to the international discourse of academic, uh, of academia, of academic journals. Uh, and and uh, as, as Sona said, of, of looking at these things in a reflexive and reflective way uh, that would make them interesting to a foreign audience instead of just sort of repeating over and over again the same kind of, uh, of national tropes. Um, I think a few more minutes left, I'd like to say a few additional things that particularly relate to my discipline, which is history um, and the, the challenges faced in, in this discipline. Um, historians deal primarily with uh, archival materials and other windows on the past, if you will, um, oral history, interviews, um, diaries, ego documents. Um, the Caucasus are an area that are tremendously rich in archival documents. And the, the archives here are absolute treasures for all three of the countries. Um, there are, of course, issues with access to those. And those issues are different in different places. Access to modern history in archival sources is extremely complex in all three. I don't know if it's even possible in any of the three countries to get access to documents after the Soviet period for the 1990s or into the 2000s. I think it would be nearly impossible. But even if we concentrate on the period before the Soviet, uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, there is a lot of uh, material. Um, the IDFI recently released its study of archival openness in the former Soviet space. Uh, Georgia does quite well, but it's still kind of far behind uh, the leading countries, which are uh, um, the Baltic states and Ukraine. Um, the biggest problem in Georgia is the kind of precariousness um, the party archive uh, materials are actually quite open, but it exists in a framework that it belongs to the interior ministry, that the rules could change, that uh, there is legislation about access to, to materials that theoretically could be put in place, that uh, personal information rules could restrict access to anything from 75 years from now, uh, that is before 75 years uh, would only be accessible. Although that hasn't been put into action yet, it, there is always this kind of possibility that those things could happen. Uh, and things actually have been restricted recently at uh, in the National Archive uh, in Georgia, and especially the Historical Archive, uh, where they've kind of returned to a bureaucratic approach to access to documents. So if before uh, you could get access to documents the same day you asked for them, it was very easy to get access. Now they've become more like other former Soviet archives where it takes several days up to a week to get access to materials and there's been cases of people being refused access. And I think that that more general picture is, is kind of more of the situation in, uh, in, in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, I, I was kind of surprised actually, actually that the rating for Armenia, for the Armenian National Archive was behind even Azerbaijan in those IDFI readings. And I'd finish by making a point that kind of draws these two elements that I was talking about together, the idea of scholarship as a profession and the difficulty of that, uh, and plus the question of the precariousness of access to historical information and archival materials. Um, and that is a particular illustration, perhaps, of this situation, of, of, of this issue. Uh, so the National Archive, the National Historical Archive in Georgia, uh, in recent years, had a new young uh, head director 
perhaps one of the most liberal uh, in, in its history, one of the most liberal uh, and most enthusiastic about the idea of archival openness in the entire post-Soviet space. Um, we only really later learned about how much really he had gone out on a limb to help people get access to documents. He ended up leaving that job to join an NGO to take on a position at a open society funded project on archival openness. And the fact that he left that job meant that that archive returned to a much more restrictive um, bureaucratic um, set of procedures for access to documents. And, and he would really, he had to leave that job because uh, the sal salary was so much higher and it was just for, for purposes of life was um, the much better op option for a young guy with a family. And, and I don't blame him for that, but it's, it's a sort of, it's an irony. The, this unexpected consequence of having a project on archival openness that actually results in bringing the one person who's doing most to achieve archival openness into the NGO sector, section and leading to less archival openness. So with that, I will stop and pass the baton on to the next speaker. So thank you for the opportunity and thank you for your attention. Uh, Professor Bob, thanks so much. Thanks so much for, 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 your, um, uh, for your contribution to this round table. And uh, yeah, it definitely created, uh, uh, for at least for me, it, is, it definitely gave me a food for thought and uh, whatever you described, it's so familiar in uh, for me and I guess for all the uh, participants here. That uh, I mean, it's it is something we actually need to reflect again and again and kind of try to move forward and somehow change these things. Thanks so much again, and uh, let me intro introduce our our next speaker. Our next speaker will be uh, Professor Anar Valiev. Um, uh, who's a Dean and uh, Associate Professor of Public Affairs at uh, uh, ADA University. Uh, and um, uh, Professor Valiev had been uh, also publishing very prof prolifically and uh, his research interests uh, actually uh, encompass kind of very diverse topics. And it will be kind of super interesting to hear Professor Valiev's uh, uh, contribution uh, to our round table. Professor Valia, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks All right, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, really honored to be part of that uh, round table discussions. I was expecting to be in Tartu right now, but something happened and we're all together stuck at my home and you cannot even leave house, not even talking about just staying in Tartu. Anyway, I will, what I wanted to do to just share with you is just experience of mine uh, for the last 12, 13 years of doing research in Azerbaijan after my graduation from uh, uh, getting my PhD, after getting my PhD, and also to add up to what previous speakers, uh, Professor, Professor Blauvelt would said, and there's Madame uh, Balasanyan uh, kind of mentioned, I pretty much agree what was, was said by previous speakers. I will just, whatever I will tell you, just adding up to the additional thing, because I totally agree what was kind of the stated before. So <clears throat> before jumping to the what to do uh, and what's the reason for that, we have first of all have to understand what's the problem for us. The biggest challenge today for the social sciences in Azerbaijan, and I'm pretty much sure it's the same case with Armenia and Georgia, is misunderstanding or actually absence of understanding why research is needed. I mean, there are many reasons why we have a such kind of situation. It could be regime politics. It could be cultural things. Also, I don't believe in cultural things. It could be mostly institutional things. But the biggest challenge today is the absence of understanding what is research needed for. So today, when we discuss about the, what's, uh, for example, we, certain people do research on IR, on history, political science, I'm myself doing an urban planning and development, there's, there's absolutely no uh, discussion about this issue where this research can be used. Okay, we may publish hundreds of articles in impact factor journal. We may publish many journals, I mean, many articles in the different type of the journals. But if it's not needed for my society, why in the world I should do it? So the, this is the biggest challenge. So neither the government nor, I don't want to call society, nor educational institutions, nor certain type of the uh, organizations see the value in this research. 
well, let's say, for example, the typical example could be uh, adoption of the laws today in Armenia and Azerbaijan and Georgia. I don't know again how much in Armenia and in Georgia it's happening, but in Azerbaijan it's pretty simple. So in order to adopt certain type of the law, you should have a certain type of the research on this type of the topic. And based on that research, you come up with a legislation or policy or something like that. So the link between the research and policy is not there. I mean, the reason for that, of course, we can just call about institutions, uh, former Soviet Union republics, culture or something, but this is the biggest challenge. Whatever the research we will do here today, it's not applicable. Nobody's gonna use it. Nobody's gonna take it and use it for the, whether adopt the law or whether adopt the policy or whether to make something kind of changes. That's why, the government is not seeing, or their policymakers not seeing research as something valid. And from the other point, researchers simply say, why should I just publish only for the sake of the publishing? So that's what the link between policy centers, research, and the government, or whatever you want to call it, policymakers is not there. This triangle does not exist in our society. Of course, we can say that what's the reason for that? And reason definitely, it's a, uh, I wouldn't say culturally, it's a traditionally, because in the Soviet Union, social science never existed. And there was no need for the social sciences. So the, I don't need to listen to researchers who wanna come and tell me that I have problems in my society. I don't need it. I mean, I'm talking about as a policy analyst or policy uh, person. Uh, the same way researchers say, I don't need to publish it for, for what I should have published it. So this is the first. Second one, institutional thing. I mean, if you go to the many universities in Azerbaijan, again, I'm not sure about Armenian and Georgian uh, institutions, there's no interest in research. So whether I publish five articles in top journals or whether I publish two articles, doesn't make any difference for the universities because most of the things our universities are interested today is teaching and getting money from the teaching kind of tuition fees, whatever it is. So I don't care. I mean, I'm talking about as a dean myself, for example. Uh, unfortunately, I'm really bad. I'm, I'm not saying I'm supporting that. I was talking as a dean, I can say, why should I care about research if it doesn't bring money? What brings money today? It's a teaching students, uh, tuition fee. That's how I can just make money in my kind of the world. So the research is something intangible I cannot even just to get a huge amount of money from that. So why should I just spend this precious time of my faculty for the certain type of the research that will not bring it? So this is kind of the institutional, I would say traditional governmental problems that's happening in the kind of academia that doesn't encourage research to happen. And it doesn't matter what research is that, what's the social research, whether it's a physics, chemistry, whatever it is. Well, recently there was some kind of the kind of revival of the computer sciences, especially in the sexy topics such as computer sciences, computer engineering, uh, maybe a little bit artificial intelligence, but the capacity of our institutions in all countries, and I'm pretty much sure to say that in all countries of the uh, South Caucasus is not in a such high level to compete with kind of Western academias, especially on this topic. So it's, it, it's kind of that we're doing research for the sake of doing research, even in this topic. So this is kind of the problems that comes from the institutional perspective that we do not see research as something valid. And that's why we don't have a research at all. That's the first important uh, problem that we're facing. Uh, second important uh, problem that we are just right now is uh, passing through, and I'm talking about the Azerbaijani case because I guess Armenian and Georgian counterpart had a little bit better situation, is a distortion of the labor market. Uh, I was always saying that why social research or research in Azerbaijan wasn't developing back in 2000s is because I see the biggest challenge for that. I'm not going to kind of accuse the company, but the biggest challenge for us was BP and oil companies. Why? Uh, simply because many Azerbaijanis went abroad to study. Many of them, thousands and thousands, and different type of their kind of departments. Could be sociology, could be political science, anthropology, and they all came back. Once they came back, there was no niche for them to work somewhere. For example, I know a very perfect anthropologist who got his master's degree in very good university, came back to Azerbaijan, 
to make a research on anthropology in Azerbaijan back in mid of 20, 2000s. It doesn't make any sense. So he went to BP to become a translator. So he earned money. He earned not bad money, very good money, but he was lost for the social research. Versus in Armenia and Georgia, that never happened. Most of them came back and began to create their own niche through the building, some sort of, even, I mean, uh, the previous speaker was talking about NGOs, even NGOs at least somehow spurred the interest to the research. They went to get some grants. I mean, I mean, Georgian Armenian researchers, they went to get some grants, open up NGOs. And based on that, some research already happened versus in Azerbaijan, the huge labor market went to the high paid jobs in oil company, in financial company, in banks. And that was a kind of the period when the Azerbaijan economy was very high developing between 2005 and 2015. So this 10 years was extremely good for economic development, but it was still be bad for the social research because the people were looking at money-making rather than making a research for the future. So that's why many researchers was driven from that niche and they never came back and or never went to this niche and went to become an average translator or become average kind of the financial analyst, whatever it is, having degree in sociology and anthropology. Uh, that I would say the second reason for Azerbaijan that was why the social science research was kind of in, uh, in a problematic situation. Finances, I wouldn't say the finance is a problem today. You can easily get certain type of the grants. You can easily get certain type of the uh, consultancy jobs. So if you're talking about the research today, I'm talking about Azerbaijan in case, there's enough certain type of the companies, especially local companies, who are looking for certain type of the research consultancy. And if the faculty, and here we come to the another problem, all our faculty are not equipped with enough skills and knowledges. Skills and knowledge is not necessarily, they can be perfect researchers. They may have a perfect knowledge on a certain type of the topic, but they do not have a certain type of the skills, how to make money out of their research, how to show off themselves, how to make certain type of the grant. That's why we have a very perfect, great researchers, but they cannot earn money because they don't know how to present themselves or how to put forward certain type of proposal and create the niche. Uh, another type of the case, for example, uh, when I came back from the United States, this is from my own experience, and I also kind of share with all of you. Uh, the biggest challenge, what I see in many institutions in Azerbaijan, I'm not sure about Georgia and Armenia, I don't know the situation there. It's an absence of knowledge of the research methods class. None of our university teach research methods class. I mean, in my university, we introduce it, and it's one of the most successful. But in many universities, we do not teach research methods. The scholars or the students who graduate from certain type of the departments, they may have a perfect knowledge, great knowledge, data, information, but they do not have an ability to collect the data and to analyze the data. And that's what's most important to produce research. This is the biggest challenge. We're still producing, or not still, we're, every year we're producing absolutely use, useless type of the researchers who just simply didn't take even one class of research methods. If you go to Academy of Science, they know how to copy paste. They know how to write a descriptive study that you don't need at all. And that's it. The majority of dissertation written today absolutely no, have no value. I mean, you can just uh, talk about, I mean, if you go to the, any Academy of Science in the former Soviet Union Republic, where still Academy of Science exists, you will see that the majority of the dissertation produced over there or university, produced, they have no absolutely impact to the even one zero point one percent to the science because they write for the sake of the writing. Because once the science or scholastic work, call it whatever it is, this is my last statement, once scholastic work or scholastic or science in the hands of the public administrator, when the science is not free to do whatever they want to do, then I don't think there will be a development in any type of the, whether it's a social science, whether it's a kind of natural sciences, whatever it is. We're still going kind of through institutional kind of lenses looking at the science. And we're thinking kind of, this is a thinking of average public administrator. So if I give you money, 
you will produce me research. That's absolutely wrong. So finances is not a problem, first of all. First of all, you have to understand why you need this research. Second one, uh, where this research will be used and what to do to make that kind of research. And the biggest challenge for us, what we right now is experiencing, we're thinking that research is a some kind of a soccer game. So if we, if we buy legionnaires from, I don't know, let's say from India, from China, we'll bring them and ask them, okay, write article for me, that will bring the science up. That's not gonna work. Unless the science is indigenous, unless the science is breeded or bred from your own countries, nothing gonna happen. Look at the example of Qatar. With the billions of dollars, they couldn't build any research hub. Look at United Arab Emirates. There's so many better universities than we have, but they still do not produce proper research. Anyway, that was kind of a little bit spontaneous, my speech. I will be really happy to discuss more in details. Uh, yes, I'm done for a moment. Uh, Professor Valiant, thanks so much. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm very happy that all our participants um, kind of are kind of so open and so, uh, the, the, so keen to describe their own experiences. And actually, I think that was the, uh, goal of a round table and uh, yeah, I could see, I mean, the commercialization of uh, just higher education in general, of course, that's the, that's what is happening. Uh, that's what's definitely happening in Georgia. And I'm aware that that's also a thing in Armenia as well. So basically you're producing, uh, you are like rubber stamping um, professionals, but in fact, you are not really able to produce uh, kind of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, social science knowledge in this case. And of course, like brain drain also contributes to that. Research methods are, all, of course, I mean, uh, a very important problem. And uh, for someone who teaches undergraduate and graduate research methods, it's, I could see, I mean, how some, um, uh, you know, departments even downplay their role here in, in, in Georgia as well. So anyways, uh, and uh, speaking of research methods, I, I actually want to introduce our last speaker, uh, Tina Tezorabishvili. Uh, I think everyone knows Tina. Tina used to work uh, for CRC and uh, she used to be research director of CRC Georgia. And right now she's based at uh, uh, University of Bologna. And uh, to, to, to mention a few, uh, Tina is, a, uh, is, is an author of couple of research methods books that are still taught uh, at Tbilisi State Universities. And I would say that that's, those books actually uh, really, really, really helped uh, uh, kind of future Georgian social sciences, including myself to, you know, like hone their skills and actually know about, uh, know the subject. Tina, thanks so much for joining us and floor is yours. Uh, so I want to thank you. Thank you, Dato. Thanks for invitation. And I'm really happy to be here, even virtually, but otherwise doesn't seem to be possible. And with your permission, I'll just take advantage of my position in the end of this round table and resonate with whatever has been said so far with our friends. I should say that I am really surprised and a bit sad about the extent of the problems uh, outlined by Sona, Tim, and Danar. But unfortunately, I should also say that I, I really completely agree with everything that they said. And also, obviously, they've covered a lot of things that I was going to mention, and I was kind of heading my bullet points, but I'll just... Uh, I'll just focus on a few other points that, that they have not yet mentioned. Also, ho hopefully they will agree. Uh, so one of the other cha challenges that, in my opinion, social sciences face in uh, the South Caucasus, that they are all, in the end of the day, quite related to each other, whatever we have been mentioning here. but. One of the things which I would specifically mention is the donor dependency of the social sciences and social science research. So 
in many occasions, unfortunately, whatever research is being done, and right now I'm speaking about the situation outside universities, but we can link this to universities if, if, if we really want to. So most of the empirical research is done for donors and is commissioned and is actually imagined by and the idea comes from the donors. And unfortunately, this, this situation leaves uh, almost no freedom of choice and freedom of action to the researchers. This leads to the problems of publications, the role of the researchers that Anna very well described, and many, many other things. But most importantly, probably, it develops research and also in my experience, and I hope to be wrong, but still in my experience, it leads to a deterioration of the quality of the research because who, whoever were, ever worked with donors will very few, tragically few exceptions uh, we have to deal with a very high level of unprofessionalism and temptations to uh, include impossible questions, have impossibly long interviews and so on and so on. The examples can be like thousands. And not because somebody wants something bad. This all stems from uh, lack of knowledge, like, like almost always. But anyway, this donor dependency, in my opinion, is a very big risk for the social science scientists in the region. And um, as Anna said, it's actually money is never a problem at this point, which is probably should be a good news. But uh, at some point, it becomes very bad news, which is very sad. But probably, I don't know. I, I frankly don't know what can be the solution, but this is one of the problems I've seen. And I continue to see, unfortunately. Then uh, another one which I would like to focus on is, um, this one is also quite counterintuitive and it slightly contradicts what has been said so far, especially by NR, but what I've seen in Georgia, but uh, I don't think it's on the Georgian case. Uh, the research, whatever it means, and it may mean different things, it's become at some point kind of a fashion. And this fashionability of uh, research led to people who are not equipped with enough knowledge and enough experience and enough understanding, unfortunately, to have the pretense and wish and very often very sincere wish to conduct research themselves. This again leads to something of an extremely poor quality and sometimes something quite shameful. But it, it's happening, and it's happening because it's supposed to be cool to be doing research, or to say that you are doing research, or to pretend that you wrote a research report, or, or I don't know, again, there can be a lot of different variations, but this uh, is another risk which, in my opinion, is very serious. Then, uh, uh, I, I guess I, I'll only mention the last, one last thing is the politicization of the debate about research. I'm not saying at this point, I mean, I mean, a lot of different things may happen, but at this point, I'm not saying that there is some political pressure or something, not at all. But uh, what I'm saying is that politicization of the debate about research, meaning that uh, the researchers, including very prominent, very interesting, very clever, and very good researchers, most often than, than not, make themselves hear, write, or speak, mostly in relation to some political events or debates, etc. So there is much less um, discussion of non-political aspects of social research, which I think is quite bad because 
Okay, I, I totally agree that there is a lot to discuss in the political arena and in what's happening in the political sphere, etc. Et totally. But everything else seems to be left out, at least uh, very often so. And I think it also hampers the development of the research. Mm, to sum up, I, I just, I would like to repeat that uh, I totally agree with the problem of quality of education. And to continue what Anna was saying is like, unfortunately, in my experience, having any kind of degree in any kind of university is never a guarantee of being a good researcher or whatever. It's unfortunately uh, the quality of education elsewhere is having quite a serious problem. And then we also have, uh, and it, it also resonates with, with whatever had already been said, lack of understanding of the nature of the research. It's not just that uh, people don't know why they do research, but it's like when they even try to comment on research, they often may not understand what they're talking about. Like they, they don't understand the nature, they don't understand the variables, they don't understand the equations, etc. Et et Unfortunately, I see it very often, including in some of the publications. Like one thing, one little thing, I would probably not agree that much is that I don't see problem in publishing per se, because if somebody had uh, resources to publish, meaning good text, anything can be published because we have so much, um, so, such a rich variety of publication options that I just can't imagine a good text cannot be published. The problem is the production of a good text. But now we go back to the problem of education and knowledge, which again, has been discussed a lot. And that, if I may, I would have two questions to one to Sona and one to Anna, if I may finish. Yes, I one. think uh, that's great. My, and we can start already, you know, like the, the yeah, discussion because, part. I mean, yes, just, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, when Anna was speaking about um, universities not being interested in the research. So I don't know how, how it works in Azerbaijan, but I know from many of my friends in Georgia who work at universities that uh, when they have these um, professorial elections or whatever they are called, they do have to present some research involvement output publications. And as well as I understand, there is a lot of pressure in this respect. So what I'm saying is it's not just teaching universities are uh, interested in when they select and decide on which professors to employ. So is that different in Azerbaijan? And my question to Sona would be a bit different. Uh, I like, and I, again, I, I completely agree with all, all your points, but one, I would like to ask you to elaborate further if possible. So when, when you said that constant reformation, so it is a problem, what would be an opposite to that? Because my understanding is that uh, it will never stop. It has to be constant reformation because to me, the opposite would be stagnation, stop. You, you can't stop. Things, are developing in the social sciences, and as long as they stop developing, the social sciences are bound to die. Kind of. So, if you could uh, describe what you see as an opposite situation to the situation of reformation, it would be very interesting. That's it. Thank you. Tina, thanks so much. Thanks so much for your contribution. And uh, actually, thanks also for, you know, like the kickstarting the discussion process. As I well. was curious. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we actually uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, before we allow uh, Anar and Sona to answer your questions, I'll just make a note that uh, as it is a round table discussion, I would, I would uh, kind of encourage our participants to raise hand in Zoom uh, interface. You can you could see in the kind of uh, uh, in the in the participant list. You can raise hand there 
So uh, we are able to unmute you and allow you to uh, speak up. So I think that would be good if we have that option for, uh, for, for kind of for, for discussion purposes. Uh, and we also look at the, whether we, we received any questions from other mediums. Okay, uh, I think uh, the first question, question was uh, uh, asked to Professor Valier. Professor Valier, please, uh, you, you can go ahead. And uh, then uh, uh, Sona, if you could uh, answer Tina's question. Thanks. Okay, yeah, yes, let's be. When I was talking about the universities are not interested, not from the perspective that uh, universities don't want to research. Uh, if we look at the many universities in the West where the education and research is commercialized, we can see that the market, his majesty market, is defining a lot of things in the research. So for example, if university doesn't make any research, it means it will be less on the ranking, it will be less on the student admission, because students will decide to go to university which is ranking higher than previously. So it everywhere it's affect the funding. It's everywhere affecting the finances. So that's why the university forced to go to the research kind of the marathon in order to make sure that the uh, ranking of the universities or prestige of the university is high now. This market rules does not work in our societies or doesn't work in our, uh, I would say, countries. Why? Because we do not have this market relations inside the university, whether it's a public university, whether it's a private university. Private university is dealing only with the cases of how to earn money. And a public university is they always have the quota of the students. So whether I produce 20 articles, I will get the same number of students, or I produce two articles, I will get the same number of the students. So research for me is becoming not important because I will do, yes, for the sake of the doing, because everybody is doing it. But it doesn't give me commercial livability. It's actually become a burden for me because I need to spend more time for research as a, as a researcher. And as a dean or the rectors of university will simply say, okay, if it doesn't bring any benefits to us, why should we do it? So that's what I mean that it's not interested, not because they, they don't want to research at all, because it's research. We are not at that stage, yes, where research can be monetized, because at the end, whatever we talk about enlightenment, whatever we talk about edu education purposes for us, at the end, what matter is the money. If it doesn't make money, it doesn't make any sense to do it. If it makes money, then let's do it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Sona, if you could, uh, if you could refer to uh, Tina's uh, uh, comment, it would be great. Yes, I have to thank Tina for her question. Uh, this actually allows me to expand on what I meant by saying constant reformation. By saying constant reformation, I mean, um, we are not assessing phase by phase the lessons we learned. And I agree with Anar on the point that we have no goal and there is no strategic thinking in terms of why the research is conducted and why do we need this. So if there was networking between the organizations and if we were in a circle of planning, doing, checking and acting, we would per perhaps have more strategic ways of doing research because otherwise these are spots but there is no system. And I, I, I mentioned briefly that there is a problem of a formation of schools. So when we are in, in this constant reformation process, when we are making the system of teaching social sciences, like bachelor degree, then, then a master's degree, we have to evaluate how these master's degrees are actually working. Um, are we preparing the professionals that we need um, and this goes to Timothy also, what is scholarship in our case? And so all this, all this uh, strategic um, planning is missing. So what I'm trying to say uh, with this term, with this term, um, 
what I'm trying to say with this term, um, constant reformation, I mean, there is no in between. There is no reflection about the phases that we underwent. So what, what lessons we learned and what building blocks we have. It's not, a, it's, it's, it's just um, doing research each on his or her own or institutions are doing this privately and individually as they see fit. But we don't have a network of professionals and just consider the absence of, of uh, review boards. When CRRC Armenia wants to send a research for review, we're having a, a struggle because we don't know who we can approach. So this is what I mean by saying that we have to, the, an alternative to constant reformation to me would be strategic planning and, and evaluations and assessments of, of doing research and, and whether it is productive or effective or, in, or inefficient. Uh, thank you, Sona. Uh, Tim, I think you had, uh, you had some uh, comments uh, in the Zoom group chat. Uh, maybe you, you, you'd, uh, you'd uh, kind of reflect on that as well. It would be, I think, uh, the participants would, would love to hear more about that. Uh, and also, uh, I will definitely encourage others, other participants, to just, to just raise your hands in Zoom or just write us in the chat and we will uh, allow you to speak up. It will be very much delighted if you participate in this discussion. Yeah, Tim, uh, sorry. Yeah, so Tina raised this question of um, the role of academic publishing in professional advancement in, in, in Georgia and universities and in the region more generally. So uh, I, I can only speak for Ilya State University where uh, only this year, actually based on the last year and a half, uh, they um, used a, implemented a process for performance evaluations for professors and that gives points for academic publishing for peer reviewed, for non peer reviewed, for book chapters and so forth with diminishing amounts of points and also points for, for teaching and, and points for other academic stuff like conference participation, like organizing things, uh, um, exhibitions and, and things like that for uh, professors of film and publishing for literature and stuff like that. But um, they decided ultimately uh, for right now that this would be only used for assessing the actual overall faculties and how they're doing. So there was it wasn't actually clear when they begin this. Was this going to be something that would uh, lead to promotions, that would lead to bonuses for professors who, who published a lot or did a lot of stuff? And ultimately, they decided not to use it for, for those things, but only to use it as an assessment for the faculties overall. Although I think they will use them for uh, the also newly established um, procedures for, um, for determining tenure, which Ilya State is also um, kind of new in implementing that in the Georgian framework. Thank you. Uh, yeah, dear participants, please, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate. Uh, um, um, uh, just letting, um, yeah, letting us know uh, uh, your questions. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, just overall to, to um, as I mentioned earlier, I guess, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, this discussion had been um, kind of very, very much, you know, quite inspiring for me. I mean, uh, to be honest, of course, anyone who kind of uh, works in academia or even uh, either by a teaching or being a professor there in at universities, they usually, you know, kind of as uh, Professor Blow mentioned, they try to, you know, accommodate these um, kind of two worlds, basically kind of working two jobs, right? Uh, I mean, to be honest, it's, I'm just sharing my personal experience. It, um, I'm considering the underfunding of uh, academia, especially like fundamental research, uh, and the quality of teaching, let's say, methods and actually, I mean, doing, let's say, whatever we would call kind of modern social science, right? Uh, it's a little bit challenging to learn about that. 
and to do that at, uh, uh, at, at universities. Because, I mean, it could be, I mean, sometimes even the faculty do not appreciate that this is necessary. Not, I mean, I'm not generalizing this, but I've seen and I've heard uh, examples of that. But secondly, it's also, of course, the lack of staff that could teach uh, and uh, uh, do actual research, right? How, kind of, how elsewhere, we, in, uh, uh, new kind of headers into research are brought to, right? It's basically graduate assistants, like student assistants that are working with uh, kind of more senior researchers and you know, uh, learning more. And um, but of course, that's that's uh, I'm not talk talking about. I'm mentioning that kind of uh, more kind of precarious labor that those um, kind of workers are doing. That's of course not the best one, but even that doesn't exist here. And uh, I mean, working in this, you know, like a, being a kind of in dual system, right? Being in the, let's say, NGO sector or, and also being into academia actually gives your resources to, to engage into, into social science research and actually kind of make that impact that social scientists had to uh, have to make. I mean, I think that's the, I've, I've heard the discussions among the, like the, among Georgian uh, presenters of like, little bit younger Georgian academics that yes, NGO sector is, is the, is the place where, you know, like the science, like social science is done and uh, social science, not only social science research, but also so-called action research, right? So. Um, yeah, that's uh, basically that's that's uh, that's my observation. What I can see and what, have, uh, what I can share uh, through my work in both kind of in the academic sector and also in the kind of non-profit sector, which I consider as a my main uh, my main kind of occupation right now. But it of course that has kind of its perks and its perks. Okay, um, I mean, if uh, any of the participants want to kind of wants to reflect more, uh, yeah, please feel free. Uh, if not, I think we can slowly wrap up this, uh, our, our discussion. Um, so it's been, it's very, very, it was super interesting and uh, very exciting to, to have this round table discussion and I actually, I would say it was a very timely discussion because it's, I mean, discussions on these topics rarely uh, happen in Georgia and, uh, well, and I could imagine that that's also the case in Azerbaijan and Armenia. And I think that also could serve as, you know, like a stepping stone for doing something more, or at least, you know, uh, starting discussing these topics. I mean, it could be well, whether it is media, whether it is uh, social networks, whether it is, you know, like some other mediums. And I think this is essential even uh, in order to um, do more impactful social science research. And actually, as, as you know, as Professor Bolland mentioned, to, you know, like elevate the role of a social science researcher uh, from just a kind of a teacher. I'm not, of course, I'm not uh, using that word as derogatory, but university and uh, academic is not only a teacher, but academic should be a person that produces uh, research and that produces impactful research, not only teaches at universities. So I think that would be, you know, like that, that would be something we need to kind of uh, key take away from this round table. And uh, hopefully uh, very soon the situation could, could, could change. Um, anyways, uh, thanks so much for joining um, uh, to this to our uh, roundtable. And now I'm gonna um, um, pass word to Maria. Uh, thanks so much for joining, and I was it was very delighting discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. I also really enjoyed this roundtable, um, and we're 
So getting close to the end of the day one of the conference, we have keynote speech left by professor from the Colorado Boulder University. And I can reveal the title now. It's um, the perils and benefits of survey research in post-conflict zones, cautionary tale. So please stay for the keynote speech. We will now go on a very short 10 minute break and be back uh, with our keynote speaker. Thank you very much for staying during the entire day.
Uh, I think we can start gradually. Uh, we already have our keynote speaker in the meeting. So now we will hear Professor John O'Loughlin talk about perils and benefits of survey research in post-conflict zones. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, Professor, for joining us. I think it's really early, uh, early morning uh, <laughs> at your place. And yeah, you're welcome to share the screen and start the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, actually, let me, let me do this. Okay, <clears throat> I hope everybody can hear me. Um, if not, uh, Mariam, let me know uh, on the chat. Um, but I, I'm here in Boulder, it's uh, eight o'clock in the morning. It's a beautiful sunny day. I hope it's nice where you are. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I can't be there and uh, I'm sorry that nobody um, can see me live, but here we are. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to make this presentation. It forced me to uh, engage in uh, some activity that I hadn't done for really quite a while, which is to put together my thoughts about this um, topic and um, to reflect on many of the comments and critiques that we've had uh, over the years. So um, the main thing I want to talk about is the, um, the pros and cons, the um, arguments for and the arguments against to do this kind of survey research. And I've titled it, uh, The Pearls and Benefits of Survey Research in Post-Conflict Zones, uh, Cautionary Tales. Uh, I've written out most of what I will say because I found that over the years, it's better to um, write out the text uh, so that people whose English skills are, um, and whose familiarity with my accent, which is sort of a transatlantic accent. I'm actually Irish by background, um, but I've lived in the US for a long time. And um, it's, if you're not familiar with my accent and the rate at which I speak, um, it's easier to follow along if uh, the text is also there. Um, before I begin, and I'll speak for about uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, I wanted to um, make sure that um, this is not just a talk about my work, but it's also a talk about the work that I and many others have uh, done. Um, and you can see at the bottom here in terms of the acknowledgements, uh, this work has been funded by the, the US National Science Foundation for many years now, um, really over, uh, over 20 years. And um, it's also uh, done in collaboration with close colleagues, especially uh, Gerard Toll, at Virginia Tech University uh, with Kristen Bakke at uh, University College London and with uh, Vladimir Kolosov, uh, who is with the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. Um, and of course, uh, it's done in partnership with a lot of survey companies, uh, including now CRC, um, but also, of course, Lavada, um, and then in Kenya, uh, the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Nairobi. So um, thanks to them and also uh, I was trying to calculate quickly how many respondents over the years have replied to our surveys and um, it's somewhere over 40,000. So a lot of people have uh, kindly uh, responded to our requests for uh, interviews. Um, so I wanted to, um, I wanted to talk about um, these topics and I outline here the uh, presentation. The studies, um, I'll talk a little bit about the places that we have worked in, um, also what we're trying to do and a little bit about the methods. Um, but then I'll get into kind of the, the thornier or more difficult topics which are listed here. Um, the first question 
and it's one that has t received increasing attention in the US and in many other countries is the uh, issue of uh, human subjects, protection of human subjects, or what are called IRBs, Institutional Review Board, um, and the ethical questions surrounding um, this kind of work or any work really with uh, human subjects. I should say as an aside that I'm also the chair of the university committee on research misconduct and um, I'm obviously very attentive to um, issues around the proper conduct of scientific work and thankfully um, most of the uh, misconduct uh, complaints allegations that we deal with are not about human subjects um, they're mostly about um, biological and chemical um, work uh, in, in uh, laboratories, but um, the same principles apply uh, in terms of proper uh, work, proper uh, research uh, methodologies. I'll also stress that um, our funding is always scientific funding. It's never from policy uh, organizations. We don't work for and refuse any connection to governmental or non-governmental agencies that would sponsor the work with a particular policy objective. Um, I'll list the pros and cons of doing this kind of work and I'll especially uh, talk about what the critics have said uh, because we have given a lot of presentations in many uh, venues and uh, we have had a lot of pushback, a lot of critique, uh, mostly from um, government uh, who, shall we say, object to the kind of work we do uh, in the places that we do it. And then I'll talk about some kind of technical details of um, how difficult it is uh, in dealing uh, with um, people who live in uh, these communities and um, how careful we have to be in analyzing the results that we get uh, in these areas. So um, I'll mention Kenya as an example of a very difficult environment in which to work. Um, most of you um, are working in uh, the Caucasus um, in parts of the former Soviet Union, um, but I also work in Kenya, uh, a very different kind of project, a very different emphasis, but I think it would be helpful to um, talk a little bit about um, the difficulties and the um, options that we have uh, working in Kenya. This project focuses on the effects of climatic environmental change on livelihoods and the support for violence. Uh, many of you are familiar with the term climate wars and the discussion that increasing shortages around uh, climate change, driven by climate change, will lead people desperate people to uh, take matters into their own hands and to try and gain resources through violence. And it's widely discussed and, and uh, widely speculated about. Um, but in fact, um, not too many people have examined on the ground how this plays out. And the, the project in Kenya going on for the past eight or nine years now um, focuses on the um, attitudes of both a national samples in Kenya, and you can see here 1400 people each, uh, and then also a ongoing uh, panel um, survey in one county in northern Kenya called Isiolo. It's um, in sort of north central Kenya, relatively close to uh, Somalia and to Ethiopia. And the points on these maps um, just indicate the sample points. There are 175 sample points. It's nationally representative. Uh, again, it's face-to-face -face interviews. Um, the way it's organized is with uh, four enumerators who go to a sample point with a supervisor. Um, and then they pick a uh, location, usually a church or a school, something like that, and then head out from there in the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Uh, the work is checked on the ground by the supervisor. The data are collected on a tablet and uh, uploaded immediately 
um, to the central server in Nairobi. Um, it's again a national sample, but you'll notice the distribution of points. Um, there are some empty areas along the border with Somalia in the northeast of the country. It's simply too dangerous to work there. Um, and so uh, we um, don't sample in those, uh, in those areas. Um, the project in Isiolo is a bit different in the sense that it's in one county. It's a mixed ecological and ethnic area. It has lots of uh, variety um, on the kinds of things that we um, speculate or that we hypothesize drive uh, climate change. Um, but we're doing um, telephone surveys, having done the contact survey in January. We're now repeating telephone surveys every two months as the seasons change, as the uh, environmental stress um, varies quite a bit throughout the year because of the rainfall patterns and the possibility of drought and um, food insecurity at different times of the year. Uh, we also have done um, pilot projects in Western Kenya, uh, but I, I think the thing to stress about the Kenyan work is that whereas on the face of it, it looks like a kind of a remote um, survey uh, from somebody who's in the US uh, with uh, partners on the ground in uh, Nairobi. Uh, we actually have done lots of hundreds of interviews with uh, local officials, with um, NGOs, with residents um, across the, uh, the country. And so we supplement the um, survey data with um, lots of interview data and lots of, um, how can I say, experience, I suppose. Um, that would almost qualify as ethnographic work as well. Now, in the former Soviet Union, um, there have been uh, lots of projects over the years, starting in Moscow in the mid 1990s and then extending to the North Caucasus of Russia, um, national samples in Russia um, in, in uh, the mid 2000s, uh, working in de facto republics listed here Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, and Nagorno Karabakh. Um, also in uh, Ukraine, in Crimea. Um, in Donbass, and also um, in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, where Jared Toll and I worked um, in the mid-2000s uh, on post-war development. And so the particular project varies a bit um, depending on the area. Much of the work is comparative, and that's an important element here uh, because we're trying to draw uh, some general um, conclusions based on the work in many different places. So we are geographers. We tend to uh, believe uh, that where you live matters a lot in the kinds of attitudes that you have and the kinds of perspectives uh, that one has. But we also um, are very attuned to discussions in political science, in international relations um, around um, kind of political behaviors, political attitudes, and especially the whole uh, body of work that might, one might call kind of post-Soviet uh, developments. Um, but we um, are particularly interested in people's conflict experiences, um, their post-conflict attitudes, the possibilities for reconciliation. Uh, we're particularly interested in a lot of work around um, migration and the um, dislocations and the uh, difficulties that people um, face based on forced migration um, and the possibilities of return, which was a focus of the work in, uh, in Bosnia especially. Um, the sample sizes here vary quite a bit from about 500 for a small place like South Ossetia um, up to uh, 2200. Uh, for larger um, countries like Ukraine or uh, in earlier for the North Caucasus. Um, the surveys are quite lengthy, um, usually over 100 questions. Um, we try to keep it around 40 minutes in length.
who does the work. Um, we contract with uh, survey companies who can do it. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I should apologize because um, our internet connection here is not great. And um, when lots of people uh, log on in Boulder, um, it becomes a little bit unstable. So if I could out for a minute or two, um, please bear with me, it'll, it'll come back. Um, so the, um, what I was saying is that the survey uh, companies um, are responsible for the work on the ground. And there's a, a huge amount of trust, of course, involved in that. Um, but we hire what we think are reputable companies and um, companies who are able to um, show us that they have the competence and the, um, the reputation that gives us the ability to say, okay, this survey was done according to what we agreed and it was done properly and we um, have um, as re results um, as reliable as we can get. Um, the costs, by the way, vary a lot. The most expensive place by far is Kenya, um, which might be surprising because you, you might think of Kenya as a low cost country, um, but it's not um, for survey work because many of the sites are quite inaccessible and um, the significant field costs are associated with getting the interviewers uh, to these uh, very inaccessible sites. So it's not uncommon, for example, for enumerators to have to um, ride in the back of uh, sheep uh, trucks um, going to a very isolated point because that's really the only way to get to that particular point. Um, they are representative samples. They're sometimes geographically stratified depending on the particular question. And again, what's interesting is the uh, response rate, uh, which was quite high some years ago. Um, we could rely on getting response rates of about 70% or more. Um, it really quite, quite um, dramatically dropped and it's now um, down to um, sometimes 15, 20, 25, 30%. So let me turn to some of the um, common denominators in, in terms of the uh, work that we do. Um, the first thing I wanna bring up are the Belmont rules and, and many of you are familiar with this already, um, but it, they date back now um, almost 50, 45, 50 years. Um, and they govern um, generally the work uh, around human subjects. And the, the, the list here uh, that respondents should be treated with respect and dignity, that there should be gar guaranteed uh, an anonymity or anonymous responses, uh, that the responses should be confidential, in other words, not shared beyond um, who collects it and a very uh, close protection of that confidentiality. Um, but the general idea is that one does no harm, uh, do no harm to the respondents, that they should not in any way uh, be placed in any um, jeopardy because of their agreement to take part in the survey. Over time, I, I've really noticed how um, the regulatory oversight in American universities has changed. It's become much more um, careful. It's become much more restrictive. Much of this, most of it, in fact, is driven by federal agencies, uh, the National Institutes of Health in the US, the National Science Foundation, the two big funding agencies um, are very careful and they have all kinds of regulatory oversight, uh, which in turn, of course, universities have to implement because if universities don't implement these federal oversight, then they can lose federal funding. Uh, and as I said, uh, very aware of this because of my uh, role as chair of the University Misconduct Committee. And we have to report um, any misconduct to these federal agencies if it comes with federal funds. And we have to um, tell them how we handle the matter and what decision we made and how we um, resolved it. Um, the one thing that I've also noticed is that IRBs are very knowledgeable about research in the US, but they're not at all knowledgeable uh, about research abroad. And so uh, they try to uh, require us to follow American models 
uh, and apply it in other places. Um, this requires lots of negotiating with IRBs, <clears throat> with institutional review boards to uh, allow us to take account of the conditions um, in the places that we survey. But again, um, this negotiation takes some time, but the federal agencies withhold funding until the IRB uh, were, is approved. Um, there is especially um, demanding around signed consent forms. And um, it takes usually quite a bit of negotiation to uh, get them to agree on verbal consent for an interview. Um, again, it helps that um, IRBs recently have added anthropologists and others who are familiar with um, conditions outside of the US and can explain uh, that in fact, not every respondent is a undergraduate at an American university that one often sees uh, in, um, in, pub, in uh, surveys. I think in general that um, survey work is easier um, to implement um, more than uh, qualitative work, ethnographic work. Uh, anonymity is easier. Confidentiality, I think, is more assured. Um, and I don't think that the um, kind of embeddedness that one needs uh, for qualitative uh, ethnographic work is necessary. Um, I'll talk in a minute about um, how governments um, look at these matters, but I, I think in general, um, it's easier to do survey work than uh, qualitative work. Um, in uh, American IRBs, we have to give special attention to what are called vulnerable populations. And these are people who are obviously children under the age of 18, uh, people who are disabled, institutionalized, and especially non-English speakers. And since we um, always survey non-English speakers, uh, we have to uh, explain and elaborate uh, what kinds of protections are uh, used uh, for these people. And then uh, lastly, IRBs increasingly are very concerned about how data are um, maintained, um, the kind of protection of data, security of data, the transfer of data, this sort of thing. Um, again, going back to the Belmont rules, they wanna make sure that um, the data are not shared and that the respondents can't be individually identified um, so that the protection uh, for them is, is, um, is assured. So the overall projects um, is to advance knowledge. It's scientific work. There is no um, other goal uh, except um, to answer kind of scientific questions and publish in scientific outlets. Um, but it's really hard to explain this to local officials um, in authoritarian regions, in areas where um, the idea of scientific work um, to advance knowledge only um, is really a quite a strange concept, right? Because the suspicion is that everybody has an agenda, everybody has a, a, has a name. And so the idea that you might in fact not be pushing a particular project or uh, working for a particular agency um, is sometimes hard to explain. Um, but we never do work under the radar uh, and work that is secretive in any fashion. Um, we always get permissions. We always um, make sure that the um, companies are able to work uh, without hindrance from local authorities. And so um, we have to get them on board. Um, it helps, I think, to uh, try and assure them that we have um, only scientific funding, um, but it's sometimes difficult to, to assure them that that is actually the case. There's always a little bit of doubt um, that, you know, why would uh, somebody based on an American university be interested in this particular area? What's, the, what's their angle? What's their agenda? Um, and so I have uh, taken the position um, maybe more so than my colleagues, that we should never make any kind of policy suggestions, uh, make uh, any kind of um, 
do any kind of writing that somebody could see it as taking a political position uh, one way or the other. Um, it's quite difficult to do that, um, but um, you know, if you stick to that ideal um, that you, in, to use the expression, that you have no dog in this particular fight, um, then I think um, it helps um, credibility and um, it also helps to continue working in, in these areas. So we only publish in scientific journals. We, we do um, blog posts for things like the Monkey Cage and the Washington Post uh, for open democracy, uh, for the conversation. These are all outlets um, that publish uh, work that is designed to reach the, a general audience rather than kind of a technical academic article. And we've done more of that in recent years because uh, funding agencies, in this, our case, National Science Foundation, like to see that kind of outreach. Um, I never give talks that are not open. Um, it, there's plenty of potential to do uh, closed door talks to select audiences, but I never do it because um, again, the principle of openness um, should be, um, I think, guaranteed and giving a, a closed door talk um, violates that principle. But, you know, we can only um, control the information uh, and the analysis, but we can't control how people use it. And obviously, uh, different people have different interpretations of what we're doing and why. So why would we do this? Um, I think we do it because um, we want to give voice to ordinary people. Um, so the term we use is going inside uh, these particular uh, locations. Most of you know that there's a lot of high level politics and, and uh, arguments, discourses around uh, what has happened uh, in the former Soviet Union. Um, and it, of course, um, can lead to uh, very biased information, uh, well, biased, biased perspective, but more importantly, uh, biased information, what you might want to call fake news. We're trying to kind of give information that is not fake, um, that reflects what people on the ground believe and say, um, and in a way, um, try and address um, a topic that is often overlooked, which is, um, what citizens think about uh, these subjects. Um, we also um, try to um, interview local officials and get their perspectives uh, on what we're doing. Obviously, um, it is sometimes easier to do that for in some places uh, more than others. Um, but in general, um, I think it's fair to say that um, we get... <laughs> quite a range of opinion, depending on who we're talking to about a particular topic, especially, of course, in the uh, de facto republics, the differences of opinion between the uh, de facto authorities and the opinions of uh, officials in the so-called parent states, the in, uh, in Georgia, in, in Ukraine, in um, Moldova, um, in, our, in uh, Azerbaijan are very, very different than what the authorities in the republics are saying. Um, we also try to do um, workshops and lectures and um, to in, in the areas where we've surveyed uh, when we have some data as a way of kind of giving back to the communities. In Kenya, for example, um, we update the kind of summary results uh, in Isiolo, um, after each wave so that the um, local officials who deal with uh, drought monitoring, uh, food security, um, those kinds of subjects um, have um, a reliable uh, survey of the residents in the area and they can use that to inform uh, what kind of policies they want to, um, to use. Um, I think the key question again in Kenya is that um, much of the discussion about climate wars um, is really high level and is very, in my view, very uninformed. And um, we have found, in fact, in Kenya, that the worries about climate wars are, in fact, um, quite exaggerated. So uh, this is a good reason to uh, give voice to people on the ground. 
so why would we not do it? Um, and these are um, the kind of arguments against what we do that we've heard um, and that have come up um, based on our um, publications and talks, but also based on the reading of the literature. Um, we're often surveying populations who've lived through uh, conflict, um, who have been witness to, uh, who've been victims of conflict, and their lives have been uh, disrupted and, and traumatized. And <clears throat> so one argument, uh, an ethical argument, is that you shouldn't, uh, in a sense, re-traumatize these people by asking them to revisit um, such events. Um, the second argument is, I think, uh, quite important. Um, and that is that there are some especially vulnerable people in uh, these places, uh, typically minorities, non titular populations who, um, in a sense, are um, feel under pressure and um, so that they uh, should not be um, asked to um, give voice to their concerns, to their worries, adding to their sense of vulnerability and insecurity. Uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, but we often see for these um, populations, these vulnerable populations, we see lots of don't know answers to uh, sensitive questions. A third point, which is a legitimate one, I think it's very true, is that we're only looking at the people who now live in the area, but we're not looking at the people who lived in the area before the conflict. So in the example of uh, Bosnia, where there was massive population shift, almost 50% of the population moved during the Bosnian um, Civil War. The um, people that we survey in a particular place um, often are those who have moved into the area uh, as a result of migration and don't reflect the um, pre-war population. So you then have to try and find them. Um, and it's sometimes quite difficult to, to get it. This, by the way, is a comment we frequently hear. And I've heard it from uh, the government of Georgia uh, with respect to, let's say, surveying in Abkhazia and in South Ossetia. It's a legitimate point. Um, and we certainly would like to be able to um, examine both people who currently live in a place and those who formerly lived in the place, but it's often hard to locate the uh, migrants. Um, there is a lot of uh, suspicion about the sponsorship of the work, as I said, not just from local authorities, but also really from respondents. Um, so we um, ask a question uh, of the respondents, who do you think uh, is sponsoring this work? Who sent us? And it's again, quite interesting, um, but really only about a minority, um, of maybe 30, 40% actually um, have a sense that it's done for scientific purposes. The um, Oversight is again quite difficult uh, because we're obviously doing it from a distance. We're not going out with the survey um, numerators. So again, the best way around this is to get a reputable company. Um, we try and avoid local um, companies as much as possible um, that are tied to, sponsored by um, the governments in the particular places where we survey. Um, obviously that would jeopardize the whole the validity of the uh, project. And then lastly, um, in terms of the survey instrument itself, the questionnaire, um, often local authorities want to uh, eliminate some questions that are particularly sensitive. It's funny because often the questions that we think are sensitive, uh, they don't think are sensitive, but questions about local politics especially are viewed as um, very sensitive. And for us, it's generally not a big problem to remove those in order to keep the questions about the topics that we are particularly interested in. So in balance, I think uh, we believe that the pros outweigh the cons, but um, not everybody agrees as uh, we, have, we have seen. So what, what do the critics say? Well, here are what they say. Um, the first one is that, especially in de facto states, we should not do this work because it gives legitimacy to the existence of the de, uh, de facto republics and to the authorities in these republics. Um, and again, um, it challenges us 
to uh, leave these places alone. And of course, we uh, counter argument is um, that by black balling to, to uh, keep them as places for which little information or really no information is available might serve political purposes of the parent states. But I don't think it's fair to the, either to the populations of the de facto republics or to the broader scientific community that, um, that's trying to understand uh, what's going on uh, in these places. The second critique we, we all see is that um, the argument is that these are authoritarian regimes, that people are fearful, they won't give honest answers. Um, and so um, we have recently um, had a uh, debate uh, in Foreign Affairs magazine with the foreign minister of Ukraine who uh, criticized us for serving in Crimea um, and you know, gave the example of uh, Tatars in Crimea who are, um, in his view, uh, under pressure and um, cannot give honest answers in this, uh, in, in his view, uh, environmental fear. Um, so we, um, these are the two most common um, criticisms, um, but it's even broader than that. Um, they all, the critics also um, criticize um, academic journals or newspapers or other publication outlets that accept uh, our work, um, saying that again, this um, legitimizes the uh, de facto republics, or in the case of uh, Crimea, the um, annexation of Crimea to Russia in March of 2014. Um, and so um, it's just not criticizing us, but criticizing those who um, support us by publishing our work. Um, they all, the critics also um, question the work of survey companies asking, are they, reliable or are they compromised? And um, again, um, basically saying that they cannot assure any kind of quality control in, in these environments. Um, the critics also um, criticize the funding agencies for supporting this work. Um, in our first work in um, 2008, in um, the de facto republics, um, the government of Georgia um, asked why was the US National Science Foundation funding surveys in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, and we tried to explain to the government why, but I'm not sure. <laughs> we weren't really very persuasive. Um, and then of course the other, and maybe the most um, important critique um, is the IRB concerns about whether this is putting respondents under risk and pressure. So most of the critical critics are political critics, but there is, uh, I suppose you could say, a kind of a scientific criticism as well. Um, I want to uh, go through uh, very quickly um, a couple of sensitive uh, matters and um, leave some time for questions if people have questions. Um, Dealing with this topic of whether uh, respondents are giving honest answers on sensitive questions, there are various ways to try and get around it, but it's not that easy. And it's not easy to be sure uh, that one is getting uh, honest answers. Um, so the first way to deal with it is to ask the enumerator to answer uh, questions about the respondent. Um, in other words, how honest did the respondents seem about certain questions on certain topics? Um, this, by the way, um, I learned quite a bit from the work in Africa. Um, and I think even though it might be a, a pain, it might take some time for the enumerator to do it. Uh, it's very, very helpful to us. Um, we also, in, especially in Africa, um, need to know uh, about the ethnicity of the interviewer and um, the gender of the interviewer, uh, because these turn out to be very important statistical controls in analysis. Um, we use experimental questions, uh, lists and endorsements to try and um, get around this uh, topic of honesty. Um, I have uh, also um, 
come across. Um, and I was a little surprised by this. Um, but a few years ago, I was um, an expert um, on a, a group at the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, who were doing a big um, survey of violence against women um, in um, the Balkans, um, in uh, Turkey and other parts of South and uh, Eastern Europe. And um, the question, of course, about violence against women in war zones and conflict zones is very, very uh, important and very, very sensitive. Uh, but one of the things that they uh, were used a lot were um, envelopes um, into which uh, respondents um, put their answers and then uh, the enumerator did not see the answer. Um, we haven't done that uh, because we don't think that our questions are as sensitive as questions about violence against women. Um, we pay special attention to uh, don't know answers. And again, there are ways of dealing with this. Um, but mostly uh, we stress face-to-face uh, -face interviews and use telephone interviews only if no other options are available. Uh, we don't do online surveys because, um, again, um, issues around uh, who can fill out the survey uh, suggest to us that um, it's really only certain segments of the population, certain age groups, certain groups with a uh, level of education and technological skills uh, can answer these, and we don't think they're very representative. So to give you a couple of quick examples of how we have done this, um, here's a list experiment results uh, recently from a survey that Lovada did for us in Crimea in January. And there are two questions here about President Putin. It's not the main focus of the particular um, survey, but uh, we um, put them in. Um, there's a direct question, to what extent do you trust President Putin? And you can see the results here, 60%, a lot, 25%, a little, not at all, 11, don't know, and then refutes. So that's the kind of direct question that you typically see. But the list question about um, uh, President Putin um, shows us, in fact, that the trust level is a bit lower. Um, so we, again, give uh, respondents, uh, break them into two, half the sample, get the list of four. You can see it here for people who live in your area, local religious leaders, local police, people of your nationality. Okay, how many of those do you trust without naming uh, which ones? And then the other half get those four plus one more, which is uh, President Putin. And then when you calculate the uh, average weighted scores between the control and the treatment, the trust level for President Putin in Crimea is 55%, which again is uh, quite a bit lower than the direct question um, that results are up above, which you know should be probably around, it's not, it's not exact match, but it probably is somewhere around 70% if you had a yes, no kind of response. Uh, it's quite a bit lower. Um, another kind of experiment we use is endorsements. And um, here is an example from Kenya, where we ask, uh, we're trying to get at support for local uh, armed groups, local militias. Um, basically, um, in much of Kenya, um, local communities have these young men who are armed and are um, quite active. <laughs> shall we say, in the communities. Um, and again, you know, a policy questions that are unrelated to the particular topic that we're trying to get at. And then we have, again, half get the policy question without endorsement, half get the policy question with endorsement. The difference um, is what we're interested in because it shows support for the local armed groups. And so overall in Kenya, it's around 23% uh, supported. Um, but again, it's up to 40% or more in certain communities, uh, which are um, feel particularly aggrieved and uh, particularly uh, anti-government um, areas. So again, um, endorsements and lists and other kinds of experimental questions are, you know, more difficult to implement. Um, but in areas where you have people um, who are generally um, risk averse, they don't want to give honest answers. 
is a good way to try and get at the uh, topic of interest. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the other way uh, that we try and understand what's going on are uh, by focusing on the so-called don't know answers, um, which can be quite high. Um, to give you an example that might be familiar to some of you, in Abkhazia, um, when we did the survey in 2010, uh, among the uh, Georgian ethnic Georgian population of Abkhazia, for certain questions, the don't know answer was 40%. Uh, and so we felt that there was something going on here uh, rather than just a, um, a don't know, a legitimate don't let, let's say this was a don't know that was avoiding a very sensitive question. But there are lots of reasons why respondents can give don't know answers. And we have obviously listed four here. Um, we um, want to focus on the one that is number C here, dodging the question, afraid or unmotivated to give an answer. Um, and, you know, again, it's been noted over the years that uh, can typically get more don't knows to the end, towards the end of a long survey. But we're focused on the ones that are don't know because uh, of uh, the fear of giving an honest answer. I'll skip this here, but there's also a lot of many other reasons why you get missing values in a survey. Um, and we don't uh, especially want to um, kind of talk about this now. We don't have time, but I think um, it's not just uh, avoidance of, uh, of a question that you get it. Um, so this gets a little technical and, and I won't um, get into it in detail, but essentially if you have don't know answers based on <clears throat> um, certain missingness patterns, you can use that information to try and uh, get at what's behind the don't know answer. Um, we, um, are now in the middle of this big project, uh, which CRC is uh, helping us in, in, many, in many places. Um, and looking at the uh, overall, at the responses, uh, we very rarely see the first category here, which is missing completely at random. Uh, the, there is a pattern to the don't know answers. So we can't just avoid it. We can't use in statistical terms, list-wise and pair-wise deletion. Um, we have to go uh, beyond that. It turns out that most of the don't know responses correspond to a pattern which is called missing at random, MAR. Um, and <clears throat> that we can deal with. We can, in that sense, impute the um, don't know answer. We can impute a value for uh, the don't knows. Um, so we um, are, are doing that right now across um, the, well, six countries and um, many, many uh, different questions. The third category is very difficult to deal with. Um, it's called missing not at random, where um, you would have here a particular group that gives um, don't know answers, but you um, are not uh, sure based on the uh, other answers what the imputed value should be. So you really have to know a lot about the particular case, the particular cause. And uh, luckily uh, in this big survey we're doing right now, it doesn't appear that the missing not at random is a huge issue, um, but um, it can be in particular places. So just to give you a quick example of this, uh, here are some sensitive questions that we asked. Um, in the de facto states um, about 10 years ago. Um, if you look at the last question, um, the one about do refugees have the right to return? <clears throat> um, this is obviously a very sensitive question and I'll give you the example of Abkhazia to show what can happen. So <clears throat> here is Abkhazia. Because there are so many don't know answers to this question, if you drop the um, list wise, in other words, you drop all of the variables where there was, I don't know, the sample um, of a thousand drops dramatically and you only have 476 people 
um, in the analysis. If you do a listwise um, deletion, if you do a pairwise deletion, you lose about 200 of the respondents, okay? But if you do a <clears throat> um, imputation, um, then you um, bring the sample back to what it was, close to a thousand. Um, but you can see how the results will change depending on which of these ways that you deal with um, missing values. Um, what I've highlighted here are some of the relationships that change the uh, coefficients, that change the significance, depending on which of these ways of highlighting or, or dealing with the uh, missing values. And um, the, the coefficients change, the results change, the conclusions change. So you have to be very, very careful how you um, examine uh, missing values. Um, but I think um, this is just a very simple example, um, but it's one that I think is quite illustrative and quite helpful to understand the, um, the big topic. So uh, I'll end there and um, I'll stop sharing and I'm happy to deal with uh, any uh, questions or uh, comments on what I've uh, spoken about. So thank you very much. Professor Arlovin, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation that touched upon issues that really matter for, for our countries and for research companies that we uh, represent. Um, I would like to ask everyone to ask questions and here we can also use the same approach as in the round table. So if you want to ask a question, please raise a hand or type it in the chat. Uh, and we and Professor will read it himself. So please feel free to ask questions if you want to, if you want to be unmuted and uh, ask a question, you know, with the voice. Please let me know, and I will unmute you. I'm also watching the YouTube channel comments, uh, and if there are any questions there, I will copy and paste them in Zoom chat. Um, Mariam, um, there is a question that came privately to me on the uh, Zoom uh, chat. Can I answer that question first? Of course. Yeah. Please read the question and then. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, from Hegin, I, I think, um, is on there. Anyway, so something, sometimes talking to elites or public officials enables change through deeper understanding of social issues and acting accordingly. Uh, why do you consider it not much acceptable? Um, well, maybe I should clarify. Um, we do talk to um, public officials. Um, th there are two reasons for that. Um, first, to kind of get them on board uh, the project <laughs> and uh, try and assure them that we are, um, you know, engaged in scientific work and, and not any kind of policy or political work. Um, but secondly, of course, um, yes, as this comment um, said, um, it helps to um, see what kinds of uh, things they believe are most important and that should be examined. Um, we have to be careful though, because um, public officials obviously have their own interests and their own agendas. And often they uh, want us to ask questions that is of particular interest to them, uh, but it's not really of you know, great interest to us. So there might be, for example, questions about uh, local public services, you know, and, and how um, they are viewed or used or something like that. Um, and so, you know, you often get into uh, discussions about things like traffic or water supply or you know, other obviously important subjects uh, in the local environment. But again, for our project is, is not so critical. Um, but in general, I think, yes, we, we, we do try to um, uh, at least talk to them and uh, get them on board, or at least get them to um, stay out of the project and not interfere with it. It's not always possible. Um, and sometimes we have to stop uh, a survey um, as because of uh, local officials decide that it's too, um, too difficult uh, or too, um, not too difficult, too controversial for them. And so they uh, force us to, to leave. Uh, 
that's happened. You know. I see David has raised his hand. Is somebody going to unmute David? Uh, and Professor Olafson, thanks so much for uh, taking your time and giving this kind of this very interesting talk. I very much appreciate your uh, your contribution to this conference. Uh, I have the following question. I mean, I think um, so. Uh, I wanted to ask a question from let's say uh, from like Georgian or like South Caucasus perspective. Uh, when let's say local academics are doing uh, research, actually, I mean, from the local uh, funding sources, they actually are asked whether they can think of, I mean, more, you know, policy relevant research. I mean, even if the, let's say, uh, grant asks for a, you know, grant is about an academic research, but they are uh, sometimes asked to, you know, think about policy relevance or think about uh, kind of monetization of the of research outcomes and that's interestingly that's that's uh, something they ask for both uh, you know like social science researchers and also well, I mean, uh, uh, natural sciences or computer science or these kind of things what would be your uh, take on that and how how do you find this kind of I mean um, you know, like the, this kind of well regulation from the uh, from local grant giving organizations and, mm -hmm. and foundations. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a good question, David. Um, I think um, how can I say it? Our funding is, as you know, from the National Science Foundation in the U.S., which is a pure science foundation. But like any um, agency, it has to be. Um, aware of and responsive to uh, governmental uh, interests. And over time, uh, the US National Science Foundation has um, added different criteria to the judgment of research proposals. Um, and in, in the last, um, I think about 10 years ago, uh, it was added um, to the review, um, a second category, um, so before it was just pure scientific review, right? And the second category has been added called uh, the broader impacts of the work. And there one has to uh, argue um, that the work will be of interest um, to a broad policy uh, community, let's say the US foreign policy community. Um, uh, in other words, um, the international community, let's say, um, it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't have to show, at least in social science work, it doesn't have to show any kind of immediate financial benefit to anybody, but it has to show a, a general policy relevance, not that you make policy or that you advocate policy, but that policymakers might be interested in the subject, right? So I think um, that is, is new, well, new as of 10 years ago. Uh, my own sense is that, um, it's generally pretty easy um, to make the case, at least the work that we do. Um, so for example, you know, the work in Kenya, it's, it's very easy to make the case that the concern about climate wars you know, it's, is of great interest to the uh, US foreign policy uh, establishment and community. But beyond that, there is no, um, at least to my knowledge, uh, no, uh, no um, pressure to show any kind of financial benefit uh, or direct uh, policy uh, work that you have to do. It, it doesn't exist. In, fa in fact, if it did exist, I wouldn't apply for it. Um, in fact, I, I even go further and say that um, over the years, I have uh, rejected um, uh, groups who have come to me and said, we would like to sponsor your work. Um, in this area for these reasons. And I thought, no, that, that's too close to your policy interest and policy aims, and I'm not going to do it. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? You can also raise a hand and I will unmute you.
One last call for questions. Ah, Irina, you wanted to ask a question? Yes, yes, please. <laughs> I, I already submitted, it is in the chat box. First of all, it was absolutely inspiring to talk. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, you talked about missingness. Could you please elaborate a bit more about that? Uh, is that about missing value or it is replacing don't know those refuse to answers based on a general uh, pattern of similar people uh, that answered that particular question? Is this uh, about data imputation or this is something different? Thanks much. Yeah, um, thank, thank you. I, I, sh I should have clarified. Um, there's two missingness, right? The missing would be, uh, in from the survey perspective, would be that the enumerator forgot to, you know, tick the box or or skip the question, you know, forgot the question, or something like that, uh, which is a legitimate and uh, understandable missing, right? It, it's it's missing not because um, the respondent um, didn't have the chance, the respondent did not have the chance to answer the question, right? So it's missing for that reason. Um, but the other kind of missingness is where the respondent gives an answer, but the answer is not what the respondent really thinks, right? So, so it's missing um, a real honest answer as opposed to it's missing any answer. Right? And so that's where the don't knows come in. Um, and you know, those of you who have done survey research will, will be very familiar with this. Um, sometimes respondents say don't know because the question is really too complicated and it's too long and too involved or something like that. Sometimes the respondent will say don't know because you know, they don't know. Um, they legitimately have no knowledge. They don't have enough information about the topic to answer the question. But in the kind of work that we do, in the places that we do it, um, don't know is a very um, clear way that respondents avoid a sensitive question. And so we have to um, try and um, kind of understand why they are giving a don't know answer and then to kind of impute, to generate an answer that we think they are saying based on answers to other questions and based on who they are. Um, the, there are lots of technical ways to do this and, and we could spend the next two hours talking about it, but it's never certain that the imputation is accurate. So that's why we do what's called multiple imputation. We do many, many different um, ways of imputing it. And um, it turns out that um, if you just leave out the don't knows, then you are analyzing basically data that is not accurate, that is not reflecting the question, right? Um, again, think of the example of um, Georgians in Abkhazia. If, if you left out the don't knows, you are basically leaving out the Georgians in that uh, population, in that sample in Abkhazia. So you have to take it very, very clearly, um, take it on board and analyze it you know, very directly. I should say, by the way, um, that if I compare the post-Soviet world with Kenya, the don't knows um, are much more common in the post-Soviet areas than in Kenya, I don't know. Maybe Kenyans uh, haven't yet uh, understood that they, <laughs> that they can avoid a sensitive question. I, I'm not sure, but um, it, it's very clear to me that in Kenya, you get don't know ratios of you know, 5% and you know, 7%, uh, you know, very low levels. But often in the post-Soviet areas, you get don't know ratios of you know, 30 and 40%, which is you know, extremely high. Are there any more questions? Thank you very much for your open and honest answers and sharing your experience. Uh, 
I will just check the YouTube channel comments one more time and the Zoom chat one more time. So if there are no more questions, we can call it a day. Thank you very much, Professor Olaf Lin, to okay. for joining our conference, for, for making this um, very exciting and interesting keynote speech. Uh, of course, you are invited to our second day tomorrow. If you manage, you, you can, of course, join us. Yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably join you, but not that um, in the middle of the night. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah. We have we all have very different time zones, and it's a pity that we're not in the same hall somewhere yeah. here in Tbilisi, for example. Yes, so thank yeah. you very much once again. Um, like with this, we can we can say that the day one of the conference is over. Thank you very much to all the participants, speakers, moderators, and those who stayed till the very end. It's been a long day. Tomorrow we have a shorter day. We have only two panels, and we uh, and the panels are so party systems, democratization, and civil society. Um, then panel about conflicts, nationalism, and state building in the South Caucasus. And we have a very interesting roundtable following that about uh, fieldwork in times of crisis, uh, re relating to the COVID-19 issues. Um, and tomorrow we have keynote speech also from a professor from the same time zone, I guess. It's uh, Julie George. No, not the same, maybe, but <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> having no, no. an early morning talk tomorrow. Professor Julie George from um, Queens College City University of New York. So uh, I really look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We start at 11.30. Thank you very much. and. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Bye.